lay. The shulker's blade was immediately retracted as he forced his body to move. That was Moby's opportunity to strike. With his right hand, he weighed several signs, and a golden shine sprung forth from his god slayer, infusing it with sharpness before bringing it back to the hilt of his sword. He even infused his blade with ice crystals that exploded forth from it like flowers multiplying with sharp death. He activated all the skills he possessed, and with one single strike he cleaved down towards his disoriented opponent's chest, cutting through his armor like butter and slathering his blade in blood. What, however, to his surprise, he found his blade stuck within his seemingly rock-hard skin, and his opponent looked him in the eye with pure malice. Yet to his gaze, Moby did not panic as he let loose all the ice infused within his sword towards his opponent's system, making him cough a hint of blood before he infused his fists in black flames and struck Moby in the stomach, since his blade was out of reach for a fatal attack, sending him flying and crashing on the walls many meters away as he fell down into a pile of rubble. Not bad. You almost had me there. That sword burns. What kind of blade is that? I'm certain it will make a fine gift for my master. And who knew you could breathe out your mouth like a dragon? You caught me off guard yet that will not work on me again sadly. The shulker shook his wrists and smiled as he looked over towards the panting yet smirking Moby slowly standing in the distance. Fuck. He's damn strong. If I hadn't used my face skill to get my sword free in time I might have been dead. Charging him head on won't work. I need a change of plans, I need to know what truly hurt him deep down, you. That's some display of demon energy you got there. Where did a shulker like you get them? It is my master who has graciously gifted me. And with his generous almighty gift, I shall put you in your place. Almighty gift. Moby broke out in laughter. Those black flames are nothing but a poor imitation of my pure demon energy. He held his right hand out and displayed a ball of his demonic powers. A flame like aura that does not burn but deals pure damage. It's the same. This is no mere coincidence. Blasphemy. These flames are superior to whatever you possess. The shulker roared. Your master is nothing but a little bitch who bow before me and lick my boots clean. Moby smirked as he felt energy suddenly flood his body. If you think those black flames are superior then prove me wrong. I'd gladly oblige. His aura roared like an exploding star, and his flames spread throughout the entire hallway like a tidal wave as he rushed towards his opponent, his blades thrust ahead of him. Moby reacted by sending ice spears in his direction, ones that left from his own two hands, yet they were easily dodged or deflected by the rushing ball ahead of him. HMPH, suddenly, seemingly out of nowhere, Moby disappeared from place as though he was never there, instead appearing directly adjacent to one of his purple ice spears. He could not believe his eyes, the shulker only reacted a split second before he witnessed a purple aura enveloping his field of view. He panicked, at his current velocity there was not much he could do, so with all the energy he could muster, he twisted his torso and delivered a lightning quick punch, one that he had no time to infuse with his energy. But as his fists made contact with his opponent's face, they went through it as though hitting air. The rage and surprise on his face exemplified, he knew not what to think other than what was in front of him must have been an illusion, but with one simple word and the purple aura in front of him increasing ever more, his opinions immediately shifted. Gotcha, Moby blasted him with all he could, his beam of pure demon energy growing stronger along with his opponent's emotions. The shulker yelled a shriek of pain, and out of instinct, he blocked his face with both hands, yet his attempts were futile as the blast completely consumed him, and sent him soaring up in the air like fireworks. Moby's smile grew even larger as he felt his power soar along with his opponent, looking up as he witnessed his blast breaking through the roof as he rocketed far up in the sky. And with no time wasted, Moby decided to capitalize on the situation as he spread his wings wide and flew up in the air. To his knowledge, his opponent possessed no wings, and up in the air, he was nothing but a sitting duck. However, to his surprise, as he rose up and followed his own blast up into the sky, he was met with quite the pleasant surprise. You. I'll end you. Above him, his pure demon energy faded away, and it was instead replaced by the face of his angered opponent as he let loose all he had. Wings of blackened flame sprouted out of his back like an abomination, and his entire body was consumed in a thick black aura that burned as violently as the hatred he kept hidden within. The grey sky bellowed a thunderous cry and turned to black akin to his flames, and the wind and clouds swirled all around them like an arena of fog, the shulker's previously calm and collected air was no more. The calmness remained on his face, yet to Moby who was an expert in deception, he knew it to be nothing but a facade, without a doubt, his opponent was far stronger than before, as though he had entered a completely new realm of power. Yet in his current state, with all these emotions surging through his veins, Moby felt even stronger. Chapter 382 Moby grinned, and with no hesitation went on the offensive by once again throwing ice spears towards his opponent, this time much faster, almost as though he was throwing machine gun fire from his bare hands, yet his opponent seemed unimpressed, not moving a single inch as he felt his annoyance swell from within. That trick won't work on me anymore. He sent a gust of fire all around him, and the incoming purple spears of ice were nullified, yet not completely destroyed as they were sent flying in every direction like falling hail. However, instead of shocking or even making Moby reconsider, his sneer grew even larger in size, waving several spells before spreading his wings out wide and boosting towards his opponent above with his demonically infused god, Slayer burning brighter than it ever had since he had first drawn it, self-spell protection, thick fog of ice, reinforce thick fog of ice, you're clearly an amateur given powers you don't understand nor are worthy to. Your movements are brute force. That is why you will never win. Moby announced as they once again stuck their shaking blades with an atmosphere completely contrasting that of when they first clashed. Silence you. The shulker spoke in a deathly voice, kicking Moby away with his boots before rushing him down, firing several fire shots towards him. The fire that expended out of his palms was deep and engulfed all, thus hindering his very own vision. Yet that mattered not when they sought life and homed on their target until hit. But, that was when suddenly, he heard a sound emerge from behind and the homing missiles of black flames suddenly turned a complete 180 degrees, bolting straight towards him instead. He could not believe it, it was almost as though he was betrayed by his own flames. When he attempted to dodge, he suddenly noticed himself bound by unknown chains of magic that did not take him much effort to destroy, but that slight hesitation was more than enough for the flames to find their target. Asterisk Arag Asterisk he grunted from the pain, yet to his dismay the pain would not end any time soon as he found a sword thrust into his guts, barely missing his heart due to his erratic movements. You. 
what the there he saw Moby to his rear, and a hole, as though ripped through time and space behind him. His eyes grew wide in realization, and despite the shock and pain running through his system, he managed to connect the dots on what had just transpired. How many powers do you have? What is this? The shulker could no longer keep his calm persona, and his frenzy intensified. His blackened flames roared in all directions, and Moby was forced to release his blade and escape from that injured, primal beast. I'll end you. He held his blade tightly and surrounded Moby in a ring of fire from all directions slowly encompassing him. It's too late for you now. The battle has been decided long ago. Moby's viper-like eyes of denomination glistened ominously above his amused visage, and with but a flex of his muscles, his aura of purple destruction expanded even further, and that ring of fire approaching him was nullified by his mere presence alone. How? How are you still getting stronger? Impossible. They met blades once more, and their clash shook the very heavens as they sped like blurs, evenly matched blow for blow. Moby walked throughout the entire battlefield like a shadowy assassin, and his opponent managed to react to every strike as his rage grew along with his flames, their auras mixed during the clash, and in it was a clear victor. Moby's pure demon energy, as though it were a hungry beast began to consume the black flames like pudding, thus the shulker suffered greatly and began to slowly become overwhelmed. He was overwhelmed and punished by a source who did not realize nor wanted acknowledge due to his prejudice. I in the end, they stood far apart, panting and readjusting their stance. One party was clearly more injured and exhausted than the other, and he felt like his chance at victory was fleeting. And in order to win, he had to act quickly, and there was one attack in his arsenal that he thought could put an end to it with pure power that could not be countered nor matched. You're dead now traitor. There's no warping out of this one. The shulker thrust his hands in front of him with a tiny flame flickering at its center. The energy around him danced, a dense shield of flame surrounded him in all directions and lightning began to fall from the sky so there was no teleporting around him. That small flicker once in his palm erupted into a ball of dense, peerless power, its strength growing bigger and more potent the more he charged, yet, as he continued to charge his attack, he felt a vein pop from his forehead as he peered down at his motionless opponent. At first, he assumed that it was due to fear and absolute dread that he was unable to move, but upon closer inspection and a small hint of noise, he realized that he was laughing instead. What's so funny? Why don't you charge up your attack, huh? Have you gone insane? He roared a distorted cry through the rumbling of the sky, yet that only made Moby's laughter increase even more. Have you not noticed? I have been charging up an attack. I've been charging one up all this time from the power you've been so gracious to give me, H-U-H. Where? What the fuck are you talking about? There. He smirked, pointing up at the air above as the heavy fog began to subside, and thick purple blows appeared in the sky from all directions like stars shining in the sky, yet these stars were close, violent, and armed to destroy with the purest of demonic flames. Chapter 383. I am possible. As the fog was completely subsided, the source of the light was revealed, and the shulker felt his heart sink to the bottom of his stomach in real time. Those tips were not mere stars, there were none other than the ice projectiles he had deflected upon the initiation of their battle. All this time, they had been kept secret from him through a thick veil of icy fog, charging up an attack from each and every one of them. The amount of energy stored in even a single shard of ice was astronomical, his black flames next to it were like a mere candle next to a chandelier, his heart rate skyrocketed, and his panic incited a complete and utter change of plans. He shut his hands and spread his arms wide. The energy he once planned to use to fully annihilate his opponent was now relocated completely on defense, every ounce of energy he could spare, and as he charged up his defenses, he kept his shaky gaze below at the still smiling man, and at his middle and ring finger adjacent to each other, for within that gap between his fingers ready to snap rested his very life. It's been nice. But now I'm going to have to get past you to see your master next. Asterisk snap asterisk at once, the shards of ice surrounding them twinkled, and beams of light shot out from each and every one of them as they struck the barrier where the shulker laid. Upon impact, the barrier of flames immediately began to falter, and not too long after did the barrier fall to ruins. Each and every attack hit their targets, causing a grand spectacle of black and purple light that exploded in the sky. And as the dust cleared, a figure remained afloat in the mayhem. His armor was in shambles, his horn was cracked and disintegrated, his snow-white skin was charred and inflicted with abhorrent bruises and blood that would revolt even the harshest souls. His vision was hazy, and he barely found the energy within himself to stay afloat as he tightly held onto his right arm that was broken beyond repair, and felt as if it were ready to fall off and disconnect from his shoulders. I'm... I'm alive. He mumbled to himself, panting in disbelief, yet soon after he realized that he should not have spoken so soon. Through the thick dust, a metallic arm emerged and grabbed him within a crushing, iron grasp that barely allowed him to even breathe. And immediately after, his body roughly accelerated out of the fog. Metallic gloves were blocking his vision, yet he knew exactly what was happening. The wind howled loudly in his ears, and the air struck his naked body like a wave of slaps. He was being grabbed, and now dragged, falling all the way down to earth. Let's go see your master together shall we? And his suspicions were soon verified by that same haunting voice of the traitorous monster. And soon after, he witnessed a light, a purple light through the previous darkness as he was once again greeted by that same superior purple flames, quite literally burning the idea into his mind. Asterisk crash asterisk a glass ceiling of the throne room stood no chance against, the meteorite diving into it, speeding through it as though it were not even there. On the solid ground they landed, and Moby's hands were still grasping onto the barely conscious shulker between his fingertips, as he was showered by glass shards falling through the sky. When Moby looked up from his opponent's beyond recognizable visage, he was met by a wide, grandiose throne room that would put many castles on earth to shame. It did not bear the same faded appearance of the exterior. No, it looked well maintained as though there was a maid who worked within it every single minute of every single day. The ground that bore an intricate design, other than where he crashed, was spotless. He was able to see his own reflection within it as if it were glass. The pillars holding the roof were etched in gold, and the throne directly ahead of him was unseated and rested above several steps, jewel encrusted and glistened like a star even amongst the shiny room. Yet, that was not what had gotten both Moby's and Avilia's jaws to abruptly drop, unable to believe what they were witnessing. Upon the walls and all across the ground were paintings and statues, all of a single woman. Each one was built with immaculate detail, poised for perfection. 
With every brushstroke, there was passion that was very much clear and elevated the beauty of who was drawn beyond its standard perfection. It was a woman with a smirk of domination and pride as though all in the world were insects before her. Her pupils shined within her sockets like bright amethysts, and her soft featured face was so beautiful that it could kill. Her hair was a long and soft light purple, smooth as silk and fell down to her bosom, and her attire was like that of an almighty monarch that felt no shame in displaying her assets and superiority over others. With but one glance it was clear who it was. For only one woman in all the three realms could perfectly match such a description. Is. Is that me? S. Fand. You here? Was it you who just came in? A sudden, casual voice emerged, echoing all around the room. Were you the one causing all that racket outside? It was pretty distracting for me. A. Doesn't matter. He sighed before continuing. Did you bring the demon in? If so then set him to the side and go get me my paint from Archaeac City below. I've run out of red. I'd like to be left alone with this demon. It's been many years since I've seen one of my kin, I'm curious to see what he has to say, mum? Esfand? You there? Do you hear me? Chapter 384 Moby followed the voice, and his vision was led towards the corner where it met a man adorned in a long robe of black sat upon a chair with his back turned. In his hands was what seemed to be a brush, and ahead of him was a massive canvas where that same woman from before was drawn, this time stepping and torturing a white-haired angel as he struggled to breathe beneath her boot. That angel was none other than his old team leader, Artorias that he found sat unconscious ahead of the canvas, tied up firmly in a mixture of black and ashen flames unable to speak, the same flame that was used against him by the man beneath his feet. What's going on? Is. Is that guy drawing Artorias for his new painting? Is that why he's still alive? He thought to himself before shaking his head, refocusing himself after all he witnessed. Ruler of this castle. I've come to see you. No harm shall be put upon you if you cooperate with me. Moby announced. Hum? Esfand? What is that sound? What language is th? The robed painter spoke with a hint of confusion as he slowly turned his head, revealing his face. His skin was a dark tone of grey, and his hair was a long, soft colour of ashen. The twin tips of his horn were dipped in an ominous black and his yellow, glowing eyes resembled that of a cat. Without a shadow of a doubt, that man was a demon. His young features would be considered handsome even by supermodel standards on earth, handsome as a devil, yet, that handsome, calm and collected demeanor only lasted for a split second as it shifted into an expression of bewilderment in his eyes, an entire visage that was absolute, an intensity, unlike anything Moby had ever seen before in his life. His face turned pale, and his clean skin began to sweat profusely. His pupils enlarged Ned, and his body became so jittery that even a vibrator paled in comparison. His emotions were so strong that his heartbeat shook the very ground like a tremor, however, despite the great display of emotions, Moby did not feel threatened nor attempted to defend himself for he had the ability to draw power from his opponent's rage, and other negative emotions. And currently, he felt absolutely nothing coming from that man. El Lord of Ilia. Ay, 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 is that you? His eyes began to swell, and a stream of steady tears began to pour out of his eyes like a waterfall as he struggled to even get out of his seat, and approach the entity ahead. Rupert. What the hell is he doing here? Avilia shouted into Moby's head to the point that it shook his very skull. Why you know this guy? Does he have an obsession over you? Moby's eyes shot open. Of course, I know this guy. He's a greater demon that lived in my damn castle. I have many diehard admirers that worship the very ground I trod it on, but this guy is on another level. I'll spare you the details for now. Just know you got super lucky that a greater demon like him was allied with me and not a rogue, or else you would have been dead now. Just let me transfer you the information for how you could speak demon to understand him too. Wait. You can do that. Why didn't you do that from before? Yes, your mind stat is now high enough for me to dump that much complex info into you when I couldn't from before, this shouldn't be too painful all along. Rupert. That is your name correct? Moby spoke, surprised at how this new language rolled off his tongue as if he were a native speaker. Oh. Your Highness. You remembered my true name. I had yet to reveal that name even to my closest subordinate. It is you. It really is. The demon's tears intensified, and his shaky legs gave out as he broke down on his knees with happiness unparalleled. Through all these years I had never forgotten about you, my lord. Yes. I can tell from all these statues. Moby replied, looking all around the room once again. Oh. So you have realized. For all these years I have poured my heart and soul into these paintings trying to replicate your image. Yet my memory wanes me and I was never satisfied. Not one painting managed to fully capture your power and. Beauty. What do you think of them? Truly skillful work. Moby nodded. Oh. You're far too kind. I'm truly honored. Ah, uh, ah, uh, this still does not feel real. I am sorry for my state, but this is truly the happiest day of my life. Never in a million years did I think this day would come. Does he think I'm you or something? Moby asked, almost overwhelmed by the display ahead of him. He might be hallucinating my image with your body since we do share a similar aura. I need answers from him. This is also the most pivotal point in my life. You have no idea how long I've waited for this. I never thought the day would be so soon. And I never thought I would see the day where I would be ecstatic to see Rupert of all people. Send him a signal for mind transference just like we did with Alucard. With your higher mind and considering he's a greater demon, there should be no need to meditate like before. Got it. I've also been waiting to hear this too. Moby nodded, snapping his two fingers and making a hand sign. And the very moment that he did, his world was consumed in black. All went dark and his consciousness drifted in a flowing river until a sudden light emerged, and he opened his eyes once again to see himself stood in a void of black where he witnessed two figures. One was of course none other than Avilia herself, dressed in her demon lord garbs and the other was the still robed and kneeling Rupert. Rupert. Speak your name and pledge your loyalty to me once more. Your actions of sending hitmen after the heir to the demon throne could be seen as nothing more than treasonous. They even had the gall to call me the traitor because I was traveling with an angel. 
they knew not their own lord when they met her presence unlike you. Avilia's words were serious, cold, and distant, more eloquently spoken than when she would ever address him, as though she had flipped a switch. Her presence was drowning, her stance was dominant, and the gaze in her shining eyes was a physical personification of death and power. Truly, the woman who stood in front of him was a ruler amongst rulers, the same woman whose might and reach unrivaled in all three realms. Even Moby who had known her for so long could not help but sweat profusely and stare in awe in her presence. He had only seen this side of her when they addressed Alucard. For indeed, the entity ahead of him was none other than the great demon lord of Ilya Greymore. Upon hearing of Ilya's words, Rupert shuddered as though unable to believe his own ears as he gulped and responded in a beyond shaky voice. How could that be? My loyalty has never waned and was always with your majesty. Seeing you now, there is not a speck of doubt in my mind. I, Rupert Elvrain shall pledge my eternal loyalty once more. My soldiers know your face inside and out. They too revere you just as much as I. I am truly sorry for what they have done to you. I shall have them both executed immediately for high treason. And if you so wish, I could take my own life for such a great blunder. No need. I shall exercise forgiveness for now. They did serve for good practice for my protege, Havilia waved her hands with assertive elegance. They did not fail to recognize me, but they failed to recognize my presence with that man to my side. For he is to be my future successor. She announced proudly. I thought you were right in front of me from before. You've chosen your successor. Rupert raised his head in shock, looking around before he locked eyes with a confident Moby, standing tall and proud even beside his lord which incited several emotions as he did not bow before her as well. Indeed, Avilia's stuttery image nodded. He was the man who stood in front of you prior to your arrival in this space. Unlike those shulkers of yours, you sensed my presence and identified your true lord. I was never there nor could I ever be there. Have you forgotten? I've sacrificed myself for the sake of demonkind against those dreaded angels, and I've been searching for answers ever since I had awoken from my necklace that found its place upon this man's neck. Now. Rupert. I need you to explain to me precisely what happened to the world I sacrificed everything to protect. And what circumstances led you to lay dormant in this frozen tundra within the mortal realm? Chapter 385. Avilia made her request, and her gaze narrowed down even further towards the even more jittery, kneeling Rupert. Why certainly your highness? It would be my greatest honor to explain absolutely everything, he took an extensive gulp followed by a deep breath before continuing. After your sacrifice, the war was ended, and both sides were forced to retreat back to where they came. But, as you would assume, the aftermath of the war and your sacrifice caused a far worse, lasting effect on our kind than that of the much more organized angels. Zerka took command after your death as he tried to quell the masses' outrage, but it didn't work out too well, so he was forced to sign a treaty to allow him more time to bring demonkind together. But, that only instilled even more outrage in, there is no need to explain that. Avilia waved. Alucard, the vampire lord under Shodar had already explained all of that to me. How society began to devolve back into its barbaric roots after I've left, and how Zerka had to take arms against them to keep the people under his thumb. What I need to know is what happened after that. On the day of the attack. And what exactly happened to the Book of Resurrection and my necklace, you understood. Apologies my lord. Rupert shook and nodded vigorously to Avilia's words as he began to recount what truly mattered in her ears. On the day of the attack, it seemed like any other day. I woke up and immediately went to do my job in the painting room, where I was ordered to draw your majesty for a grand painting for a celebration Zerka had planned to help unite the people. It really was a masterpiece beyond anything I had ever done in my life. And after a decade of work on it, it was finally over, but that was when the sky shattered, like a massive rumbling that shook the very realm itself. Even I could barely stand in its wake, and the castle began to vigorously shake as if it were hit by 100 earthquakes. The painting that I had worked so hard on had collapsed on the floor, and your beauty was absolutely ruined. At first, I assumed that it was one of those old leaders who attacked the castle in protest and retaliation for the celebration Zerka had planned. However, that was far from the truth. When the ground stood still again, I left the room in outrage. But that outrage was then replaced with concern. Screams. No, they were more like shrieks that echoed throughout the castle hallways, ones that bore a great amount of pain. A message was immediately sent to everyone within the castle that we were under attack, by masked figures of all sizes raiding not only the castle but the entire capital for as far as the eye could see. The anger in my eyes was immediately replaced with panic. The cries across the hallways were slowly approaching me. I'm weak. I'm no fighter, and I knew I would stand no chance as a simple castle painter. So I did what I thought was best. I ran away as far as I could to the other side as to not get in the way. As I did so, I witnessed brave soldiers and protectors of the castle rush ahead past me with no fear in their eyes. However, the screams of pain that soon followed their advances proved to me that they were no match and only made me run even faster. However, I could only do so much running before suddenly, I ran out of room to go, and the only way out was to either head into the forbidden ground or to break open through the walls, and of course, I initially chose the latter. With all my might, I punched a hole through the tough castle walls, and there I saw a sight that I would never in my life forget, sodded and branded into my mind until my death. The previous calm, relatively empty streets were run rampant, like an ocean of unknown masked beings flooded the entire city. The sky was shattered like glass, and those very same beings fell down from it like pouring rain. However, there was retaliation. In the sky were several demons fighting off the menace, many I recognized as elite guards and even some of the sins such as lust, envy, and even Zerka, Roth himself. But despite their aid, they could not kill faster than these entities who mowed down civilians like nothing. The energy oozing out from underneath could be only described as a foul abomination that made my very being crawl and gag beyond repair, the faces of the unmasked gremlins were abhorrent. Their skin was of all sizes, a mixture of different pigments, horns growing out of every pore in their bodies like pimples, that along with feathery wings and a golden glow. Some even lacked simple functions such as eyes, ears, and mouths, having horns replaced by them instead. They seemed like primitive beings, in pain every second they breathed who only had destruction in their minds. From above I watched in horror. It was doomsday, like the end of the nether realm as I knew it. The outside world beyond the castle I had tried to escape to was far more unsafe than the very walls. So, I attempted to go the only way I could to survive. 
into the forbidden ground where both your necklace and the Book of Resurrection laid in top security. The only problem was, despite everything that was happening, the area was still heavily guarded at that moment. If anything, the number of guards in the area multiplied to protect. I began to lose hope of survival, the rumbling and screaming across the hallway was increasing and I had nowhere left to escape. But, before, I attempted to rush into certain death against the castle guards, two figures hooded in black dashed directly past me as if I were not even there. And the next time I had blinked, I found the five guards guarding the edge of the forbidden ground on the floor, unconscious, but certainly not dead. I couldn't believe my eyes and didn't know what the hell happened. All I knew was that it was my opportunity to flee, and so I took it. Chapter 386 I ran through the sacred ground of the castle I had never before trodden on, and as I did, I found bodies on the floor. The more I sprinted through this unknown, expansive land the more bodies I found, each of them still breathing with not even a single hint of blood dripped upon the ground. It was an odd feeling yet it confirmed some of my suspicions. It was clear that whoever did this was not one of those barbarians, their attacks were far too calculated and skillful to be one of those beasts. In fact, the only people that I could think of to swiftly eliminate elite guards tasked with such a high order was a sin. Which initially made me fear that two sins had betrayed us. But then as I thought about it in my chaotic mind, I thought that it did not make sense, for why would they spare all of these soldiers? The more I ran, and the more bodies I found the more frantic I became and the more my mind began to throb. And that was when I reached the end of the hallway, there, I found a magnificent door of purple and gold beyond the heap of bodies. And for the first time, I heard a struggle. Beyond that door were those black shadows I glimpsed from before, I had no doubt in my mind. And as though my body went into autopilot, my legs began to move by themselves, past the bodies and through the open doors, there, I witnessed a massacre unlike any I have ever, nor will ever witness. There was no blood, no damage, and barely any sound. At the center of the still magnificent room was a pile of corpses that littered the ground, yet they could not even be deemed as corpses as they were not dead nor even visibly injured. And beyond the mountain were those two figures once again. And I watched as they took out their final targets, that was when their head turned and looked me in the eyes, and I felt like my life flashed before my eyes. My senses were overcome by fear, and I lost my ability to even breathe. Their hooded figures were shrouded in shadows. They bore absolutely no intent to kill, yet from their gaze alone, my legs turned to jello, and I could no longer stand, their power was like that of a sin. No. In that moment I felt like they might have been even stronger. They were the strongest beings I've ever laid eyes on, behind you of course Lord Avilia. However, that only lasted for a split second before their gaze turned elsewhere, ignoring me as if I were not there or worth their time. This content is taken from novelpub.com, they turned their heads and faced the altar where floated both the Book of Resurrection and your necklace side by side. And with no hesitation, they grabbed them both before opening a portal and disappearing as if they were never even there, leaving nothing but fragments of their portal behind, Lord Avilia. Thinking back to that day makes me feel like the worst of scum. I deserve to be executed. I watched motionless, damn near pissing my pants as two unknown figures stole your necklace and the book meant to resurrect you. I was so damn useless. My loyalty was not enough. He took a pause in his story as he broke down crying, his body shaking even more uncontrollably than before, yet, Avilia did not entertain his display. Continue your story. What happened next? Oh oh. Why yes. Apologies. I shall continue. He wiped his eyes and took a deep breath before he returned, reliving his memories. Little after they left, I heard sounds from behind, footsteps and screams that I remember vividly to this day. It was gluttony and an army of troops, he witnessed as the necklace that once belonged to you was gone, that along with the Book of Resurrection, and how I was the only man left standing. He could not believe his eyes, opening a portal was supposed to be impossible other than within the teleporting room of the castle, especially in the sacred hall. He did not stop long to address me, almost as though I was trash. All I did was tell him what happened, and with no hesitation, all in your name, they reopened the closed portal and dove in after the figures with nothing but determination filling them, leaving me all alone, crying on the ground like a fool. But then I looked at my pathetic state with disgust, and thought about all my failures. And as though to make up for my mistakes, or out of pure instinct, I still to this day don't know what made me do what I did. I shook myself off before diving into that portal a split second before its collapse. The most up-to-date novels are published on novelpub.com and there, to my surprise, I found myself in a void. Nothing but black surrounded me with twinkles from beyond for as far as the eye could see, it was a land I had never even seen nor dreamed of in my life. And considering where I am right now, that place was none other than the mortal realm, which was never even considered by me at the time due to the taboo. That was when suddenly, I heard an explosion, and as I turned my head I witnessed what seemed like a light show far in the distance. But, upon closer inspection, I noticed it was a battle between the new troops and undoubtedly angels, angels that overwhelmed them, and even Gluttony seemed to be on his back foot. I stood in awe, taking a gulp as I felt my heart race. That was when I realized the possibility that it was angels or gods that had stolen your necklace and book, and the guilt buried within me could not bear be kept within my heart. A sense of duty overcame me. I had gone this far on my path to redemption, so stopping now would have been idiotic, so at top speed, I flew towards them and entered combat. But soon after, it was clear that I was no match as I was fatally injured not even a second upon entering. Yet I fought on, willing to go until my death. But, my advances were then put at a halt. Not by me, or an angel no, but by a fellow demon. Rinia Brewer, a dear friend of mine who I once taught how to draw but later joined the army. He pushed me away into a portal he erected. And my fleeting life was saved. To this day, I don't know how to feel. Whether I should be happy to live or mad that I did not uphold my honor and fight until the end with my comrades. I felt so useless once again. That's how I ended up stuck on this very same planet. But it seemed like I wasn't alone, for an angel had been sucked into the portal alongside me. Chapter 387 Everywhere I went I saw white, an endless storm and expanse for as far as the eye could see. Yet, that was not what first hit me. No, it was the cold that struck upon my skin and the snow beneath my feet. Even the expanses of space had no such effect on me yet this cold around me was paralyzing, however, what paralyzed me more was the realization that there was an angel, directly breathing to my side. 
His armor was cracked, his wings were clipped, and blood gushed out from his every pore as he bled on the ground with an expression of pain that far exceeded even mine. There I saw an opportunity, and I immediately seized it. I had no way to warm myself. Despite being a flame demon, my flames were designed after your pure demon energy. Thus, it gave off no heat at all. It could not help me. So I had to find an escape. With the meager strength I had left, I trudged upon this hopeless wasteland, dragging the angel upon my two shaky hands. At one point I had had nearly given up, my eyes were turning dull, my wounds were getting to me and the cold was ready to take me out of my misery. But that was when from above, I witnessed a light. A shining orange light I had not seen in what felt like forever. Fire, it was the only hope I had left, and with that, I grabbed onto it as hard as I could and used everything I had to force myself up that mountain towards the light. And through sheer will and perseverance, I reached my destination with the angel still alive behind me. It was a castle, the very same castle I reside in now, yet it was far less empty, far less faded, and far more alive. Indeed, it was bustling with aliens that came in left and right, entities I had never before seen in my life. But to me, it mattered not as I made my way towards the gate. The warmth of the castle was getting to me the closer I got, yet as soon as I was ready to enter the hot paradise of within, I was immediately halted by guards upon the entrance who spoke to me in a language I didn't understand. So then I forced myself to enter again, only this time they used force and pushed me to the ground. I grunted. In that moment I had to make a decision, and in that moment, it did not take me long to decide. I channeled my black flames and vaporized the two guards who stood before me. And the elegantly dressed guests immediately ran away in terror, yet I did not let them flee. With a pool of blood under my feet, I stepped foot within the castle gates for the first time experiencing true warmth with the angel still in my hand. But, instead of a warmer welcome, I was greeted by an army of guards stood before me with spears and shields in hand yelling at me in that same tongue. I cared not for what they said as they attacked me, I retaliated. And with one simple spell, they were dead. In that moment I realized that I was in the mortal realm, for I was able to defeat them so effortlessly in such a state. They were no demons or angels, they knew not even a single spell to protect their lives and their constitution was so meager and lacked no energy. Over the bodies I marched, and the further I went the more guards arrived only to be mowed down over, and over, and over again. Their morale and determination were commendable, or was it stupidity? To this day, I still don't even know. But even as they saw their own comrades turn into mush right before their eyes, barely any of them faltered as they rushed me with zero regards for their own lives. Eventually, I made it past them all. And the throne room was my final destination, and the warmest place of all. Women and men dressed in suits danced underneath a bright chandelier, children frolicked playing on the ground, and upon a throne was a smiling man with a crown atop his head. As I entered, they took one good look at me. But that look was their final one as they were all dead in their next. The only man I kept alive was the king himself who I kept for questioning. But everyone else was erased out of existence like the insects they were. From all the negative energy I received, I was able to heal myself back to functioning condition. I cast several spells upon the king to ensure he wouldn't run or kill himself, and I began to heal the angel in my hand to consciousness because we two had much to discuss, the king was beyond shocked. He shrieked a banshee-like cry of pain as though it were the end of the world. I would like to imagine that is how the ant king reacts when a man steps upon their mound. His eyes turned watery, his nose even more so with snot as he broke down. Had it not been for the spells I cast he would have most certainly died of a heart attack from all the shock. And luckily for him, he spoke easily and told me everything I wanted to know. I didn't even have to resort to any major torture or mind magic to get it out of him, but the angel was far more resilient. He woke up, chained in the castle's dungeon, bound heavily and given no chance to retaliate. At first I questioned him. For many years he would not crack despite all the pain and suffering I inflicted upon him. However, I didn't give up. I had a goal after all, I needed to know what had happened. And on one faithful day. He cracked, and he revealed absolutely everything to me. Chapter 388. He told me how they did it. How they destroyed and invaded the very world I knew in a single day after that treaty was signed. How from the captured demons they had, they kept them as their very own sex slaves to reproduce, and with that new race, they managed to bypass the restrictions and enter the demon world. While we were busy fighting amongst ourselves in civil wars, they were planning an attack and strengthening their forces, however, out of all the things he revealed, that was somehow the least interesting part, indeed, the most interesting part was the fact that they had created this new form of energy dubbed as, mana. And with it, they were able to do many things. Notably, in the mortal realm to grow so exponentially in strength, it combined a demon's ability to suck and absorb and the long range of the faith transference they possessed into one invention. Essences of their angelic beasts as the catalyst connecting them from within, they infused this mana into the clouds of various planets. The rain that fell down therein infused with their very being, absorbing the positive energy within them and redirecting it back towards the heavens where they resided, no longer would they need to make people believe in them as deities for them to prosper and gain energy. It's solely the dependence on this new ability thing they had. Indiscriminately they spread the rain, transforming everything in the realm, even those beasts slithering on the ground who possessed no rhyme or reason we affected, and transformed into frenzied beasts consumed by their own power. And then, from that day onward, the quaint and weak mortal realm was never the same. And that change was masked under an elaborate veil that was nearly impossible to uncover, the nether realm is most probably in ruins, and there I was being mocked by an angel that I had been torturing for years on end. And as he finished telling me his story, I lashed out at him and killed him on the spot. However, it mattered not since he was going to die anyway, and I didn't have the means to save him. Even I myself was on the verge of death due to the lack of negative energy surrounding me. I couldn't live off killing villagers forever, and putting them on a sex farm to reproduce was too much work for me, especially since I didn't speak the language. So, in the end, I employed what that angel told me. Admittedly, what I did was very sloppy and inefficient in comparison to the angels, but I managed to find a way where I could manipulate and sap away all of their negative energy, leaving them as cheery hollows. And like that, I lived for many years, simply sitting, doing absolutely nothing as I rotted away in this fading castle. I couldn't even leave the planet if I wanted to. The climate was too rigorous for me to even leave my castle for an extended time, and in all my years in the nether realm, I never thought to learn some sort of warping or teleportation magic. But that was when one day, I heard a sound unlike any other in all my years on this planet. 
The sound of the sky crying almost like that fateful day in the nether realm. At first, I thought it to be an avalanche, but when I looked out the window I saw something flying up in the sky. To me, it was like a giant animal made of metal had invaded me. But, now I know it to be a spaceship that would have allowed me a way out of here. If only I hadn't fully blown it up, out of that ship, white figures emerged jumping off it like rain. And as soon as I saw that horn on their head I was filled with so many emotions. Fear, excitement, shock, and a lust for revenge. I stayed in the safety of my castle. And not too long after, they came to me. I quickly found out that these beings and the invaders of the nether realm were not the same, at least in terms of strength. But, admittedly, against their leaders, I did somewhat struggle actually. Still, eventually, they all died, and what remained of them were those two that begged for their lives. So I spared them. Eventually, I even trusted them enough to teach them some demon magic. But that was when I made an interesting discovery. They had unusually high adaptability with it, and picked it up relatively quickly. And thus, I discovered that in all likelihood, they were descendants of those abominations that first attacked the nether realm, and the power of mana was infused deep within their very beings, strengthening their cause. It suggested me that I had been wasting away in this castle for at least several thousand years and I did not even feel the time. These shulkers. They told me about all that happened in the outside world, including some sort of prophecy of their people for the return of the Lord. And how a certain statue began to glow of someone with horns and wings. And without any further explanation, I interpreted it as your return, and life was rekindled in my eyes. And from then on, I once again indulged myself in painting you your majesty as I awaited for your glorious return, and then the events of recent. I was told by my subordinates that a demon had invaded my domain along with an angel. At first, even I thought it was a traitor who had corroborated with the angels to bring down the nether realm, but I never thought that it would actually be you Lord of Ilya. That is all that happened given in as much detail as possible. I hope that was some help to you, your glorious majesty, as Rupert finally finished story, Moby's mind felt right about to explode. It was as though there had been a gate blocking his mind, and only now was it finally opened. He gave many answers, yet it posed so many more questions that he needed answered and so many realizations that only now did he begin the rising in his mind. Demon children. Those must be kids that the negative energy transference didn't work properly on, and it ended up sucking away too much of their positive energy leaving them a sick and evil out the womb. The reason why everyone on earth is an asshole is because of their abilities and the angels. The ones that are power hungry are the ones most affected which explains why some really powerful humans, such as Mason Griffith were still very nice humans with abilities. The reason why Nea Spud's soul was able to be brought up to the celestial realm was because abilities themselves were so tightly ingrained, with abilities, giving it a direct way up. That light that Alex saw escaping people was actually the positive energy leaving their bodies, and transferring over towards the celestial realm. And he said that both Avilia's necklace and the Book of Resurrection were stolen. That means that. Chapter 389. Dina Ohm even despite her high and mighty demeanor, Avilia's face was visibly stunned at the revelation unveiled to her just now. It was almost more than she could handle. The fact that the angels had been controlling the mortal realm for so long and that her homeland was in all likelihood wiped out was much to bear, and she was once again furious with herself that she no longer had the ability to sense the truth with her own powers. Yet, it was all things that were major possibilities, and things that she had already come to terms with long ago. What Rupert just did was confirm her suspicions and make her feel a deeper yearning and dependency for her homeland. The problem was how she would be going to combat such an angel force. However, that was for another time, currently, there was something else, a realization bugging her mind. Rupert. Do you think gluttony is somewhere still out there in the mortal realm? I know not of that my lord. But I would dearly hope so, that angel that you captured, the one with us. Did you question him at all? No my lord. I simply knocked him out to do a painting. I plan to interrogate who I thought you were and him together, I see. She nodded. My lord. Is, is he with you? Of course not. I need to interrogate him myself. But for now, we will have to leave this space. But before we do, I need you not pledge your loyalty to me, but instead your new lord beside me. Moby Cain. For the current me is in no shape to rule over the three realms. In but one year he had reached to this level of strength, so think not bad of him despite him being extremely weak for a demon lord candidate. She ordered, and her voice seeped into Rupert's very soul. I understand. I have no qualms. If you recognize this man and deem him worthy of the throne then so will I. From today onward. I, Rupert Elvrain pledge my loyalty to thee. Moby Cain. For you, and only you, chosen by her majesty Lord Avilia herself shall take upon the name of Demon Lord. He peered up towards Moby's solid, unflinching eyes with a deep voice and a heavy heartbeat. It was to the point that Moby could simply feel the sincerity leaking from his voice. Rupert Elvrain, I take thee as my loyal subordinate. May your loyalty be proven not only in word, but by action too. He held his hands and touched his shoulders, and he felt a slight tingle on his skin. It is my honor to serve. He lowered his head gracefully. Avilia, I'm sorry to interrupt your reunion, but can we go back to the real world? I have something I want to see. He asked, and Avilia looked back at him with a matching gaze. Me too. And with a single snap of her fingers, all faded to black, and soon after did light return and the cold air of the throne room once again covered all. Yet, he had no time to take in his surroundings as he immediately reached into his inventory and pulled out a certain book. Its black coat was faded in old paper, the cover was hard as steel, yet all that laid within it was endless emptiness. However, when he injected it with his demon energy, a different story was revealed. Power, seemingly of unlimited quantities began to trickle in his very soul, and a wonder engulfed all his senses. The book began to shine within his hands, and a purple, flame-like glow engulfed the pages in thin lines, burning through the very cover like a fuse set on fire. At first, its direction seemed aimless, but that was when he recognized that it was a language he knew yet did not recognize. It was the demon tongue, and it read. The Book of Resurrection. Before he even uttered a word, he heard a voice from his side, and he immediately turned around to see a wide-eyed Rupert, crying and shaking like an elderly woman. Whirr. How? How did you get it? My parents, they were probably the two figures who stole the book and the necklace. They weren't angels, they were dragons. 
I think they stole it knowing that the angels would be after them, so they fled to the mortal realm with it and kept it safe until now. I, I, I see. Rupert's tears increased more as they fled down his face and he crumbled on his knees. I felt great shame at the time for my transgressions and regretted it for thousands of years. But now that regret has turned into happiness to see it didn't fall in the wrong hands. Where are these parents of yours? I would like to personally apologize, I don't know where they are or if they're alive. He deeply sighed. But wherever they are, I'll be certain to continue their legacy. And it all starts with this book. He took a deep breath, closing his eyes and shaking his head before looking down towards the burning book in his hands emanating power, as he sealed himself to flip through to the first page. A page that possessed glowing letters, beating like a living heart in what seemed like poetry. And that was when the light exploded off the pages, and energy once again made its way within him, system alert. Oh great demon lord. Your glorious blood has been recognized and approved. New skill unlocked. Lord's possession, new skill unlocked. Fragment of Sin Gluttony, LVL1, asterisk 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 a fragment of the energy of gluttony infused into the Book of Resurrection from Corvian, the sin of gluttony and several greater demons in effort to resurrect Great Demon Lord Avilia Greymore effects, plus 150 to all stats once per day, rather than blocking an energy-based attack, you can consume it and make it into your own power. Important warning. This is by no means an invincible defense. Not only is the possibility of you being damaged there, but if that attack is too powerful, it cannot be absorbed and will lead to death. Use this wisely. If you think that you will not be able to survive and attack the normal way of tanking it, Dodge, asterisk, asterisk, asterisk upon witnessing the notification in front of him. He could almost not believe his eyes once more, for he met even greater shock. Hey Avilia. Are you seeing this? Well. Of course I am, I was the one who sent the skill notification. I just finished analyzing this book. I can't believe it. It's the real deal. But, with your current strength, you're only able to learn a single spell from it. That seal your parents put on this book was very potent. It was most likely to hide its presence from the angels, but then they reinforced it for you to reach level 100. It was all planned so the power of the book wouldn't overwhelm you and kill you on the spot. The only problem is that this book is missing a whole lot of pages from the back and it's far from complete, which explains why that shulker had a page too, I, I see. So I've yet to unlock all the powers of the book because of my current strength? Yes, Avilia nodded from within. I think you should be able to unlock a fragment from every sin, wait, what's this lord's possession thing though? Moby wondered. Oh, he heard a chuckle from within. Give me something small and fluffy and I'll be sure to show you. I'm so excited. It'll be a surprise. But in the meantime, we should go check up on that Artorias fellow. What I got from Rupert is outdated, but I think he'll be able to provide more clearance. Chapter 390 Asterisk Ugg, asterisk a groan gently trickled into Artorias's ears. He knew not its origin, it was vague and dim, coming from all directions in the darkness that overcame him. Ishritsev are you blaffery? The sounds gradually began to flow in more, and the darkness before him began to turn into a grey, what, what is that? He thought to himself, and in that moment he felt the two lids blocking his vision slowly lift, unveiling a blurry, murky world. And in that spinning world, he witnessed two figures with glowing eyes peering down at him. His memory was even foggier than his vision. Despite his perception slowly improving, and the faces of these beings became clearer, he did not know what was happening. But that was when he heard a familiar voice enter his ears, and the world became crystal, like dots connected in a lost part of his mind. Hello, Artorias. Nice to have you with us again, K. Kane. Why you, he spoke with bewilderment in his voice, looking down to see that he could not move from his spot. His hands and legs were bound in iron, and his body felt like it weighed several tons. His efforts to break loose was futile, and that was when he peered up once again to see a grey-skinned being with horns, and his eyes went wide in realization, that was the man who had so effortlessly put him in his place. You, have you two been working together this entire time, s, no, we haven't. Moby smiled. But, when we met, he recognized me as his future monarch and bent the knee as my subordinate. Ha, ah, don't act like you're surprised. I bet you knew who I was all along. You, an angel. Yet, to this day I didn't understand what exactly you were doing. What is your purpose exactly? Are you a spy? If so then why are you so weak? I bet that if you told your higher-ups of my location, I'd be dead in an instant. So why are you doing all of this? Artorias' eyes remained wide-eyed hearing Moby speak, but that was when his sights narrowed and he inwardly scoffed looking at his bound legs, like he was deep in thought. And after what felt like an eternity of thinking, he spoke. Fine. I. I'll tell you. I was going to have to say it anyway, but now I don't seem to be given a choice. He sighed deeply before he looked up at Moby's eyes of sin. Indeed. I'm an angel from the celestial realm. In fact, I'm a rookie apostle of Archangel Elena, a person you might know as Nea Spud. Artorias took a small pause as he flashed an insignia of light out of thin air, one that Avilia immediately recognized as authentic, and Moby's face suddenly widened. I was tasked with the mission to head to Earth to ensure the safety of her siblings and to meet you. The former I've already done, I had successfully adopted them and sent them to a loving home where they are safe. And, as for the latter, I had joined elite school as a student knowing full well you would also be here. I've been watching you from the shadows ever since, seeing and testing your worth. Confusion overcame Moby's face, he could almost not believe his ears. So. He was the one who adopted them before I could get to it. Wait wait wait. So you're saying is. You and Nair are traitors. But why? And why of all angels were you sent? I see that what I've told you isn't too far-fetched. After all, if I was against you, I'd have already sent notice to the higher gods and you would be dead. Her Highness the Archangel is a very kind soul, unnaturally kind amongst the conniving angel population, such it is with mortals whose souls are sent up into the heavens. But, most of them are usually then trained and have their loyalty proven, and that pure heart of gold doesn't last. But Archangel Elena, Nea Spud was different. She held on steadfast despite her prosecutions and trials, but she only puts on an act to please the higher gods. But what really set her off was the harsh treatment of the demons. 
She felt sympathy, and I, being the weakest angel under her was sent, entrusted, and chosen by her since I would be able to slip past security, and enter the mortal realm unnoticed due to my particularly low level of power. In short, yes, she's a rebel who wants to see the angels and gods be taken down, I. I see. Moby spoke, trying to hide the bewilderment under his poker face. You say that she is a traitor correct? But how about you? Me? My mistress may be extremely powerful, but she's but a child. She met a single demon who treated her with kindness and respect and now she has the impression that all demon kind is like that. Letting the demons win the war is not the answer. I explained it to her, but she insisted that as long as you were their leader, all would be fine. Did I have that good of an impression on her? Moby inwardly thought, his shock increasing even more, well, she did give you a very rare angel's blessing, so I wouldn't be surprised. Avilia replied. So, Artorias, if you felt like that, why did you not report her? Why did you follow orders? Because I hate angels more than the actual demons. That's why. He roared back in response. My mistress may be a child, but in many ways, she is wise beyond her age. So I wanted to see it all with my own eyes. If you will be able to make a change. There seems to be no better option, and I take the gamble. So, why did you rush into here? Why did you want to come to this castle so badly that you had abandoned everything? I even remember you specifically saying the word heratic, dot. Moby asked, his gaze firm below. That's because I thought it was an angel in this castle, not a demon. Huh? They were using our energy siphoning methods after all, so it was my only assumption. And not only were they using it, but they were also abusing it to suck out the life of everything on this planet, which angered me. It's not rare to see selfish angels such as these scattered around. Most of them being outcasts, criminals, or runaways. I thought that if I talked to them, we would be spared since we are both the same kind. And under no circumstance would I have allowed an angel to discover who you truly were. I just never expected it to be a demon, but still, why would an angel need to siphon negative energy? Isn't positive energy what you feed on? Moby could not hide his confusion. Angels have their uses for it in the creation of mana and the strengthening of demon slaves so they could breed better offsprings. Angels more than have their uses for it, you never know what these bastards are thinking of. I, I see. Moby began to deeply ponder to himself. For once he was confused on what to do. Whether he should trust Artorias or to simply further question him and kill him on the spot, there were many things to consider, but there was one clear side to lean on. All he needed to do was ask one more question to calm his mind. You said one of your purposes was for you to see my worth. You've been watching me for over a month now? What do you think? Moby's eyes were expectant, and Rupert standing beside him stood intimidating although he did not know what kind of language the two in front of him even spoke. Artorias did not even look up to meet Moby's gaze. He simply sighed and gave his response. Initially, my impressions were rather lackluster. Especially compared to all of these conniving gods in the nether realm and the horror stories of the old demon lord, told to us from the days of the great wars. But the more I watched you, the more I realized that I was gravely mistaken and had judged you too early. You're more cunning than I thought, I can guarantee you have a grand plan brewing in that mind of yours. I see great potential, but it's still too early to say for certain. I see. Moby nodded. Despite Artorias' life being in Moby's demonic hands, he was still able to sense the sincerity in his voice, not just attempting to lie and boost his ego in a desperate attempt at survival. I'll keep you alive, at least for now. But one sign of hostility and you're dead, understood? Just like you look back on your people, I can't confirm you won't do that same to me. But I can confirm that your aid will certainly help me on my path. I still have more questions to ask you about everything that had happened with the angels and demons, but I'll save that for another time after you fully rest, yes, I understand. Thank you for that kindness. He took a deep breath and for once looked up towards his probably new master, and he watched as he snapped his hands and released him from his bindings, setting him free. My lord. You're letting him free. Rupert raised his voice, not in anger, but from the sheer unexpected surprise. I've seen enough from him. He's long betrayed his kind. I have my own uses for him, he'll be an invaluable asset in the future. But we still need to keep a close eye on him. You understood my lord. Hey. Kane. He was called to once again, and he looked over to see Artorias standing back up, shaking his bruised wrists from the tight bindings. Have you thought of a plan on how we're getting out of this? The school will be here in a day or two. What are we gonna do? What are you gonna do with that new soldier of yours? I have a vague idea, but I'm still not certain of the specifics. There could be the easy way, saying that we snuck into the castle, placed the teleporter and went back home now. But then we wouldn't really get any credit. The ideal way would be if we somehow staved off all whatever had killed the instructors and saved the day. But to do that, we would need to find evidence to prove our words, I see. Artorias shook his head and looked down at his bloodied, shaky hands with a deep breath. What happened to the others? Are they okay? He asked, and Moby raised an eyebrow. The others? The others. His mind nearly broke at the realization. Of course. There were other people with him, at the gate fighting a shawker. He could almost not believe it, and through everything flowing in his brain, there was only one explanation. Had it been his old self, he had no doubt in his soul that his first thought after immediately defeating the shawker and meeting Rupert would have been to ensure the safety of his subordinates and tell him to call him off. But now, he had let his curiosity and yearning to uncover the truth take charge. When he initially used his item to get rid of his demon corruption, he did not feel anything, but now he more than felt the implications dot apart in him began to panic as Artorias looked at him expectantly. All he knew for certain was that their link remained, and they were all alive, but not their safety. But that was when he heard a sound enter the door, and he was shocked to see it to be the shulker at the gate limping in with blood and scorch marks littering his body, behind him all of his teammates and a particularly injured regret being carried on Hikari's shoulders as he was being healed by Elizabeth. Orvet. I see that you've received my message. Rupert spoke, addressing his subordinate. Yes my lord. I did, but before that I sensed something. I sensed what had happened in this room, and it was almost as though I knew what had occurred. I sensed you pledge your allegiance my lord. Did they sense it too? 
He looked over the injured demons coming through his doors. S yes. We both felt a tingle in our bodies, and stopped fighting. Had it been a moment longer I was certain we would have wiped each other out. Was that what that feeling was when I touched Rupert's shoulders when he pledged his loyalty? Kane. We. Survived. Thanks to the powers you gave us. We did it you son of a bitch. Asterisk pant asterisk asterisk pant asterisk now. You this better be worth it. I better get famous and be recognized by the school or else I'm gonna beat your ass. Now. Tell me why the fuck you made friends with the enemy. What the hell are we gonna do now? Don't worry. I'll make it all work. Just you watch. Moby smirked seeing Regret's injured yet just as vocal and passionate face. How the hell did I manage to forget about this goofball? Was my curiosity really that much? Chapter 391. How close are we to the planet Halbert? Apologies. M. But the space has gotten thicker with debris. We should be expecting a 30 minute delay. A man handling a control panel spoke in a shaky voice to his clear superior standing to his side, pure distress on her face. No slowing down. That is an order. B but. General Davis we, no but lieutenant. These kids have waited long enough and must be scared out of their minds. Shulkers are on that planet and have beat us to it. Full speed ahead. If the ship sustains damage then it's fine by me. Understood. Why yes'm. You understood. For days, Principal Raina Davis and her elite soldiers had set off on a long excursion. Her fiery eyes were like that of a viper, keenly looking out towards the vast expanses of the zooming space with her sweaty hands tightly held behind her back, and so much brewing underneath her frown and furrowed eyebrows, the reason was unexpected. A shulker attack, which not only broke the treaty put in place, but also the death of three instructors and a student. The ship was filled with operators and soldiers, and the size of it was nothing short of a warship. Because war was something fully to be expected. At first, she couldn't believe it. Such an action was nothing shy of a declaration of war between the two races, but the voice transmissions from the instructors were more than clear evidence. We have a visual and are ready to land. Good. Can you accurately track the locations of all the students? Yes. They should be to a mountain to the north. But we won't have a clear la, doesn't matter. Land as close as possible to the students. That is an order. Is that clear? Sea crystal, the blackness of space around the ship was suddenly and abruptly replaced with white, white, snow and wind that consumed all. The room began to shake, as though the ground was ready to crumble beneath them. Amber lights and emergency sounds rang throughout the entire ship due to the abrupt landing, yet no one on board panicked nor complained as they pushed on to completing their rough, yet successful landing, somehow suffering little to no damage on the ship. As soon as they halted, the massive doors sprung open like a folding gate, and the cold, unforgiving tundra of the planet blasted their faces within. Attention all soldiers! Your orders had already been given out to you. Search the area and notify me as soon as you sense a disturbance. As for the others, come with me towards the red marker on your maps. That's where the kids are? Yes m. Then let's move on. Like a silent blur, she disappeared from place, and all her soldiers that were considered as the top echelon of elite stood there visibly stunned at where their leader went, their eyes wide and their face sweating. It was as though she was never even there. Yet, luckily for them, they did not need her directions as they followed suit at their own pace, lagging severely behind. In that mere instance, Principal Raina Davis had made it halfway towards the marker, ignoring the harsh climate as she flew against the wind at her top speed, gritting her teeth and squinting her eyes. But that was when in the distance, she saw what seemed like a castle, and when referring back to her marker, she found it to be the same area. In that moment, her heart sank, and a realization dawned on her, F-U-C-K. She inwardly wailed, they were not safely in a cave like the instructors told. Her students were most likely captured and held hostage within that castle, maybe even tortured. Her teeth were beginning to crackle in the cold wind from how hard she held them tight, and she accelerated further until she reached the castle gate. There she witnessed clear signs of battle, areas with snow melted, scorch marks on the walls and ground, cracks on the roof. It was all rather intense, but most peculiar of all was the lack of guards watching over such a big establishment. However, those thoughts were mere passing ones. She had no time to fully analyze and investigate, not when her students' lives were at risk along with the possibility of an ambush. Part of her knew that entering through the front gate was idiotic, and there was a high possibility of ambush, yet she pushed on anyways, for that is the fastest path she found. To her surprise, there was nothing but emptiness waiting for her on the inside. As she sped through the faded hallways, everything around her was but a blur, her soul focus up ahead and on her marker. And that was when she came face to face with her destination, there. That door. A door was of magnificent beauty, yet one that she defiled by knocking down, preparing for battle. Where are you keeping the K.I.? She bit her tongue in the middle of her sentence, she could not believe her eyes, for what she saw within that room was something she never expected to see in a million years. Greetings. Apologies for scaring and worrying you. WWWWW what? The more she looked upon what was in front of her, the more her bewilderment grew. All the students were safe, and not a scratch was on any of them. They were all sat eating together in the center carpet, some were on their phones as though it was all casual. However, she could not help but find herself constantly gazing upon the magnificent throne at the back, where sat a smirking black-haired boy, and still, only if it were for only an instant, she felt like she was in the presence of a true monarch. Kids. You're all safe. What? What happened? She muttered, scratching her aching eyes. I'd be glad to explain. Moby's smile grew larger as he forced himself out of his seat, walking towards his principal while the others stored their food back into a storage ring and did the same. We killed all the shulkers, and now we waited here. You. You did what? But how? She lost all sense of her dominant professional air and asked. After all, if the instructors couldn't defeat them, how could they? Our instructors fought valiantly and got them extremely injured for us, they sent us away into a cave for our own safety, but we disobeyed orders and left anyway since we felt like it would only be a matter of time before the shulkers healed and found us. We had to capitalize on the opportunity. Here are the bodies, I kept them safe in this storage ring so their bodies stayed frozen in time and didn't decompose. 
Moby pulled out a ring from his pockets and handed it over to his superior, who immediately looked within to find three corpses laying inside. I. Apologies, I'm just lost for words. Don't worry. We all understand. And if you are wondering why we did not use the teleporter and head back to school, we chose against it. We thought that it would be best if we were her to explain everything to you and help you collect evidence, and we didn't know how powerful the communications were to your ship, so we didn't want to leave only for you to arrive and find nothing. I. I see. That was a good call, she nodded slowly before shaking her head, her face of shock slowly turning into a smile as she began to softly laugh at herself. Kids, you have no idea how stressed I was about all of this. But I'm so happy you're all safe. No. Not happy. Proud. You killed three shulkers and avenged your instructors. I'm certain they're smiling at you from heaven right now, I really hope they are too. A man spoke from the back, and the principal's eyes once again went into wide puzzlement. Kai. Kai Fatebringer. Ha, W-A, I. I thought you were dead. I got reports saying you were cleaved in half with your guts leaking out. Oh, I'm so dearly sorry to worry you, but my death was greatly exaggerated. You see, that part of me was just an illusion I conjured with my flames, a trick of the light, but we lost signal of you, that was because my right arm was cut off along with my watch, I, I see. That makes sense. She nodded and smiled once again, breathing a single breath that completely let go of much stress and paralleled her current state of mind. That was when suddenly, footsteps were heard from behind, and all of their attentions were drawn. Sorry for the wait. But we are here for support. Stand down soldiers. Reyna ordered. Everyone is safe her, but keep your guard up. Now is not time to get careless. Five of you stay here. The rest go and explore every nook and cranny of this castle. If you find anything interesting relay it back to me. I expect a full report on everything. Understood? Yes'm. They yelled back all in unison and did as they were told. Kids, thank you so much for the explanation, her expression softened as she looked down towards her students. But I'm gonna need some things more in depth to help me out with my investigation. I believe all of you, but according to protocol, I must question at least one of you about the happenings with a lie detector. This is very important, because depending on your answer, it will determine whether or not peace will be extended a bit longer or we would be forced to once again enter another great war. Chapter 392 It had now been a day since Moby and his team were last on that frozen planet of Coburn, yet that day felt more like an eternity in their minds, there were so many official proceedings that they felt dead once it was all over, which included, helping with the investigation, going through lie detector tests, setting up the teleporter back to Earth, writing full reports, swearing to absolute secrecy about everything that happened, and much more. It was now the night of their return, and they were. All justifiably beat. The only upside was that they would have no school the next day in order to rest Artorias, Elizabeth and Hikari were in their own rooms keeping to themselves while Regret, Kai, and Moby were in the same dorm room. It was something approved by the principal herself, all in an effort to get Kai and Regret closer to each other due to the Fatebringer family's request. Anne. Checkmate. Regret laughed and puffed his chest. Wow. This is a rather interesting game. Chess is what you call this right. It's indeed very complex, I had no idea someone like you would be so good at it. Kai nodded, looking at his own defeat. I'll have you know I was undefeated in chess in my high school days. And what do you mean you didn't think someone like me would be this good? You trying to say something? Regret retorted, only to receive a smile and a casual response. Oh nothing really. Why don't we do another match? I feel slightly more comfortable now, H.A. Hey, You're on. But the outcome ain't gonna change. However, before they were ready to begin another match, they heard a creaking from the entrance, and their attentions were grabbed as they witnessed the door open to reveal a man with black hair and green eyes that they immediately recognized, yet what was foreign to them was that small, black and fluffy bundle of cuteness within his hands. I'm back, he sighed. Hope it wasn't too long. Moby casually walked in and took a glance at Kai and Regret playing chess. Is. Is that a cat? A black cat? Regret blurted with a hint of confusion. Yeah. Isn't she cute? She kinda reminds me of myself. Black fur and green eyes. Yeah, I can't lie. It is really freaking cute, but why would you want a cat? Is it even allowed? Young fledgling, you should know that it is a grave mistake to question his highness. Kai mumbled, crossing his hands. Don't worry, it's okay. I would rather not everything be so tense and formal, especially if we're gonna live together. It's best to be casual, I don't mind questions. Even I make mistakes at times. Moby sighed once more, petting the cat in his hands as it purred with pleasure. Understood my lord. He bowed his head and looked up towards Moby with determination. You know. I'm never gonna get used to this. You in my brother's body. I can't believe you actually got past their checks and stuff. Well, my technique is infallible. I am an artist, so I hone my skill in illusion magic so I can always look in the mirror and sculpt whatever I transformed into. Infallible, but you can only stay like that for eight hours at a time. Regret teased. Too quiet you. And also, your name is Rupert Wright. What kind of name is that? It's funny as hell. Regret inwardly chuckled, only for Rupert's annoyance to mildly increase. Rupert is a fine name. Enough you too. Try and get along will YA. Moby interrupted, only for Rupert's expression to tense up immediately. Hey, apologies my lord. I let my emotions get the better of me. He looked down in shame. Never mind that. Moby sighed again before continuing. Do you still have contact with your two shulker minions Rupert? Sadly not. He shook his head. They have infiltrated and blended in with their kinds now, as for how they are doing I know not. They are too far away to contact, but I have full faith in them, I see. That's good to hear. Moby nodded, sitting on the couch, fatigue all over his body. By the way, Rupert, I have a question for you, yes my lord. Ask away. What gave you the foresight to keep those shulker bodies that you killed before in the dungeons? I think most people would have just destroyed them, I, I don't know my lord. 
It's just that part of me felt like I might do more research on their corpses in the future. I really did nothing. It was you who reverted their corpses back to their original state after they had rotted using the Book of Resurrection. Without it then I don't know what would have happened, I see. Moby leaned back and peered up at the empty ceiling. Tomorrow we have a break, I want you two to train together as partners understood? Regret, Rupert might be able to color his black flames orange, but he has no idea how the Fatebringer fire works. He needs to perfectly emulate it so people don't get suspicious, and don't forget to tell him all that you think he needs to know about Kai. And Rupert, Regret is a new demon, so it would be nice if you were his mentor of some sorts to help him control his demon energy. I feel like you two would make excellent training partners. Moby spoke and waited for a burst of outrage from Regret, but the answer he received was not something he expected. That's fine by me. This guy is even stronger than you right now, right? Even if he's not as knowledgeable, having someone so powerful as a mentor is really good. Indeed, normally I would say you should be honored, but due to the Lord's request, I shall try to be more friendly with you. I hope you can teach me all I need to know about injecting myself in this human society. Rupert interjected. Was that supposed to be a compliment, if you want it to be, then yes. Moby looked at the display ahead of him before looking back down to his cat, petting it on the head before speaking. I might also get Hikari and Elizabeth to come learn from you Rupert. I have many plans for tomorrow, and I have my own training to do, so teaching demon energy to everyone is not something I accommodate. Understood my lord. It shall be done. W wait. Hikari too? Why? Regret suddenly spoke, and Moby raised an eyebrow. Yes? Is there a problem? And no. Not at all. She seems like she's strong but rough around the edges when it comes to real, stress-filled combat. I'll be sure to teach her a thing or two. Moby could not understand the sudden awkwardness exposed by Regret, and he was too tired to understand as he took a deep breath and stood up with his cat still in hand. Where are you going my lord? Rupert asked. To bed, I haven't felt so tired in weeks. He yawned. Really? Regret wondered. For some reason, I don't feel tired at all. Like? Really not in the slightest. Usually, I'd be at least semi-tired by now. That comes with the perk of being a demon young fledgling. Unlike most mortals, we don't tire as easily to the point that the top echelon doesn't need to sleep other than for fun. Rupert interjected. You know, at first I was really skeptical about this demon thing, but I went with it because it was the only choice I had and I was promised power. But now, I'm actually glad I did, and just like promised, I still feel like me. And you're not doing some weird shit to control me. All these added benefits are really amazing. I'm glad you liked it. Moby smiled. But now I'm going to sleep. See you guys later. Hey. Don't you want to wait a bit? They're gonna announce the rankings for the exam. After all that we did, I bet we got first. I'll find out when I wake up. Staying up won't change the outcome. Anyways, I'm out. Moby yawned, petting his cat as he left the two brothers alone once again. So. While we wait for the results, want to play another round of chess. You're an old man. Respect your elder fledgling. Stop calling me fledgling. It's annoying as hell you old geezer. Chapter 393. Moby slept like a little child, yet, the weight of the world still felt like it was sat on his shoulders, or in this case, his stomach. Ha! Huh. He mumbled out loud, moving his hands to scratch his aching eyes while something was clearly prowling on top of him. Is that the cat? Is the cat moving on me? He wondered, when suddenly, he heard a voice speak out to him. Wake up! It's already 10 a.m. you know? Yeah yeah, I'm up a villier. He yawned and opened his blurry eyes before sitting up straight. Hum? When he looked around him, he noticed that Regret was not in bed, nor was he even in the house. He must have stayed up for the entire night. And as for what was on his stomach, it was indeed the black cat, and Moby's tired face could not help but simper. What are you smiling for? Get out of bed and move. Just give me a sec of Ilya. I still feel pretty dead. He replied, scratching his eyes, but that was when he felt a sudden slap to his stomach, and his attention was drawn by the cat oddly staring daggers into his soul. Just move already. That mammon guy's been trying to contact you for a while now. It's best not to leave him unleashed, what? What did I just see? Did? Did that cat move its mouth like it was talking English? Is the voice coming from her? What's going on? Am I still asleep? He inwardly thought to himself. S, that's because it is real and you're not asleep. Can't you see? The cat smiled and elegantly took a pose. Wait what? What's going on? Is the cat talking to me? Can it read my mind? Wait. Does. Does this, yes it does you sleepy head. It's me. Great demon Lord of Ilya Greymore. She laughed with her hands under her chin in a way no cat would have been able to do, and Moby's eyes grew wide. Wait. Avilia. But, but you're a cat. How the hell, ha 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 ha. Now that's the reaction I was waiting for. It's all pretty simple you see. It's because of the Book of Resurrection and that possession spell. Is. Is this why you told me to get something small and fluffy? This can't be real. What the hell? I really must still be dreaming huh? He shook his head, his eyes wide in absolute stupor. I can assure you I'm real as ever. Now I have the ability to possess anything with relatively low physical and mental resistance. For example, this cat is a great one. But, something like a human child is out of my capabilities. Still, I haven't felt more alive in so long. She smiled and jumped around on his stomach as if it were her bed. But, but why something small and fluffy in specific? I never knew you were the type of girl, am I not allowed to choose what body I want to possess? I don't want to be a rat or an ugly beast. Something proud and elegant suits me best. She proclaimed. I, I see. Um. Never mind that. Anyways. A part of your soul is in that cat, right? But. You can still read my mind no? H how? Simple really. She waved her paws. 
I'm not an independent entity yet, my consciousness is split, both in your soul and in this cat. I'm still deeply bound and connected to you. So, if you die, I would also die, even if I'm in this cat, after all, my soul would have nowhere to return to. But, if I were to die within this cat, my soul would find its way back to you and it would be like nothing happened. This also means I can just get out of this cat whenever I want and get back to you. She proclaimed proudly to the still dazed Moby trying to fathom everything that had just happened. If a part of your soul is in that cat, does that mean you still have your powers? Sadly not. She shook her head. In this current state, this body would not be able to handle anything beyond simple spells, even discounting the limitations of the possession spell. Don't count me out though. I still have a few tricks up my sleeve. Even in this stupid body. She laughed her signature laugh, and Moby's bewilderment could not help but subside into a bright, genuine smile. Don't worry, I never thought that you were useless. Even like this, you're still Demon Lord of Ilya Greymore. We've worked so hard to get to this point, and even if it's not perfect, it gives me hope that we can get your body back. Congrats, thank you. She smiled. This body is far from perfect, but it's for sure better than nothing. It's a good start. Life really is great. Now I can move on my own. Explore wherever I want. I can finally talk to other people without you as a medium. I have so much freedom. Whatever Zerka did with this book of resurrection is incredible. Moby's soft green grew even larger seeing how happy Avilia was, it was truly a marvel and made him feel warm on the inside thinking what they had gone through to get to this point. He almost felt a tear well up in his eyes, yet he could not let it show. After all, he could not allow such a hideous sight to be presented, and there was so much else to do. Now that you can talk with others, are we gonna tell everyone else about this, s mm. Avilia stopped to deeply ponder. I'm not sure, but we can certainly tell Rupert, as for everyone else, I think it'd be best if we waited for now, I see. Moby nodded. Anyways. Before I go for today. Do you want to try to eat? You haven't eaten anything in thousands of years. Hum? Avilia ruffled her whiskers. Are you gonna feed me cat food or something? I mean. Yes? What else would I feed you? Maybe it tastes good for you. You know. Because you're a dash, I'm not a cat. I'm the demon lord. I've eaten delicacies you could never imagine in your life. My palate is very delicate I'll have you know. I will not stoop so low to eat cat food from a bowl. Chapter 394. Moby wiped the sweat off his forehead and smiled at his very own creation. It's finished. He cheered with a long sigh of relief, holding out what he had made and placed it on the table where the cat form Avilia impatiently sat looking at her paws. Oh. Who knew you could cook so well? Avilia's eyes brightened up into stars, delight all over her face as she turned around to see what Moby had made for her. This is what you humans call cake right? A brown cake. Looks very fancy. I've always wanted to try one of these but I never got the chance. I really hope you like it. It took more effort than I imagined but it's finally done. He smirked with his eyes closed, washing his hands and removing his apron before going towards the balcony. I'll be the judge of your cooking. He stretched his stiff muscles and took a whiff of fresh air. When he looked down below, it seemed like the students were on break, and Moby could not help but immediately pick up on something that he did not from before. There was an underlying gloomy air, like a rain cloud fell upon the campus and affected almost everyone. It was indeed odd, the only explanation he could think of was that they were not satisfied with their exam scores. However, part of him thought that it might be for another reason. Could this be? S. Hello, Mammon? Are you there? Moby made a link, and the heavy breathing from the other end was immediately clear. Oh. My great demon lord. I'm so honored to be contacted. Are you busy currently or can you talk? I am doing some matters currently but nothing is more important than a call from my overlord. I have been trying to contact you for the past few days, yet I could not reach you at all. I grew slightly worried at first, but then I realized that it was surely my paranoia and you were simply too busy to bother with the likes of me, indeed, I was busy, yet it was not because I did not want to talk to you. Don't belittle yourself so much. You are a very important demon in my plans, I, I, I don't deserve such praise. The mammon sounded genuinely bewildered, and Moby could not help but inwardly chuckle before continuing what he had to say. Anyways, mammon, you were tasked with the extortion of points from the masses? How are you faring? Oh oh. Excellent. It is all going even better than I had anticipated. All due to the powers you have bestowed me my lord. These ignorant fools are so simple-minded and easy to manipulate. Simply by threatening their enrollment in this school, they are more than willing to bend the knee. Some of them I did not even have to threaten using a loved one as hostage. They truly value their success in this school over anything, and if it costs them a few points a month then so be it. They are too proud to let their facade of superiority falter and bring disgrace to their family. Then, in their minds, their lives are over, mmm, sounds delightful, Moby smiled. But how exactly are you doing this? My lord, you would be surprised how much one can do by simply changing their face and voice and going into video calls. You can uncover so much about one's family, even their inner secrets, and rarely does anyone ask why, I see. So you threaten to announce their secrets, putting the blame on them. And just like that they so easily bend the knee? Precisely my lord. I do that and even more. I just have one question, how are you able to contact Earth through this barrier put in place? Moby wondered, noticing it through the mammon's explanation, thinking only one thing on his mind, will he be able to contact his friends back on Earth with such a way? I have a machine able to make contact with the strongest communication centers on Earth, this includes most households of powerful families. I can show it to you if you so please my lord. No need, Moby sighed. If it was limited to what he claimed, then contacting Earth would have still been impossible, after all, he would have to contact the Griffith estate where in all likelihood a secretary would pick up and expose him for doing something he should have, never had the ability to do. So, I assume you have already widely implemented this plan of yours. How many students is it and how many points have you obtained? Thus far my lord, I have made contact with 25% of the student base, most of them being runaways from the mammon's den and all was a success. 
I have yet to receive over 10,000 points, but 30,000 has already been pledged to me. Out of every student, I can extract up to 50 points every month to allow them to sustain themselves, and if they don't, I will simply leak their secrets and pit the blame onto them. There's nothing really the school can do this time, even if they found out about the plan. At this rate, most of the school will fall, and I should be able to collect around 25,000 points a month or more. Excellent mammon. I am very pleased to hear all of that. You have far exceeded my expectations. Once again, you grace me with such words that I could never fully deserve. I'm truly honored to serve a man such as thee, Manon, if anything else happens do not hesitate to contact me. The next time I wish to meet you either with Mindlink or face to face I will contact you, understood my lord. And if you wish to extract any of the points or use them for anything school related, do let me know. It is rather difficult to dump so many points so early into the school year, it would simply be impossible and raise the school's alarms. But, I can bypass most of it, don't worry, I too thought of this and have come up with my own plans, but I'm curious to see yours when the time comes down to it. I currently have other matters to attend to. Why you honor me once again? He breathed shakily and heavily from the other side. I promise to work even harder and more proficient from now on to serve your highness. That is what I would like to hear. Moby smiled and closed the call, taking a deep breath as he sat down on a chair overlooking the campus before simply staring at the barrier enveloping the school with calm eyes, but that was when his calmness was interrupted with a sudden voice from his rear. S. Hey. Moby. This cake is delicious. Who knew you were such a good cook? She purred in delight. What's the main ingredient anyways? Chocolate? Is this what your cake tastes like? Cat food. He replied with a wide grin from ear to ear, and just like he expected, a hysterical outrage ensued from behind, one that he ignored to make contact with someone else. Elizabeth, are you there? Yes, Lord. I just woke up. What is it that you need? Moby could not help but smirk hearing her direct shift in attitude from that conversation they once had, like a weed fearing for its life to be plucked. We need to talk. Face to face. Chapter 395. Here is your drink, sir. A man smiled and placed a glass on the table. Thank you, and here is yours. You have my thanks too. I hope you too enjoy your drink here at the Shack Shack. If you ever need anything, please let us know. The waiter smiled brightly and deeply bowed his head. By any chance, are you two dating? He gave them a certain look, yet all he received back was a calm gaze with a subtle feeling of disgust and malice. He felt an ominous aura run down his spine, and his heart lurched down to its deepest depths like he was going to be eaten whole at any moment. However, that feeling only lasted for a split second, and it felt so surreal that he even doubted its existence as he shook his head and waited for his customer's response. No, we're simple acquaintances. You must get a lot of couples that come here so I understand the confusion. He took a simple sip out of his drink, and the waiter lowered his head further almost out of instinct before standing up and leaving them alone. Thank you for your understanding, sir. But my other statement still stands. If you are ever in need of anything, please let me know. I certainly will. Thank you. He smiled as he watched the waiter walk away from him, the atmosphere was quite bustling from the city ambience, the people talking in the near tables under their own umbrellas and especially the flying vehicles zooming through the air, yet, the two sitting opposite to each other could not have been more focused, almost as though these distractions never existed. So, how's your day been Elizabeth? Are you very well after yesterday's events? Oh. Ha ha. I'm doing very well. I see you two aren't doing half bad cane, you even bought yourself a cat it seems. She giggled, looking over at the smiling cat sat on Moby's lap dot on the outside, their conversation was friendly and natural, like any conversation friends would have. Yet, under that outer facade, within their minds elapsed a completely different story, one much darker in nature. One good reason. Give me one good reason why I shouldn't just kill you now, oh. I see. She inwardly smiled, before continuing in a nervous voice. So you don't have full control over me and you're scared I would rebel and expose you if I'm not left in check right. I don't think it's wise to talk to your superior in such a tone, especially when their lives depend on it. Go ahead, try to betray me. Scream that I'm a demon at the top of your voice, anonymously tell someone all my secrets. Give it a shot why don't you? But before you try it, I'll be generous and give you the answer. It won't work, then. Then why exactly do you want me gone then? She inwardly shuddered, I'll tell you at least this much. You're unreliable. At most, I can use you as a simple puppet for my own goals, but other than that, you're completely useless. I'm limited to a certain amount of demon soldiers at a time, and to get more I must pluck one out. And out of all my subordinates, you're by far the most useless and the most likely not to follow orders other than if I force you. I don't want to order around a simple robot with no will to help, suggest, or serve. So I'm going to ask you this one last time. What makes you so special? Give me one good reason I shouldn't just get rid of you and find a better replacement. W well. Um. Moby could sense the panic in her voice, she seemed to have snapped out of her hysteria. I'm the only daughter of the Eleonora household. My family specializes in everything to do with medicine and support. We're the leading power in that department. I'm certain my family houses some of the biggest secrets in the entire military. I apologize for my tone, and for trying to kill you. It's just how I've been raised and taught, how you've been raised and taught. Moby raised his eyebrows and leaned in closer to his seat. What exactly do you mean by that? Please explain. Why yes. I'm an angelist. Or, at least I used to be, huh? What is that? Does that have to do with what you said to me on that planet? In the ancient tombs? Why yes. She inwardly nodded. This information was left far, far away from the public, but I don't mind sharing it to prove my loyalty. She took a deep breath before she continued. The Mayan ruins that the great Alexander Davis discovered these abilities is a sacred ground where pilgrimage of many take place, but just not anyone. Only those who can afford it, and only those privy to the secret sector, on the walls of the ruins where the golden egg was, there were symbols. Symbols and drawings of winged and horned figures fighting, along with certain texts. From history, the very beginning of the human race, the angels were always glorified, and the demons were shunned. 
that was how life was and how we humans functioned. And, the writings on the walls reinforced that, vilifying the demons and worshipping the angels. What I'm about to tell you is an even more well-kept secret, but whenever one was to pray to these angels and denounce the demons, their abilities would subsequently strengthen, yet I noticed that their corruption grew along with it, yet it was subtle to the point that not many knew. And all of this was possible due to a single man. Pope Rutherford. Out of everyone, he somehow knew how to read and decipher the texts, him. Moby could not help but blurt. It was a man he saw on TV all the time, always praised for his deeds and efforts to mend the world, and even helped the poor and abilityless. I thought he was just a normal Pope preaching religion, which is a lost cause and laughed at by many, yes. Him. The one and only. He's the leader for this secret club of rich and noble families hoarding powers and secrets all to themselves. They have a complete grasp on everything, they even began to make the people lose faith in God for their selfish needs. Even if it would not be as potent as being an angelist, praying to any God gave a certain boost in power. Honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if there was any shady business going on within that religion that even I don't know. I've been indoctrinated into that religion all my life, and only now that I've become a demon do I realize what this all truly meant. So, once again. I beg for your forgiveness. I didn't mean what I said now, I. I just panicked because I thought my life was forfeit and I didn't know how to react. I beg, please have mercy, I may not be privy to all my family knowledge now, but I certainly will in the future. I'm more than certain I can be of great help to you. So please, spare this pathetic life of mine and allow me to properly serve. Chapter 396 Is what you've been telling me honest and sincere? Moby asked, heavily imposing his dark aura, and the reaction from Elizabeth was more than apparent. Why yes. All that I've said right now is the truth. I would never try to lie in this situation. Good. Moby sighed and revoked his tense aura and killing intent, and the sudden darkness shrouding them faded away as though it were never there. Well, I hope you keep all that was talked here in mind. He took a deep breath and stood up out of his seat. W.H. Where are you going Lord? She asked, looking up at him from her chair, only for him to turn around and respond. Our conversation is over here. You've proven yourself useful to me, so I expect great things. For now, you should go train with all the others, I bet you're gonna need the help controlling your demon energy, I'm gonna go do my own training. Farewell, and don't disappoint. He simply walked away from the table without saying another word, and Elizabeth, who was frightened out of her wits was left alone, her hand on her heavily beating heart taking deep breaths. That was pretty well done you know. He heard a voice in his head. Well, I picked some of that up from seeing how you talk to your own subordinates. He inwardly smiled. Face to face has much more impact than a simple mind link, I bet what's happened today is solid in her mind, a brand that haunts her and keeps her loyal to me lest she be the unwanted weed plucked out of the ground. In a muted, metallic room lit up by several blue lights beaming through slits of the grey walls, twenty men and women sat in a circle around a long table spanning from edge to edge. It was silent, and the tension in the room was so evident that it could be sliced with a knife. Sweat covered the clasped hands of many of the people sat, their eyes trained on a single empty seat towards the edge and at the door handle as though it was imminently going to be opened. This was especially the case for one woman who stood out considerably from her peers, sat opposite to that empty seat. Her wavy, pitch black hair was neatly tied into a ponytail, and there was just enough makeup on her already gorgeous face to beautify it yet not overwhelm her natural allure. Her blood-red eyes were firm, and her hands were clasped on the table nervously, unlike her usual carefree, enjoyable demeanor. She was tame, and completely professional, if not nervous, which was exemplified by her attire being a complete, elegant suit and tie. She took a deep breath to calm her mind, and that was when a sudden sound came from the door, and the noise of it swinging filled the room, allowing a single man to walk in. His hair was gray and neat, his skin was wrinkled, yet his dominance immediately enveloped the room upon entry as he looked around with a glint in his slightly glowing emerald eyes, and a shine upon the ten stars on his attire. And as though it was out of instinct, the entire room shot up straight as an arrow, all in perfect sync as they spoke in a steady voice. Greeting Supreme General. We are truly honored to be in your presence. Greetings to you too. He smiled, casually strolling to his seat looking around at the saluting soldiers, and only when he took his rightful seat did everyone else take theirs. So, I take that all of this is important right? Miss Raina Davis, you called me here for matters of absolute urgency. Please, I allow you to speak, yes sir. She replied with the pride of a lion, and she immediately spoke there after being given permission. Sir, for the past few days, me and my troops underwent a mission of great surprise. On an exam given to them by staff, a group of students encountered shulkers on a planet, powerful ones at that. They managed to defeat all three examiners tasked to protect them. It was a planet we had already explored and deemed quite safe, the inhabitants were weak and had no abilities, only exhibiting oddities in behavior which could be chalked up to a different culture. So I was led to believe there was no possibility for such an attack. Ho! Oh. I see why you called me now. War is nearer than even I anticipated. I take that the students are dead then, no? This will complicate things. He sighed. Negative sir. Every single student made it out alive sir. She shook her head and replied, and the Supreme General's eyes grew wide in disbelief. Go on Miss Rayner, I'm listening, sir. I too was surprised to hear about their survival. Because not only did they survive, but they were the ones who took out all the shulkers. Had it not been for the extensive lie detector tests conducted, I would have not believed it either. But their explanations made perfect sense, that the instructors had gravely injured and nearly killed the shulkers, and all they did was finish the job. Yes. He nodded. That does make perfect sense. But maybe it makes too much sense, no? Yes sir, what do you mean by that? Are you saying, yes, maybe these lie detector tests are not completely accurate? I was never a big fan of them. In my time, I have seen them bypassed, why you have sir? She could not hide the surprise on her face. Well yes, but actually no. Call it a gut instinct. Think of it like this. It may not be that the lie detectors are faulty, but the person being interrogated has the ability to control their memories and mind, making them useless. In the past hundred years, we've seen many abilities, yet none of that kind. But, it doesn't mean that they may not exist out there out public and military knowledge. The world is bigger and deeper than you think, I, I see sir. 
but the evidence from the investigation and the autopsy proves everything they had said. Which made me more inclined to believe them. What I saw would be nearly impossible to fake, I doubt that we, the military would be able to fake it the way they did. As for the shulker corpses, I had it transferred to Hyrie Prison on Earth where that one shulker is still being kept since the year prior, and he still refuses to speak no matter the torture. At this point, I am inclined to believe that he is unable to speak at all, mm. The Supreme General furrowed his eyebrows and took his time to ponder, rubbing his small beard. This is far more intricate than I thought. Part of me thinks we've been caught up in a web of events beyond our scope and we're being played for fools. He took a deep breath to calm his mind before he continued. I need to know who exactly are these students who embarked on this exam. Five students, sir. The first place team from the exam, Team Artorias. The team was, team leader, Artorias Calamit, Healer, Elizabeth Eleonora, the Flame Brothers, Regret Oswald and Kai Fatebringer, and finally, last but not least, the person who I feel ended up being the true leader of this group. Moby Kane, the famed hero. Moby Kane? The Supreme General's eyes grew wide at the mention of his name. The same Moby Kane who halted the advances of that shulker last year. And the same Moby Kane, son of Harvel Kane, and Serena Kane. That Moby Kane? Yes sir. The very same. Raina replied, a mixture of emotions embracing her face upon hearing the Supreme General's voice. Chapter 397. Sir. Is, is there a problem? Raina stiffly asked, looking at the Supreme General's face. What? What is he doing now? Yes sir, just answer the question, General. I will not repeat myself. Where is Moby Kane now? Last spotted, he was in the city with his teammate Elizabeth. I had given them a break to rest after all they had gone through so they have no school today. I see, well, what about the rest of his team? What are they doing right now? They are in training facility A altogether training I assume, that was where they lasted their check-in, check their training rooms, P pardon sir? She mumbled in disbelief. I said check their training rooms. Am I speaking in a different language Miss Rayner? There should be hidden cameras in every training room for emergency purposes. So, I'm asking you to use them now. B, but. But sir. That goes completely against protocol. If we are found out to do this in such a manner then we would lose so much trust. The military may never be the same. Miss Rayner Davis, you should watch your tone when talking to a superior officer. If I deem this as an emergency situation then that is what it is. Now use the cameras and put them up on the screen. B, but. She blurted out, still unable to believe her shaky eyes, looking over towards the general's calm yet deadly glint under his furrowed bushy brows. And before she could say any more, she heard a voice from her side, to a colleague she knew all too well. Yes sir. Right away. That man pulled out a laptop and a massive screen appeared towards the rear end of the room with slight static. And with great expectation on his face, the Supreme General looked over behind him as the static of the screen slowly faded away into a high-definition live video of what was happening. And to say that he was shocked by his findings would have been an understatement. What, there? They're just meditating in a circle. I'm sorry to interrupt sir, but what were you expecting? Why are you so on edge? What is it that we don't know? That is none of your concern, General. Then whose concern is it then? This room is filled with people from the highest echelons of all the military. What is it that is so secretive that we are not allowed to know? It seems to be of great importance if it's getting you this flustered. If it's for the sake of humanity's well-being we have the right to know sir. What's your tone, General? I apologize but, I just need to know this. Does this have to do with the case of Harvel and Serena Kane? They were upstanding soldiers. The best of the best people I've ever had the honor to meet and fight alongside. I strongly believe they were a great reason for our survival in the first war. But so suddenly, they were shunned away as though they were nothing. Their accomplishments were never recognized as though they were forsaken. Sir. Why is that? And is this simply prejudice from your hatred of Serena and Harvel Kane? I don't know what they did, or if it even warranted their treatment. In fact, no one seems to know. But for certain, their child who was a mere toddler at the time of their depart has nothing to do with anything. Miss Rayner Samantha Davis. Calm yourself and watch your tone. The Supreme General roared, raising his voice for the first time since he entered. A pulse of dark aura escaped his body, suffocating the entire room in a miasma of pure horror to the point that some even began to choke. It almost felt like there was a sharp, dark hand of shadows hovering and rubbing against their hearts, holding the power to in an instant, crush it like a grape, vibrators paled in comparison to the speed some of the people sat shook at, their eyes like peas and their teeth clanking filling the air, Supreme General Cade Walker's face was slightly clenched, and his now viper-like emerald eyes shined like a laser beam through his thick aura towards Principal Rayner Davis. Despite being the target, she remained resilient, withstanding all the anguish with nothing but slight grunting and sweat build up. However, even she at one point had to break, and bend the knee to absolute power, choking and struggling to survive until suddenly, the darkness dispersed, and all went back to normal. Principal Rayner Davis. Listen carefully. I usually do not under any circumstance tolerate any insubordination and disrespect. I would normally have fired you from your post and shunned in the wind. But for you, I'll make an exception. If it were not for my relationship with your late grandfather, your fate would have been the same as any other. You should not stick your nose in matters that don't concern you. All you need to do is follow commands, that is how we keep order and how we protect humanity. You should know the consequences and how it feels when someone doesn't follow orders properly seeing you have such a high rank, right general. Now, I will allow you back to your post as principal under one condition. Simply apologize and promise me such a thing will never happen again, as though it were out of instinct. Raina Davis found her head lowered, unable to move as she listened to the words of her superior with heavy breaths and sweat dripping from her forehead and on the ground. As he finished what he had to say in that distant voice of his, she had many thoughts going through her mind, and in the end, she responded in a strong, yet somehow jittery voice. Yes sir. I apologize for my abhorrent mannerisms and disrespect. I have more than learned my lesson and I promise that such a thing will never happen again. Thank you so much for your mercy and generosity sir, you are truly far too kind to give me such special treatment, good to hear. 
he smiled, looking down towards her before shifting his gaze towards everyone else in the room. I hope that message sticks with the rest of you as well. Now, let's continue on with this meeting. I will personally contact the Shulker King on this matter, and I will try my best to reason with him and extend our time until the war, your findings are truly useful. Oh, as an extra command as well, I want you all to keep a particularly closer eye on Moby Kane, and report anything suspicious to me. Break the rules if you must. That is an order. Understood? Chapter 398 Moby took a deep breath as he opened his foggy eyes to an equally foggy and wet tube, that was soon followed up by white smoke as the hatch ahead of him opened. For the past few hours, he was sat in that tube, yet his mind wandered elsewhere in the virtual world where he and Avilia trained. He practiced the elemental magic basics even further, yet what he focused on most was discovering any new techniques to do with his new evolution, and the look on his face told the entire story. Just like his dragon half, Avilia was not able to help him learn the skills and magic, after all, she was just as lost as he was. However, now was even worse since Avilia had at least heard about dragons, this abyss was a complete unknown even to her. He now knew and understood the struggle that many demons went through over many years to develop and perfect their moves, all this time, he had the best mentor and cheat code a man could ask for in the form of the demon lord herself, but now he was left to his own devices to uncover the mysteries of his new form. He sighed as he took his first step out of the machine, and the first thing he noticed was the bright light past the open doors of the training room. Oh, they're all back I see. He thought to himself, before he felt something soft and fluffy rubbing on his legs, what's with that face? Don't get discouraged, with your skill and talent I'm sure you'll soon make a breakthrough, huh? I don't think you understand who you're talking to. Training is in my blood. I don't mind an extra challenge, I haven't had one in a while. He chuckled. Also, you're back in cat form, is it so easy for you to switch back and forth from VR to cat? Yep, she nodded. Only downside is that by doing that, the cat's soul takes control while I'm gone, I see. That's not that bad, Moby stretched. Anyways, as long as I get the hang of all of this by the end of the year, I'll be more than satisfied. After all of this is over, the real quest will begin, I don't doubt that at all. She purred. Speaking of that plan of yours, are you going to tell at least some of it to your minions? I think the new adjustment you made will be very nice indeed. Yeah, I think they have the right to know at least some of it, he smiled. Speaking of letting people know, are you just gonna hide that cat form of yours from everyone other than Rupert or are you gonna introduce yourself? That's, that's none of your business. Huh? Are you shy or something? Never thought that you would be the type, he teased. No. Of course not. I just don't feel like the time is right. I'll do it on my own terms. Suit yourself, he shrugged with a smirk, before focusing his attention on the sounds coming from outside the room. Black diamond hash black diamond hash black diamond hash damn that smells good. Imma dig right in. Watch your manners, I didn't cook all of this for beasts to devour. Hum. Oh, Kane's back. Greetings my lord. Hello, everyone, he smiled, taking a seat next to all of them on the dinner table, not taking his eyes off a certain new guest. Why is Artorius here exactly? Is it not curfew yet? I haven't really been paying attention to the time. No, it's not, Regret replied. We met him on our way to training, then he just stuck with us, I see. Moby nodded. And Rupert, you're once again in your demon form. Yes my lord, he deeply bowed. I only have an hour of transformation time life for today, and there is currently no one watching us so I decided to save it in case of an emergency. Oh, don't worry I understand. I was thinking out loud. Anyways, what were you all doing here before I came? We just came back actually, so we just decided to eat. We haven't even had a time to celebrate our first place on the exam, so now seems good a time as any other. Artorias is a great cook. Regret responded. Sadly I can't do some of the classic family dishes from up above, but I have thoroughly educated myself in the way of human cooking. He casually nodded, slicing a piece of steak. Sadly, Miss Hikariyami could not join us today, nor Eleonora due to the gender boundaries. And, we could not go elsewhere to eat because Rupert's transformation timer was running low, and most importantly, there would no real celebration without you being there, indeed. No party is complete without my lord. Rupert nodded vigorously. As for my transformation timer, can you not just give me one of those things that you use to keep yourself not looking like an angel? I've already told you that this item is exclusive for us angels, I wouldn't be astonished if it were to be poisonous for your kind. But would it not be possible for the Book of Resurrection to, I know not, Artorias interjected. Nevertheless, I only have one that I am solely using, I could not give you another even if I wanted to. Moby's smile could not help but widen listening to their conversation, it made for a perfect segue to what he wanted to discuss. There might be times where you'll be in need of your, kai form when your timer had run dry. For example, how would it be possible for you to undertake an exam like our last one when there may be examiners watching us at all times? M, my lord I, I'll try my best to perfect my technique to make it active all 24 hours of the day. I promise to try my, no need. Moby chuckled, and with a simple wave of his hands, Rupert was silenced. It's not that I don't trust you, but I just have my doubts about your ability to do it. But that doesn't matter, since I have another idea in mind. I think it's about time to explain to you all my plans for the year, and to do that, I think it would be a good time for a proper party with everyone in it. We have three hours until curfew, so, how does that sound? Black diamond hash black diamond hash black diamond hash of course, no one had the right to reject Moby's request, so they all packed their needs into their inventories and rings in order to set out. Prior to talking to them, Moby had already set up all the arrangements and informed all who needed to be informed. There were slight hints of nervousness from Rupert, rightfully so considering his timer. Yet, after a single look into the cat's almost unnatural emerald eyes, he shook those doubts away and even felt disgusted with himself, they all left the room together, and ventured out into the dimly lit hallways and towards the elevator ride. But that was when something rather unexpected occurred. Hum? Kane, you coming? Regret raised an eyebrow and turned around. They had all left the elevator, yet there stood their leader inside of it, looking at his watch with wide eyes filled with what he could only assume to be interest, fear, or astonishment. Chapter 399 
It was currently nighttime, and the dome hovering over the sky turned into a darker tint of green, shining dim light on the city below. But, indeed, below the glowing dome was an even more magnificent light show formed of several miniature lights, like a compact cluster of stars shining in the sky. Flashing lights filled the streets, beaming from every angle all refracting on the many reflective surfaces, the skyscrapers stood tall, the flying cars zoomed through the skies and near the roads making all sorts of sounds that added to the city's bustling ambience. Compared to the mornings, the streets were filled with people on the sidewalk and an unusually high number of drunks aimlessly wandering in and out of bars, that along with couples that wanted to enjoy the nighttime air. And through the crowds, six figures made their way through the darkness with a casual demeanor and a clear purpose in mind. And that purpose led them into a grand hotel, five glowing golden stars proudly displayed upon its facade. Yet, before entering, one man stood out from the rest, looking keenly at the sky before smiling and shaking his head, entering along with his friends. And after they got past the counter, they made it towards a magnificent door etched in gold towards the center of the bottom floor. My lord, Joker, I hear footsteps outside the door, don't worry mammon, it is I. I'm going to use the key, so don't be startled upon our entry, yes my lord. Understood. The door slowly opened without a single creak, revealing a dark yet spacious room. However, for them, the darkness posed no problems as their night vision made what lied within more than clear. It was a house like any other, and the fanciness matched even their own, rather rich households, which were very impressive. It was fully decorated in gold and silver, many paintings hung on the walls and furniture all aesthetically pleasing to the eye. Yet, despite all of that, what grabbed their attention most was the long table at the center with eating utensils neatly set, and light from classical candles upon the middle. Greetings my lord. Those three words were the first thing he heard upon entry, and directly ahead of him was the figure of a young, completely unknown man that Moby immediately recognized. Greetings to you as well mammon, I assume all the arrangements are set up. Things look excellent so far from what I can see, yes, my lord. All is ready. Even the last minute adjustment you proposed. Excellent. He smiled, closing the doors behind him, ensuring they were locked before he turned on the actual lights of the room. Mammon, raise your head, why do you still keep it low? And my lord, um, am I allowed to gaze upon your true face? I've only seen you in a mask prior, yes, I allow you, his smile grew bright, and a hint of a chuckle emerged from under his expression as he watched the mammon slowly, and nervously raise his head, only to be met with eyes as deep and expansive as the very oceans. My lord, you're, Moby Kane. The hero, I, I would have never assumed so in a million years. You were the last person I thought of in my mind, oh, well, I hope you were not disappointed, he inwardly laughed. No, no. Not at all my lord. This, this is incredible. The sheer providence to be able to so easily fool everyone is incredible. The mammon began to crumble, shaking uncontrollably. His reaction was just as Moby expected, no, it may have gone even further beyond, but now, Moby had no time for such distractions. Enough of that mammon, on your two feet. He ordered, and his minion immediately did as he was told. Yes my lord. Is this room fully secured? Yes lord. Every room in this hotel is completely private, I can 100% assure you of that. Excellent, he nodded, before his attention was directed elsewhere. Hey. Kane. Should you set up all the food here? We gonna start eating or what? Regret called, and Moby turned around to face him. Don't worry, we gonna eat all right, but we gonna eat over a long discussion about everything that's gonna happen this year. Black diamond hash black diamond hash black diamond hash over the table, they all had a lengthy conversation, and the unraveling of what Moby had in mind was more than any of them imagined. Wait wait wait. So you're gonna use that event to announce everything? How are you even sure you can win without you revealing your powers anyway? And, let me get this straight, you got the mammon on your side, and you're not even gonna use any of the points he's farming for you. Why? All will be clear in due time, he smirked, looking over towards Regret. My lord, are you going to let this person talk to you in such a way and question your planning? Does he not understand that your mind is beyond all of our comprehension? Mammon. Keep calm. His eyes turned purple, and his glance shook him to his very core. Questioning me is no sin, even I make mistakes and rely on my subordinates to point them out. What is a king who does not listen to their subjects? Why yes my lord, you understood. He lowered his head and gulped, before he heard a slight chuckle from his side and a voice entering his mind. It's all right, I had to learn the same lesson too, and when he looked up, he noticed it to be a fellow demon with grey skin and horns that stood tall upon his head. Now that I've got all of that explained, do any of you have any questions? He looked expectantly towards all of them, yet he did not even receive a single response beyond a faint breath, but that was when Hikari nervously spoke, her voice soft like a whisper. Big brother. I, I just wanted to ask you if you know what exactly I am. A fallen angel? I'll respond to that, Artorias abruptly interjected. It's very complicated, and I noticed it ever since I first saw you. Angel magic has greatly corrupted your being. I've never actually seen a fallen angel, but I've done my research. It's not intercourse between an angel and demon or something of the like. It's more like when two corruptions clash against one another, I don't understand. Are you, are you calling Yami a corruption of some kind? No no, he shook his head. I think your two half split is the thing. In all my life, I've never seen or even heard about such a thing. You greatly intrigue me. To this day I'm uncertain if your two halves are two different people or halves of one. It's all the fault of my people. Please allow me to help you and rectify that mistake. He held her hand with passion, and Hikari could not help but back off and inwardly look down to hide her face in surprise. Hey! Hands off bud! What do you think you're doing? Regret smacked Artorias away with clear annoyance on his face. She might be corrupted, but she's not corrupted at all. That's just the way she is. And I like her for both her halves. Watch yourself, he scoffed. Why do you speak for her? Maybe she doesn't like being like that and wants to sever the corruption to return to her true self. Maybe get a different form for her two halves. Both of you. Calm down. Moby roared, startling all at the table with a lion-like voice. Now is not the time for this. Hikari is not some little girl. She can decide for herself. Now, Rupert. Yes sir. 
Have you and Mammon agreed upon the swapping method? I will be the medium for it. And Mammon, don't forget to tell your minions that Rupert's true form will be your true form as well since he will cover for you in many circumstances. Yes my lord. We both worked it out, he lowered his head gracefully, the Mammon following suit doing the same. Lord Kane, I don't know if it's my place to ask. But what is the purpose of all of these precautionary measures? Why must we be so careful? Elizabeth leaned over and spoke for the first time since entering the room, her pupils keenly yet quiveringly looking towards Moby. I don't want to take any chances. This all has to be absolutely perfect. That is all. He leaned back into his seat, taking a deep breath looking at the ceiling with narrowed eyes, remembering the words written on that unknown message anonymously sent to him. Beware the hounds, they are your enemy. Chapter 400 It had been well over an hour since this party, and now was as good a time as any for it to come to an end. They had more than discussed all they needed, and it was the first ever time that all of Moby's new subjects had met eye to eye. And as they stored all of their belongings, their attentions were drawn towards the mammon who aimlessly walked to the edge of the room, pulling out a certain book off a bookshelf. And suddenly, the entire shelf itself began to move, shift and turn, removing itself to reveal a secret passageway underground. Wait what? How did you do that? Regret was beyond stunned, his mouth unconsciously wide open as he viewed a scene as though it was straight out of a movie. It's a secret path towards my lair, it's specially designed with teleportation in mind. He explained, almost bragging. Yes, but why is it here? And how? Well, I do own this hotel. It's only natural, he smirked, only to impress Regret even more. Rupert, go there for the day while I go off with our lord. Are you able to remove that watch of yours to give to me? Certainly, Rupert nodded, snapping his fingers to create a blue dome around his wrist before casually removing the watch that felt like it was super glued upon there, flesh before giving it to the mammon who immediately wore it. Everyone witnessing what happened looked rather stunned, rightfully so. Yet, what they did not know was that Rupert used a greater demon exclusive spell to freeze the item in time, allowing there to be no alarm triggered while he removed it off his wrists, great. I'll send a clone with you to vouch for your identity as mammon, and to explain to you precisely what to do. He brought his hands out, and his flesh began to swirl into an identical figure of himself, escorting Rupert away. Farewell for now your majesty. He spoke, before the passage removed itself, and the environment returned to precisely how it was before. Black diamond hash black diamond hash black diamond hash altogether, they left the hotel and began to walk back towards the school. It was one hour until curfew and none of them wanted to be out so late, all except for Moby who lagged behind the group, he and his green-eyed black cat that was never too far away. Are you coming? Regret called out. You guys go without me. I'm gonna go on a walk with the cat. Huh? Okay. You do I guess. Not my fault if you're out past curfew now is it? Regret was the only one to say his farewell out loud, while the others, like ordered, did it in their minds. Did he say he's walking with the cat or walking the cat? Regret mumbled before he faded away out of Moby's ears. With his black cat walking near his legs, they strolled towards a park. An area of vast grass overrun by a sea of flowers for as far as the eye could see. Trees from all over the world and some from even foreign planets on full display. Rivers ran through the center like dividing lines, with a single bridge connecting them both. Wildlife of all kinds flourished, the noise of the bustling city was faint, replaced by the sound of birds, crickets, and running water. So, what did you want to talk to me here about? Avilia spoke, casually walking on the ledge of the bridge overlooking the vast river. That message. I've never gotten an anonymous message before. Someone's definitely out to get me right? He spoke calmly, his hands resting on the grey, rocky ledge as he stared at the leaves slowly falling down towards the river. That's hard to say, maybe it's just a troll, or maybe it's real. Who knows right? But if it's making you more cautious then it's a good idea for things like this, yeah? I hope it's a troll, but I'll be sure to watch out. He sighed. Anyways, it's been months now, and the Supreme General has yet to call me to discuss about my parents. Do you think I should contact a teacher? I would say not, she purred, licking her paws. I think he has much on his hands to bother with you, war on the horizon and all, I guess so, he sighed once more. It's just odd, why is the information about my parents kept so secret? What's up with that? Do you think the military did something to them? I thought that should have been obvious by now. The military has never been a trustworthy environment. Now especially after Elizabeth told us about that angel-worshipping cult, yeah, that's why I keep my guard up. Hey, you think that there might be a demon-worshipping cult somewhere out there? Moby mused, well, on earth, I doubt it other than maybe a select few. But in the beyond, there certainly are a whole lot more. Take that chalker we took on last year. He worshipped the ground I walked on and was convinced he could rip me out of you to become the new demon lord. At least in the shulker ranks, there are demon worshippers, that's very true. Moby's eyes lit up above his smirk. Maybe those shulkers under Rupert can do something with them, who knows, yeah, and I'm still very curious about that stone he talked about, the one that lit up upon my arrival. Do you think it's a place similar to what these humans found in those Mayan temples? Possibly. Oh, yeah. There's so much I want to know about. Now you know how I feel all the time. Congratulations. She laughed in classic Avilia fashion. You know, now that I think about it, I think I know of a certain group of demon worshippers still on Earth, wait. Really? Where? They're the people that are still giving you XP to this day. The XP share still works from this distance, and they were the ones that allowed you to even get to level 100, you just never noticed because you have those notifications disabled. Wait, you mean, yep. They see you as the next demon lord. So they're definitely demon worshippers, right? Abby Reed, the flame princess, Jaden Griffith, the problem child, Ray Guane, the boy genius, and Nags Axel, the calm juggernaut. Moby's face immediately brightened hearing their names, and his eyes fell down towards the reflective surface of the river imagining their faces. His heart felt unsteady, and his mind felt like it had its own heartbeat thinking about how his corruption that was now no longer there would affect the way he acts, towards them when they meet again, you know, it's only been a few months since I last saw them or even heard their names, yet in my mind, it felt like years. I wonder what they've been up to without me. I actually wonder that almost every day. 
He smiled to himself, before suddenly hearing a ruffling faintly entering his ears, and his mind went alert under his casual poker face. And as he activated his energy sense, he witnessed something extremely far away exit his range, only managing to catch a small glimpse as he took a deep breath, leaning even further on the rocky ledge, returning the smile on his face even wider than before. Chapter 401 The auditorium was loud and bustling, rightfully so. All of a sudden, every student was called down at once. Yet, to them, it was not something sudden at all, but rather expected considering it was the time of year that brought upon the most anxiety of all. They knew what was to come, yet that still could not stop them from sweating profusely and jittering like sugar addicts, after all, it had now been many months since the initial exam, and now was the end of the year. The end of elite school for all of them. Silence. The principal is here. Behave yourself. A sound emerged from the darkness of the auditorium, echoing around all the walls and into the shaking hearts of every student. And as though it were out of instinct, quiet overcame them all as they waited and watched with bated breaths, looking over as the red curtains slowly unveiled themselves, uncovering a single figure stood in the shadows that was then immediately lit by bright, golden light beaming towards them like a spotlight. Of course, it was none other than Principal Raina Davis herself, her hair tied in a ponytail elegantly behind her back. She was just as usual, yet this time, she was not dressed in her casual attire. Her soldier's uniform of black displayed golden stars that shined on her heart, perfectly matching the seriousness on her blood-red eyes and her rigid demeanor that slowly subsided into a smile. Greetings all students. It is I. Your principal. Raina Davis. By now you should be more than used to my face and voice. The same could not be said about many others. Out of 1,089 students who initially set foot upon the grounds of this esteemed school, only you remain. Chosen elite above the elite. 256. That should be a great achievement you never let down. No matter what happens next. You all are champions in my eyes. Her smile grew wider, putting her hands behind her back as she casually strolled around the stage. As you know, every year, the final event set up is a tournament of every single student. A great tournament that will be broadcasted throughout all human civilizations around the universe. A place to prove your mettle and strength over everyone. The arena of champions. She waved her arms out wide, and her words echoed encompassing the still silent room, nothing but the sound of the racing hearts of the masses heard thumping like a shockwave. Like every year, the tournament will be managed by the military itself and it will have five special guests judging and overseeing it all. The five greatest guilds in the world. The Hunter's Guild. Famed for their control over the right sector and many of the most powerful names in the world. The Hawk Guild. The newest one to enter the top five. Their reach is far and wide throughout the galaxy, and their members have been rumored to make the most on average. The Cells Word Guild. A guild of power and freedom. Unlike the others' guilds, they focus solely on the top echelon of power. Despite having far fewer members, each one has distinguished themselves beyond a shadow of a doubt. The Flame Seeker Guild. A guild owned by the most powerful and distinguished of all fire ability households. The House of Katarina. And last, but most certainly not least. The Guild of Light. Aim to reach and explore the far reaches and darkness of the universe to discover what was once unknown, their leaders will all be here. Them along with me, and the Supreme General himself. Cade Walker. We will oversee the top 32 matches, and after each one, each will have an opportunity to give you a position in their guilds, or the General will bestow upon you a rank in the military if you choose to stay with us. Certainly, beyond the offerings, there will be many rewards. Especially that of the coveted first place rank. However, like every year, the rewards will be based on the judging, and will not be public until the award ceremony. She took a long pause as she continued walking up on stage with a bright smile, her footsteps becoming ever louder, like a crescendo of anticipation welling up with each step until her mouth opened once again. Now. You might be asking yourself, what's so special about this? They do it every year. Ah. Uh, but not this year. She laughed. As you know, the virtual reality tech has recently been expanding at a rapid pace. And the researchers and students in this very school have been taking charge as many of you might have noticed, especially in the prototype machines found in your dorm rooms. Well. This year. The entire tournament will take place in virtual reality to show it off to the world and how such technology can prove very essential for the future of humanity. So, if you haven't tried it yet, I very much implore you to try out the VR machines in your dorms. You have been taught and prepared for this very moment by all of your amazing teachers, so don't panic. Simply try your best and see what destiny has in store for you. She spoke, before she paused once again, but this time, she halted her movements as well and narrowed her blood-red eyes towards the crowd with a mixture of an innocent smirk, and a sinister frown that sent shivers down the spines of all. Oh, and for those who plan on cheating or rigging the event, I suggest you reconsider. That is all I'm going to say on that matter. And this is the end of the assembly. Two weeks. You have two weeks to prepare. I wish all of you luck, although strength and strategy will be the determining factors of this tournament. Luck is certainly not needed when you're good enough. I hope you have enjoyed your stay in elite school thus far. For this will be the finale. May the greatest fighter win. Chapter 402. The assembly had just concluded. It was very brief, yet its impact was rather poignant. There was mass panic and hysteria every year after such an assembly. That was expected. However, the gravity of it all this year was multiplied even further beyond, as the students were left to go on their normal break, their faces wide, some awfully vocal as they walked out into the open field while others were deathly silent, staring apathetically at the ground, everyone had an opinion on what they had just witnessed, and Moby and his servants were certainly no different. Hey! Kane! Were you listening? Regret yelled within the mind link, running up towards Moby in the distance. The whole thing is gonna be in VR. Is this gonna fuck things up? His voice became more frantic as he neared the still silent Moby, until his face became clear. A look shrouded in shadows, a grin from ear to ear completely contrasting the faces of panic all around him. No. This is no problem at all. In fact. 
This just solidified our victory. Black Diamond, Black Diamond, Black Diamond precisely a week had passed since the student body had all gathered in one location, and currently, it may be their last. The main gym of the school was bustling, cramped and nearly unrecognizable. Fitting for the event, metallic stems showered green light from above along with slight shimmers that fell upon the rows and rows of neatly placed virtual reality machines, giving the otherwise drab space an almost whimsical air. Teachers were stationed in every corner, tasked to maintain order and guide those who were confused. Each student had a specific machine assigned to them, and once the teachers assured all was correct, they too entered their very own pods and allowed their minds to be whisked to a new reality. The process of entering VR had become all too mundane to everyone there. After all, they had been in it practicing non-stop for the past week, yet despite their efforts, none were prepared for what they witnessed upon entry. The hollow sound of the static void in their bright vision was there, yet it slowly began to fade away into something hazy and more familiar. The brightness that surrounded them did not dull at all, but even expanded further in power as they began to gain feelings within their limbs, and the true world began to fully set in along with that subtle haziness surrounding their senses until finally, all was crystal. They're here. Let's go Raymond. We're on your side, asked asterisk asterisk asterisk, before they took in their surroundings, the sound of the roaring crowds exploded into their ears from all directions, blasting them wide awake, their surroundings were so unfamiliar. The ground they stood on was a tiled white of pristine quality, and the sky was a shining fantastical bright white with golden clouds swirling unnaturally, like it was one's interpretation of what heaven looked like. That was what their eyes fell upon first. It instilled a sense of wonder unlike anything previously in their lives, yet it was not where their wide eyes stuck. Beyond the thick wall of their fellow students was another wall of people of far denser thickness, sat upon a seat of a grand reimagining of an old coliseum, cheering at the top of their lungs. The pillars decorating the ring of people surrounding them seemed to have a distinct architecture, independent, unique from the ones of the past. And as their eyes followed around the circle of people, their gaze landed upon an area above, protruding outward from the main building, decorated with a swirling structure like a stream of falling water frozen in time. And upon such a grand canopy sat six smiling figures gazing back down towards them. Welcome to everyone. Your favorite time of the year has finally come. The arena of champions. And this year is extra special. Made in VR. A sound echoed in all directions, one upbeat and hyper in nature that no one could seem to find, screaming over the entire crowd, no doubt an announcer. However, upon closer inspection, there was a man who stood upon the stage ahead of them that did not bear a student uniform, but rather a tuxedo and sunglasses along with blonde slick-backed hair to match his energy as he spoke. And without further ado, let's get this started. First, I would like to bring your attention up top towards our cast of judges this year. A slight shine engulfed the canopy above, and all eyes were drawn towards the six that sat in its shadows. Point two of them were immediately recognizable, the Supreme General, Cade Walker himself along with their very own principal, Rainer Davis. However, the other four were expectedly unexpected, and turned their awing gazes into complete astonishment and a loss for words. All of them waited for the crowds to settle and shout all they wanted, and from the middle of the pack, the Supreme General was the first to take action, standing up from his seat and immediately grabbing the attention of all. And with a simple raise of his hands, the overly aggressive, roaring crowd was consumed by complete silence as they waited with bated breaths. Greetings to all students of the Alexander Davis School of Elites. I, Supreme General Cade Walker personally congratulate you on reaching this far. What you did is no mere small feat. But one that should be cherished no matter the outcome. I'm more than certain, all of you will go great places in life. I would also like to greet the audience. They're not just any random old crowd. I'm so glad all of you could make it through your busy schedules to witness the champion of this new generation. And a special thank you to all the people watching from home. Many of this would not be possible without all of your support. Oh, and of course. Last but not least. I would like to thank our four guests of honor for their arrival today. The Supreme General smiled, his wrinkly face like that of an old, loving grandfather before he sat back down on his seat after receiving a bow from all those who were sat beside him. Thank you so much Supreme General for your kind words. They will truly make an excellent starter to today's events. I would also like to introduce all of our very special guests for today and the judges who will oversee everything, especially the final 32 students. Thank you to the leader of the Hunters Guild himself for gracing us today. So Wilhelm Ortiz, he motioned towards the man sitting towards the far right of the judges, and he immediately stood up and greeted the crowd with a kind, loving smile that matched that of a celebrity or supermodel, Ashen, short hair gently hung over his fine, young, warm face. His narrow amber eyes set sunken within their sockets, as he charmingly watched over the fawning crowds. His features were well framed, and his face was clean shaven with subtle scars like medals of honor that oddly complemented his hair, and left a pleasant memory of his reckless luck in battle. He stood gracefully among the others, exemplified due to his lean frame. There was something charming about him, perhaps it was a feeling of sadness or perhaps it was simply his sense of honor. It's a pleasure to be in all of your presence. His smile grew brighter before he sat back down on his pale seat and allowed the announcer to speak once again. And to his left is a lady that needs no introduction. Her bloodline had been famed for its strength and ferocity since the infancy of abilities. The leader of the Flame Seeker Guild. Ashley Orbeck. Just as the man to her right did before, she stood out of her seat and greeted the crowd, only the energy she displayed lacked his elegance, but more than made up for it in emotion and ferocity, her straight hair waved in the wind as she walked, an odd mixture of black and white fighting for dominance on top of it. Her attire matched that of her demeanor and fit snugly on her short yet rather well-endowed body. Her wide, beady eyes were a mismatched black and white, and the smile on her face was bright, proud, and cheery, displaying her white, yet oddly sharp teeth that would set a smile on any beholder's face. Good luck to all students. And congratulations to you all for making it here. But just you know. I don't just choose anyone to enter my guild. Prove to me that you deserve it and I'll shoot you an invite. She laughed heartily before sitting back down where she stood. And next. We have another woman of equally matching beauty. The leader of the famed Cells Word Guild. Yuria Dark. All eyes on her, she uncrossed her legs and strolled out into the limelight, her long black dress dragging slightly behind her feet. Her entire persona emanated dominance and elegance as she looked upon the crowds with an all-too-assertive look. 
She was clearly the oldest of the three women sat atop the canopy, yet her beauty was not squandered by age nor shown too much. Her dull green eyes had a slight glow to them, looking around as she waved with a subtle smile on her face that bore a small beauty mark near her right cheek. Her deep, red hair was straight, smooth as silk, and her movements had an odd mixture of dryness and exaggeration that felt all too natural for someone like her. And with a few simple words, she strutted back to her seat, the crowd cheering her name. May the best warrior win. I'm looking forward to seeing how things go this year, and now. Last, but not least. The new guild on the block. They have climbed up the ranks and almost emerged out of nowhere to their current dominance. Of course. It's none other than the Hawk Guild and their leader. Grey Osborne. The announcer spoke, and subsequently, a man stood out of his seat. His long, wavy midnight blue hair fell down near his shoulders, the light beautifully reflecting upon it giving it a dark shine. His bright eyes of gold were elegantly poised below his thick eyebrows, and his open smile as he openly welcomed the crowd completed the expression on his handsome face that bore a slight stubble. His attire was rather simple yet awe-inspiring in its own way, a dark blue that matched his hair along with a nicely paired gold and black befitting even his cape, unlike the others, he had a more welcoming air to his actions, like that of a kind but fair monarch who would rule with his mind and influence and not by an iron fist. I'm so honored to be attending this for the first time and to see such a warm welcome. It is truly wonderful. Good luck to all of today's participants. May the light shine bright upon today's events. He waved and sat down from where he stood, and as soon as he did, the announcer cut off the crowds once more. And of course, we can't forget about the person who oversaw all of this. None of this would have even been possible without the help of our dear principal. Raina Davis herself. The granddaughter of the great father of abilities. Alexander Davis. She stood up and greeted the audience and the students ahead as she usually did. Yet if all was normal, her students would not be looking at her in such a way. After all, it was the first time they had ever seen her in a black suit and not in her military uniform. Put on a good show students. I hope your training paid off. You better not disappoint me. Understood. Yes m. The entire crowd saluted and responded out of instinct, which put on a smile on the now laughing principal as she took her seat once again. Fighting will begin shortly. All matches will be put in place by a random computer generator for the sake of fairness. The matchups themselves will be shortly posted upon this screen. The announcer spoke, and a massive blue screen appeared at the other end of the arena as though from thin air. All students have been sent instructions for the rules, but they will also be posted for the audience on their guest watches if they so please and on our website for those at home. When the time for their matchup comes, all students will be automatically teleported to their designated arena. If you wish to spectate a specific match, simply refer to one of the before-mentioned sources to navigate to the arena or to one of the sub-channels for those at home. We have 256 students and only one will remain in the end. So there will be many matches going on all at once until the top 32 which will be going on one at a time. And for all participants, keep an eye out. For there will be a chance for one of our honored guests to spectate your match even before the top 32. For now. All students will be teleported to their event hub. We will go on a short commercial break. I hope to see you all again in 15 minutes. Chapter 403. A bright, patterned radiance of white emerged beneath the feet of every single student, and with a simple flash that engulfed their vision, they found themselves once again transported to an unfamiliar environment, one far more bland yet still pleasing to the eye. Altogether, they stood upon what could only be described as shimmering clouds, each with a specific message that appeared in front of them that they immediately read. You have approximately 30 minutes until your next fight and 15 minutes until your matchups are announced. You should be prepared due to the fact that your battle could begin as soon as 5 minutes after the matchups are announced to a full 45 minutes. In your free time, you can go explore the various different exhibits and tourist attractions within this area of virtual reality, spectate the battles of your fellow students, or simply train in a private area until you are automatically teleported to your next match. In closing, good luck to all students. Conversation sprung out immediately between the masses and their fellow students, discussing about what had just happened. It was the first time that they could find the energy in themselves to properly speak after the day's events thus far. And not too long after did light engulf the feet of many of the students as they disappeared from place, perhaps doing as the message suggested by their exploring this new world or training even further for their upcoming match. Moby and the others had done extensive research in VR in preparation for this tournament. And, it had already been established to them that MindLink was oddly missing in this space. So, for the first time in seemingly forever, they had to rely on the word of mouth to converse. After they had been teleported onto this cloudy void, they had already met up with each other. So, Kane. What do you think we should do now? Regret asked. I don't know, do whatever you want. He smirked, shrugging off Regret's question. It's only 15 minutes so whatever training you're gonna get in isn't much. My low, I mean. K. Kane. Are you that confident of victory? Is it okay to be this casual? I believe I could easily defeat everyone here considering my status be you, Kai spoke, before suddenly and abruptly being cut off by Artorias. I wouldn't speak too much if I were you. I wouldn't trust this space. For all we know they could be using this to spy on us without even knowing. The military is sly, we can't reveal all of our family secrets. Yeah, that's true. Good eye art. Art? Artorias raised an eyebrow towards Regret. Yeah. Art. Short for Artorias. Good nickname, right? Yes, I can conclude, I'm not incompetent. But the last time anyone has ever called me Art was my mother, then, Art, call me Daddy. Regret laughed. Silence. Call me Art again and you shall pay. Artorias retorted, and everyone around him could not help but laugh. As though he felt a massive headache overwhelm him, he placed his hands on his head and sighed. Anyways, we don't have much time before the start of this tournament, and I'm really inclined to go exploring this VR area. Hikari, do you want to join me? Um. Ah. Uh. Oh, okay. Yeah. I bet it'd be fun. She nodded. I'll join you guys too, Elizabeth agreed. It's not like I have anything better. WH, Regret blurted before stopping his speech early. Hum? 
What's the matter, Regret? You have something to say? No. Art. I don't. Then suit yourself, he smiled. We'll just go without you. Be big brother. You wanna join us? Hikari asked with wide open eyes. No, sorry, I have other things to attend to. It isn't something of concern really. He reciprocated her smile before casually walking away, and disappearing into thin air before anyone could give him a proper goodbye like many of the others that once stood in this space. Oh, oh. I see. Well, good luck. What about you, Regret? You joining us then? Nah, he shook his head. I think I'll go alone with my big bro Kai. Am I right? He laughed, wrapping his arm around his brother in a friendly manner, slightly startling him. Oh, well. Okay. Why not, seems like a good time with my cute younger brother. Oh, okay, well, you two have fun then. The disappointment on Hikari's face was evident as she looked down gently before suddenly, Regret shook his head and quickly turned away. We're gonna go now. Good luck with all of your matches. Hope to see you in the top 32. Both he and Regret walked away, and a small white light engulfed them as they prepared to teleport. So long to you all as well. Hey, and Kai. How many times did I tell you to stop calling me fucking CU, Black Diamond hash Black Diamond hash Black Diamond hash Kai, and Regret were whisked away through the void as they suddenly found themselves together at what they could only describe as an amusement park. In heaven, the sky shined down upon them with its same magical radiance, yet now it was blocked with various tall, magnificent structures one could have only imagined in dreams. It was not the machines themselves that were impressive, but rather the modern yet colorful and intricate design fitting the theme of heavenly magic. They found themselves in the middle of a bustling crowd, rides all around them. Overwhelmed with where they wanted to go, they began to aimlessly wander through the crowds. Yet, in the end, they could not find a single ride fitting, and they found themselves sat upon a bench, looking towards the sky. Hum? Does nothing seem to find your interest? I think this is all pretty cool. Kai spoke, looking towards Regret. Well, ah. Uh, that's not it. Then what is it? The last time I came to an amusement park was when I was very young. My mother had finally saved up enough money to get tickets and we went there together. It was one of the best, most memorable days in my life and I just don't feel like it's the same. I always just think of her every time I'm here you know. Ah. I see. Kai nodded before slightly smirking. But, are you sure it's not because Hikari chose to go with Artorias rather than you? What? Where did that come from? Of course not. You can't fool me little brother. He laughed. I've kept an eye on you for the past few months, and I can confirm that you have a crush on her. N, no. That's not true. Why would I like someone like her of all people? I don't know, why don't you ask yourself? If you want to prove to me that you don't like her, why don't you try talking to a girl here? There's a lot of good ones. I'll even do it with you. Just for fun and to get you out of your comfort zone. You've got to be kidding me. I may have never had any experience in girl stuff, but I'm certainly not helpless. He sighed, scratching his head. And wait, what about that girl you always painted and stuff? I always thought she must have been your girlfriend or something. Her. Huh. Oh no. No 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 no. She's indeed the most beautiful girl in the world, but I would not dare think of her in such a way. I'm not even worthy. Oh. Okay, anyways. Are you a pussy or not? You gonna talk to some girls with me? Pussy? Where did you of all people get that word from? From you. Who else? Fair. Ugh. Fine. I'll do it. But I'm just gonna do some casual stuff. I'm not trying to be a weirdo. Great. Kai laughed. This will be a first for me too. I'm certain it'll be fun. I can tell you've been watching too many bad influences since coming here. Chapter 404. Hey, are you gonna talk to someone or not? We're running out of time. Are your standards that high? It had been several minutes of just aimless walking, and Rupert had begun getting restless. Stop rushing me. It's not as easy as it looks. Regret scratched his head. Is it really though? Let me show you then. He smiled, looking over towards two girls in the distance that caught his eyes, lined up behind one of the roller coaster rides that were not as cramped. Hey! Wait up! Regret followed suit, the two girls were gorgeous indeed, both talking to each other with clear excitement upon their faces. Point one was a girl of average height, her deep blue hair like the night sky and her matching eyes almost sparkled, surrounded by her clean, pale skin and thick, arching brows. Her attire was rather casual, a cropped black t-shirt and jeans that fell down slightly above her knees, perfectly matching her low socks and blue sneakers. The other seemed to be just as outgoing, yet slightly more glamorous. Her pink hair was tied into short pigtails, and her green eyes radiated fierceness within their sockets. Her white shirt fit rather tightly under her jeans jacket, and beneath there was a red skirt and black stockings that went up from her shoes and past her knees. And before the slightly red-faced Regret could even speak a single word, he found himself in the line behind them with Rupert taking the lead. Hello ladies, can I have a moment of your time if you don't mind? Um. Who are you guys? Do I know you? What do you want? The pink-haired girl turned around and raised an eyebrow, her friend doing the same only her gaze was far wider. Apologies ladies, me and my brother are going around interviewing people to get an insight on what they think of the tournament. He smiled. Elise. The blue-haired girl nudged her friend. That's the student uniform for elite school. I think they're both in the tournament. Oh oh. Is that true? Her eyes immediately went open. Well, yes. But I didn't want to make it a big deal, he laughed slightly nervously. I, I see. But why is of all people? There are so many others. Oh. Well, you two caught our eyes. I'm not gonna stand here and start lying to you. Right regret? He laughed and nudged his brother to his side. Ah. Why yeah. Ooh-hoo. I see. The pink-haired girl smiled. What your names? 
I should at least know the people interviewing me, right? Oh, of course. My name is Kai Fatebringer. And this is my little brother Regret. Fatebringer. The girl with blue hair blurted. You mean the fire family? You guys are experts at mana manipulation, right? Can you show us something, please? She asked with star-like eyes. Um, well, that's getting a little off topic, but, please see, see, okay, Regret. Why don't you show him something? Regret was suddenly put on the spot, and his mind went blank before he remembered that Rupert could not exactly do these complex mana tricks. Fine, I guess I'll do it. He sighed, lifting his hands and expelling orbs of mana from every color of the rainbow popping upon his fingers. And by simply flexing his wrists, he controlled them up in the air like fireworks that exploded and formed a rainbow of mana up above. The two girls were absolutely stunned, looking up towards the magnificent light show displayed towards them in awe. Wow. That's really amazing. I can only get three colors myself. No wonder you're elites and members of the Fatebringer household. The pink-haired girl spoke slowly approaching Regret with hands clasped, maybe slightly too close as the rose on Regret's cheeks became slightly more apparent as he instinctively took a few steps back and spoke. Ah. Uh, glad you liked it. It was really no big deal, anyways. Rupert clapped. I wanted to ask you a few questions. Are you two okay with that? Yeah. Of course. Great. He cheered. First, what are your names? Oh yeah. How could we not have introduced ourselves? I'm Elise Leona. It's a pleasure to meet you. Elise, the pink-haired girl slightly bowed her head before looking them both in the eye and standing up straight. And I'm Jasmine Kale. We're both from Country H. It's nice to meet you both. She followed her friend's lead. So, what did you want to ask us exactly? I'm getting to that. Rupert waved his fingers. First off, in your opinion, who do you think is most likely to win the tournament this year? And who are you going to be cheering for? Oh. Now that's a tough question. Elise pondered. But, if I had to choose, it'd have to be Adam Walker. MMHM, her friend nodded. I'd have to agree with that. The Supreme General's son? Not me? Ark. You wound my heart with your harsh words, mademoiselle. Counting me out so quickly. Oh, I'm sorry, she laughed. I'm just being realistic. I don't really know what you're capable of. I don't know, maybe surprise me in your first few matches and I'll change my opinion. She narrowed her eyes and leaned in closer. Oh. So you're gonna spectate our matches? Well, now we are. She laughed. Ah. I guess that's even more motivation to impress. He reciprocated her laughter that quickly spread amongst their peers, although Regret was rather stiff doing so. Well, other than us, who are you cheering for? What were you looking forward to most when coming here? Ha. Huh. Well, that's easy. Jasmine chuckled. We're both definitely cheering for Moby Kane. If anyone has a chance to take down Adam Walker, it's definitely him. Yeah. Elise agreed. He nearly defeated a Shorker leader last year. I wonder how strong he's gotten since then. Oh, I can't wait. That's a great answer. Very understandable. I bet you won't be disappointed. I'm more than certain he LL win. Rupert smirked and nodded. It sounds like you know him. Please tell us. Or no no. Never mind. I wanna be surprised. No spoilers. Well, I can tell you that he and we are kinda close, wow. That's amazing. I know Kane gets a lot of hate from all the jealous people since he was just an orphan who rose up after getting an ability, but I really admire his determination and how he is genuinely trying to help the world. I know there's many people who would try and take revenge after gaining such power. I was just worried since we hadn't heard anything about him at all for an entire year. Anyways, I'm really happy to hear that he's made allies and wasn't antagonized in that pretentious elite school. Elise smiled, holding her hand strongly. Well, he's too powerful for anyone to actually antagonize him. Trust me, some people tried. Rupert laughed heartily. Oh. Is that so? You're getting me so excited to see his fight now. I'm getting all giddy. Do you consider yourself fans? Well, I guess so. Jasmine giggled. But, we're not part of that extreme part. I know there's many people that can get wild. She spoke, and suddenly an announcement came from ahead. The next round on the roller coaster is about to begin. All aboard. Oh. Elise. The line is moving again. They all followed the line, and just as they were about to enter together, both Regret and Rupert were cut off, and the two ladies entered without them, of course not before giving them a goodbye. It's been really nice talking to you both. Good luck with both of your matches. We'll make sure to be there. Bye ye. Thanks for that ladies. It's been a pleasure to meet you two as well. He waved back towards them before they faded out of view in the distance. There was no longer reason for Rupert and Regret to stay in line, so they simply walked away, one certainly feeling much better than the other as they found themselves once again sat down on that all too familiar bench. Hey, Regret. You were so quiet. You're normally quite the talker. You were like a little kid out there. Ha ha. I knew it. You really are shy around women. Shut up. That's not it. He shook his head. I would have spoke more if you didn't just talk all the time, hey, are you jealous of MMOB or something? Jay jealous. Why would I be? Well, it does seem like he's popular with everyone and all, Arga. Regret scratched his head. I'll just have to prove myself in this tournament then. Everyone knows about you but not me seeing you're the face of the Fatebringer family. It's time to make a name for myself. I have my own goals too. I'm not jealous at all. Aha. Uh -huh. Rupert slyly nodded before suddenly, a loud sound emerged from his watch, in fact, it emerged from the watches all around him as well. And immediately, as though they all had the same thoughts, they looked down towards their wrists with excitement and eagerness as they read. The matchups are here. Regret expressed. Ah, uh, my match is in 40 minutes. Against. Brian Liu. 
Never heard of him before. Seems like an easy match. I'm in 35 minutes against Hubert Vendry. I don't know him as well. Artorias is also in 35 minutes against Nyon Bray. Hikari is in 20 minutes against Zoe Yimfa. Elizabeth is in 8 minutes against Jalen Morgan. And M. Mobis is in. 5 minutes. Against Raymond Scott. Damn. I didn't expect him to be going this soon. But, at least we have time to spectate. And from what I've heard, his first matchup's gonna be pretty tough. Regret acknowledged. Tough? Rupert snorted. That must be some sort of joke. Well, he's still gonna win of course, anyways, how exactly are we gonna get to his arena? It's ah. Uh, AB0301. That's the code. I've read up on it while you were staring at the sky earlier daydreaming. I can show you how, Rupert spoke, when abruptly, their figures were covered in an abnormally thick, human-shaped shadow, like someone peering over them from above, and to their surprise, it was two girls, yet not the same two girls that they had spoken to prior. No, these two were far more beautiful to the point that even Rupert himself had to blush in their presence. It was a beauty that could not even be considered on the level of human. If the last two they had spoken to were eights or even nines out of tens, these two would have most certainly broken the scales, their faces bore an abnormally elegant polish and elegance found nowhere else, and a deep, thick stare peering down towards them. The one that carried a denser presence was slightly shorter than the other. Her eyes shined brighter than sapphires, and her long, vibrant, dark blue hair reached her bosom with slight bangs above her elegant yet thick brows. She wore a pure black sundress connecting around her neck and falling down slightly above her knees, revealing her clearly well-endowed physique along with her tender legs and her feet wrapped in strappy sandal heels. Around her, she wore a thin grey coat with her sleeves rolled up, exposing her thin, smooth arms and the golden bracelet upon her right hand. Her friend not standing too far from her was slightly taller, her expression more somber. Or perhaps it was nervousness and excitement, it was almost impossible to tell. Her long, fiery crimson hair looked silky smooth especially under the bright sky, tied slightly towards its ends. Her eyes perfectly harmonized with her hair, glimmering like encrusted rubies that sat upon her pale, attractive visage. Unlike her friend, her attire was far from muted. Upon her neck was a black choker with an aura of fire flowing furiously through it, and beneath that was her bright, velvety button-up shirt drew that much attention even beyond her hourglass figure. Her sleeves rolled which displayed her arms that were beautiful in their own way, and far less than elegant, revealing signs of what they could only assume as work or rigorously hard training. The black skirt that seamlessly connected under her shirt and wrapped around her hips was tight and made of high-quality material, a button connected onto it from hip to hip to keep it from falling and was aesthetically pleasing even alongside her toned, yet beautiful legs that ended with black summer heels that matched that of her friend. Hey, are you two part of the tournament? The blue-haired girl casually asked, peering down towards them from above. Ah, uh, why yeah? Yeah, we are. You need something? Yeah, actually we do. She sighed, shaking her head. The website doesn't seem to load properly from our watches. Can you tell us where we can find the fight for Moby Kane? Chapter 405. Oh. Ah. Uh, of course. Rupert scratched his head. AB0301 is the code to his arena. If you want, we're actually heading there right now. We might as well, laugh, it's okay. I know the way, she laughed, dismissing him. Thanks for telling us though. Yeah, the girl in red slowly nodded from her side with a smile before they both turned away. Hey. One sec. Rupert called out. Huh, what is it? We're kinda in a hurry you know. Just one question. You two also one of those superfans for lore, K. Kane, Sue superfans? She burst out laughing, clenching her stomach. I'm way above those sorry chicks. I bet they literally wish they could be me every day. Sis, we have to go now. We can't miss the match. The red-haired girl nudged her friend to her side, now revealed to be her sister, making her slightly calm down. Yeah, yeah. Let's go. Ain't no way I'm missing this. Good luck with your matches too I guess fire boys. She laughed heartily once again before she and her sister faded away in the crowds. Who were they? They knew who we are. Rupert blinked and looked over towards a smirking regret. If I didn't know as much I would think you're shy talking to women, too quiet you. It's not like you spoke at all there. I have years and years of experience with the ladies. But those two are even hotter than succubi. Especially the blue-haired one. Huh. Regret raised an eyebrow, almost as though he was shocked. The red-haired girl was way better. You blind. You cheating on Hikari now? What? We're not dating. And I already told you there's nothing mutual between us. Ah, if you say so. He shrugged. Well, we're gonna go spectate the same match, so we're bound to run into them again right? They seem to be from strong, wealthy families or something, sisters even. How cool would it be if each of us dated one of them? You know, since we're brothers. Of course, only if they are willing to join our glorious household and prove useful, then we can be really close. Sh shut up with your delusions. I'm not that desperate. And. You're not my brother. The look on your face says otherwise, Black Diamond hash Black Diamond hash Black Diamond hash Mobis match was about to begin, the announcer had already talked up both fighters as the combatants before they even entered the arena. In the area they all planned to meet, Artorias, Hikari, and Elizabeth were there, yet there were two others oddly missing and came in just in time before the match began. Hey! What took you two so long? Artorias gave them the eye as they sat down. We got a bit lost, Regret responded. Who knew this arena would be so full just for a preliminary match? I don't think I can see many empty seats in this loud arena. Well, it makes sense. Moby does have quite the reputation even outside the elites. It's only natural, the is a hero after all. Elizabeth responded. Yeah, but even still. I never expected there to be this many people here. Even two of the guild leaders showed up to see this match. And the principal herself. I feel bad for whoever has a match at the same time. I bet that arena must be really M, shush. It's about to start. Elizabeth leaned in closer and whispered. Ladies and gentlemen. 
this may be the first match of the day, but even I never expected to see the seats this packed. I guess that's what happens when two tournament favorites end up together for a match this early. You already know who they are. You don't need me to explain it. So without further ado. Meet your two fighters. Moby Kane. Anandid. Raymond Scott. The announcer that stood upon the center tile of the arena spoke, and suddenly, both fighters emerged from their respective ends, trotting upon the path surrounded by the outer grass, going up the stairs until they met eye to eye. They both wore student combat uniforms along with standards weapons given by the military to ensure an equal playing field, with little to no outside advantage. Moby of course wore his signature katana strapped onto his waist while his opponent had a great sword sheathed upon his back. No, such a thing could not be considered a great sword, but more like a large slab of metal attached to a hilt instead. Both fighters looked rather similar, at least from a top-down view due to their jet black hair. Yet, upon closer inspection, one was clearly more refined and carried himself with confidence, while the other most certainly let his arrogance shine through beyond his smirk directed towards the crowd and his somber opponent in the distance, and as they made their walk, the crowd certainly let their favorite of the two shine through, drowning out the voice of the other supporters even as they cried their hearts out to make their voices heard. So. You must be Moby Kane, huh? You don't look so tough. You're the most overrated guy in the entire tournament for no reason. You may have some of the best grades sure, but whenever someone challenges you to a match you always dodge them. As per standards, both fighters were connected with a microphone blasting their voices throughout the crowds, almost certainly used to add excitement and drama to a fight if the fighters desired. It's only natural that one would want a lasting impact upon the crowds, yet it seemed like Moby did not even make the effort to put on a show. That's because most challenges aren't worth my time. And why would I do challenge matches for points when I don't need any? I don't see the point in fighting when I reap no benefit and just expose my techniques to the public. He sighed, shrugging off Raymond's words as though they were nothing. That's the same excuse all cowards make. And I'll, enough blathering. Actions speak louder than words, what, you? Fine then. Just wait and see until I put you in your place. People really think you can win the whole thing. That's laughable. No one will ever care about you after you lose in round one. I don't need to explain myself. Moby sighed once again, shaking his head. If you want to expose me or whatever then go ahead and try. I can more than justify my claims with just pure power and skill. As for you, I'm not sure I can say the same, HMPH. Gladly. Wow. Tension is rising. Both contestants seem fired up. The stakes of the match have reached a whole new level. Both have something to prove, and the eyes of everyone will be solely on them as they test their mettle. Are both contestants ready? The announcer screamed from within his booth, pointing towards both contestants as they both nodded towards him. All right. Both contestants seem about ready as can be. So without further ado, let's get this started. The announcer shouted, excitement clearly emanating from his voice as the crowd exploded in its wake, the two fighters taking stance. Raymond's figure rather stiffly grabbing the hilt of his sword while Moby was far more relaxed, his knees slightly bent and his hands hovering over his katana ready to draw, 3, 2, 1. Begin. Chapter 406. Immediately as the announcer finished his countdown, a boisterous sound was heard from all around like an explosion, officially marking the beginning of the match. Raymond immediately pulled out his sword as though it weighed like a feather, and with a smile on his face, the ground started to tremble as glowing blue crystals began to sprout out of the ground all around like plants, forming hazards and barriers as he covered himself in a thick ball of that same, bright, reflective, shining crystal. Raymond Scott is immediately on the defensive trying to get his spirit mode. The announcer yelled, this was fairly standard practice for the beginning of any serious match. A fighter would always lean to getting off their spirit modes as soon as possible without allowing their opponents to interrupt them, while they were in the middle of their transformation. After all, there was no such thing as common courtesy among fighters to simply allow each other time for a transformation. At times like these, there were only two options for the opponent, either to try and interrupt the transformation anyways through the defenses or to simply take the opportunity to transform themselves. However, what Moby did was none of the above, what's this? Kane hasn't moved an inch. He hasn't even drawn his sword. This. This is unprecedented. His eyes are closed. And he seems so relaxed. Is he taunting his opponent? In all my life. I've never seen anything like this. Now, how the hell will he be able to counter a fully powered opponent in his spirit mode? That was when all of a sudden, the cocoon made of gems that surrounded Raymond exploded into shards of small crystals that fired in all directions, most of which hit the barriers protecting the audience while some did make their way towards the standing Moby. And for the first time, he made a move. He lifted his hands, and in an almost cocky, over-the-top manner, blasted away all the shards and attacked the cloud of dust where Raymond laid before he drew his sword with both hands directly in front of him, ready for whatever his opponent did. His eyes were trained upon the dust like a hawk, and the grip on his blade was tight. Until it suddenly became loose, flipping to its edge and sliding it back as though he prepared to stab thin air behind him. And with a casual sigh, stab thin air he most certainly did. Only the precise moment that he did, a figure bearing a bright, celebratory grin from ear to ear erupted out of the earth like a groundhog, his great sword in hand ready to strike. However, all he was met with was the straight back of his opponent, a glint in his right eye looking back and a katana abruptly stabbed into his gut seemingly out of nowhere. Asterisk gawk asterisk the expression on his face instantly shifted as he immediately stepped back away, although it was VR, the pain could not escape him, nor blood could release from his virtual system as he was instead hit with pure pain shocking him to his very core. His face was red, several veins obscurely popping out of their sockets. So quickly was he injured and out of breath, yet his eyes remained determined, like a proud lion staring towards his almost expressionless opponent as he turned towards him like he was not worth his time. And without a single word or moment of hesitation, he grasped the hilt of his crystal sword so hard to the point it began to crack, gritting his teeth as he blasted off the ground using a crystal shard to boost him as he brought his sword up high, and slashed down towards his stationary opponent. With all his might, however, his sword felt nothing, as though it had swung at thin air as he zoomed by. Confusion overwhelmed his angered mind once more, before a surge of pain enveloped his entire body. 
It all felt too surreal to be reality, it had to have been nothing but a nightmare, his body grew numb, his eyes immediately turned blurry and hazy with visions of darkness manifesting from the sides. The last thing that he saw before his vision went senseless was the ground slowly approaching his face and the great sword once in his hand now cracked, cut clean in half, the crowd who watched the display were silent, completely unlike their loud, an open appearance as they tried to process what they had just seen. For in under 20 seconds, the first match had already reached its end. Th that's. That's it. There you have it folks. The first round has come to an end. Such a display of overwhelming domination. It lasted less than 20 seconds yet the match was heart pounding and had many ups and downs. Back and forths. What a start to the tournament. And as you can already guess from what we had just seen. Undoubtedly. Your winner is. Moby Kane. Only when the announcer mustered the goal to speak did the crowd go back to normal and erupt into complete chaos. Moby took a deep breath and sheathed his blade without batting an eye towards his opponent before chuckling and smiling brightly, raising his right fist in victory towards the crowd in a casual yet confident manner. This has to be rigged. No fucking way. Shut up you butt hurt twat. Ha 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 ha. This is exactly what I expected from the future winner of the tournament. Fucking hell man. If this is him barely trying I would love to see when he gets pushed into spirit mode. Yes yes Moby. Let's go. Yeah. I feel bad for whoever has to face him next. That was so fast. Oh. I'm your biggest fan. Congrats. The rumors about the kid are true I see, the crowd's cheering continued, and Moby's gaze remained upon them before it suddenly shifted towards the canopy above where the honored guest sat with wide open eyes. Reina, is this really the kid you've hyped us all about? Yuria Dark, the leader of the Cells Word Guild spoke, leaning back to her seat with a casual yet slightly perplexed look upon her face. Yep. Not bad right? She puffed her chest forward. Yeah, he's not bad I guess. His opponent was just an idiot though, he was powerful, but he immediately ran into a fatal attack. And after that attack, he was too weak to continue fighting even if he's in spirit mode. It hurt me internally watching him. All in all, I'm not all too impressed. She sighed. Oh come on Yuri. It's too early to judge now. I don't think the other guy was that stupid. I think Kane just made him look that way. He's a very bright, hard to predict fighter, reminds me of myself when I was young. Wilhelm Ortiz, the leader of the Hunters Guild snickered, leaning towards his fellow guild leader with a bright smile. Firstly, call me Yuri again and you won't have a tongue. And secondly, yes, I guess I do agree, it's too early to tell. He seems to be quite the fan favorite after his debacle from last year. But, I don't sense anything special from where I'm standing, I don't see how he's going to win, especially against the Supreme General's son who he personally trained, HMPH. And from above emerged a voice, prominent yet that no one seemed to hear. Such pretentious amateurs acting all high and mighty. They wouldn't know true power and skill if it hit them in the face. And that same voice came from a laughing woman smiling upon the battlefield below, as she leaned upon the high walls of the arena above the judge's canopy before she casually teleported away into purple dust that, only one man from the audience seemed to have even noticed, hey, Kai. What's up? I know that was a pretty cool victory and all, but what's with the wide look? Regret nudged him, yet his expression only grew more drastic. Kai? 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 Oh what dash, what's up with you looking at the sky like an idiot? Um. It, it was nothing. I've got to be hallucinating, don't mind me, he shook his head vigorously and slapped his face several times. Um um. Okay, if you say so then, Regret shrugged and looked away, leaving Rupert to calm down and reflect upon what he had just seen. No, no way. Chapter 407. I'm usually not a fan of such rudeness. But I must make it clear. You disrespect me, I'll give you what you deserve. Simple. I hope I proved my point well. Oh, and before my time is up here. I would like to make one thing known. I'm well aware that there are many people that aim to win, and there are many projected favorites. But, in this tournament. I'll be the sole victor, and that's a promise you can hold me up on, asterisk yahhha. Asterisk, uh, such bold claims from this match is victor. It just goes to prove the absolute passion and confidence today's competitors have. As for if he can back up those claims is still to be seen. But. The answers are soon to come in the upcoming matches. I hope, asterisk tsshhh asterisk the screen that once displayed the match suddenly closed, and the atmosphere of the moderately small room of red was brought back to absolute silence. The room was brightly lit and elegantly decorated in high-class furniture fit for a medieval king. The burgundy floor tiles were warm, and the machines around the room magnificently contrasted the old aesthetic of the design. In this room sat two people casually, staring upon the now closed display, eight clearly displayed upon their wrinkly faces. So, Pope Rutherford. What do you think? Did you sense anything suspicious? The skinnier of the two spoke to the other who casually sat on the other end puffing a cigar with seemingly no care in the world, a white garb upon his well-fed body, his blonde hair short and his blue eyes oddly dull and vibrant at the same time. Cade old friend. Why do you of all people, the Supreme General have to stay in here? We could have been up watching the match with our own two eyes. I already told you. I don't want to seem suspicious. And there's a big chance he'll be wary of someone like you. I can't show too much interest. You're being way too paranoid, and you sound like a horny teen who's too scared and anxious to show too much interest in their crush. Just chill out for a bit. The Pope puffed a whiff of smoke into the sky and chuckled towards his flustered friend. Just answer the question. Moby Kane. What do you think of him? Um. Well, it's been a couple of years since I last saw him. I didn't expect him to get this far in life that's for sure. He seems pretty tame yet cocky at the same time, just like the ordinary kid these days. I don't see why you're making such a big fuss to bring me all the way out here, you know don't you? He's the son of Serena and Horace Kane. Yeah, of course I know, how could I not? He shook his head and sat up properly. But, General. You should also know that we tested and found that he has no blood relation to them. That necklace that they sent back as a dying wish was nothing but a hunk of junk. Their house was carefully searched and nothing was found. 
and he was questioned about all he knew with an advanced lie detector and the kid knew absolutely nothing. You do know this right? Yes. Of course, I know this. But, but what? He's been racking up achievements like crazy? He keeps running into shulkers? You really think that he's one of those heathens on the other side? Yes. Exactly. The things that he's been doing are so lucky and convenient. It can't be a coincidence or humanly possible. I guess that does have some merit to it. But it's nothing but speculation. It's not like there weren't any other shulker sightings in the past year, he just happened to get famous from it and hold his own. There's nothing suspicious about it. At this rate, your grey hair will begin to fall out, I say you should calm down and focus on more important things that deserve your stress. Like you know, the war and all. What about the cube? Is there anything you can do with it? The cube? The Pope raised an eyebrow. The cube of Abigan blessed upon us by the gods themselves has not reacted in a very long time, and I doubt it will now or any time soon. He sighed, and pulled out a cube from his pocket, one made of dazzling crystals of a white, heavenly aura, only the light it emitted was rather dim compared to its beauty. I even used the cube on him back then, and it sensed absolutely nothing, which just confirms he was just a kid they adopted without a shadow of a doubt. Yes. But I just have this feeling about him. I can't explain it really. And you're the only person I know who can help me on this. Cade old friend, at this point you're truly too paranoid over nothing. As you keep your secret secret there should be no need for alarm. Are you trying to hide the fact that you're doing this because you think that your little grandson won't be able to beat him in this tournament? The Pope grinned and leaned back into his seat. No. Of course not. I have no doubt he's gonna win. You know, if you really feel that flustered about it you can do a little modifying, it's your world after all, what? Even I won't stoop so low. Ah. Never mind that. Are you willing to help me or not? Hammam. The Pope thought deeply before a smirk emerged from under his cigar that he disintegrated into thin air, standing up with his robe of pristine white hovering over the wooden floor as he walked towards the door on the other side of the room. Normally, to anyone else, I would just call them crazy and leave since I have other things to do. But. For you Cade old friend, I'm willing to do anything. Don't take my playful banter too seriously. I don't know, maybe I'm just denying it because I'm too afraid to consider if it's true. And with a somber look towards the Supreme General, he left without another word, leaving Cade Walker all alone with a headache brewing from under his furrowed eyebrows. Chapter 408 it had been hours since the tournament initially began, and all had been going precisely as expected, no major upsets. Three total rounds had gone by, leaving 64 out of the initial 256 participants remaining. There was only one round of fights separating them from the start of the true tournament for the final 32, in the eyes of both the masses and the very participants, anything before that was nothing but preliminary rounds. Moby and those who followed his plans were all going precisely as expected. None of them experienced any hardships during their climb to the top. However, that was not entirely true if hardships also consisted of paparazzi. Currently, it was still break time in between matches, and all of them were together sat around a table in the shade, all except for one crucial person who was missing as they patiently waited for the next round of fights to be announced. Elizabeth, I'm just wondering how you've even made it this far. Regret chuckled. Just because I mostly have supporting skills doesn't mean I'm helpless. She shrugged. Regret, now's not time for this. Artoria sighed. What? It was a serious question. This is the first time we've seen each other since Moby's first match, now's really not time for trouble. Is, is big brother not joining us? Hikari asked with disappointment on her face. With paparazzi on his as I doubt he'd be coming until the whole thing is over and finished with, Regret responded, leaning back on his chair with closed eyes and his hands behind his head. Oh. I see. She pouted. Man I'm hungry, I wish we could order some food. Regret groaned. Hungry? You do realize we're in VR right? The VR machines will keep your body nourished until you're out of it. Kai turned around and raised an eyebrow. Of course I know that. For me, being hungry isn't just to satisfy my needs, there's just a feeling about eating that I'm missing right now due to this virtual body. A lot of it even makes some of my powers useless. There's nothing running through my veins. It's all hollow. You know, I sort of understand you brother. Eating is sometimes just about the experience, Rupert smiled and nodded. We finally agree on something. Regret laughed. Well, we are brothers. Stop rubbing that fact in like you're proud of it. Quiet you too. Artorias slightly raised his voice with his hands crossed. We've already got eyes on us from the nearby tables to begin with since we're still in the tournament, let's try to not cause a scene now, come on Art. Don't act like you don't like the attention, Rupert mused. Ah. Uh, now is not time for fun and games. This is serious business. We can't relax too much. Oh, he's up on it. This tournament is pretty much all secured. It's more like a vacation in here and seeing fun matches more than anything. Even law, asterisk cough asterisk cane is 100% certain of victory, but there's still no guarantee. Anything can still happen. Hum, I guess so. But with me on the team you really got nothing to fear. You know. Living in an actual society really has changed you since we first met. Artorias lamented. I've always been like this, I just don't act like this in front of important people or when the moment is actually serious. I know humility when it's needed and relaxation when it calls. He chuckled. It's true. He's been like this for a while now. Regret commented. Well. You're. You're just more certain in your own power. That's why you can be so relaxed. Artorias muttered. Hum? You jealous now? No. Of course not. Anyways. Let's just get off this topic. People are staring. Just get more serious. Prepare for the unexpected. Because I'm sure that's what he would want us to do. I guess you might be right. Rupert took a deep breath and sat up straight. 
I suppose I'll try as long as that is what he truly wants, asterisk ding asterisk and that was when suddenly, a notification sound echoed through the air like a tidal wave, and as soon as that sound seeped into the ears of the masses, all was dropped as their eyes were immediately drawn upon their wrists, wide open, and in haste. The final preliminary matches have finally been announced, damn. My thing is lagging. Regret heavily tapped his watch. The servers are overloading, everyone is on the website at once so it makes sense, Elizabeth answered with a smile on her face as she scrolled down to where she needed to be. Never mind that. Just tell me what the matches are. Who am I fighting? You're against. Cronin Nelson in 30 minutes, never heard of him. Seems to be another easy match. How about the others? So far, I don't see any of us fighting each other, so that's good. She continued before Artorias took charge. I'm fighting Herogyne in 25 minutes. Mob is fighting Perry Payton in 20 minutes. Hikari is facing Ganzo Babstisma in 15 minutes. Elizabeth with Arnold Terry in 10 minutes. And finally, hey, what's the hold up? The website's not loading for me either. Who am I facing? Rupert leaned forward. Does it matter? You're confident in winning anyways, Regret chortled. You. You're fighting Adam Walker. The Supreme General's grandson and projected favorite by almost everyone to win this entire tournament. The table stood silent among the boisterous crowds as they all stared wide-eyed. Naturally, the eyes of many fell upon their table, noticing Rupert's figure, eager to see his reaction to what was undoubtedly an early end to his tournament run. But when they did, they found a face they did not expect. Once he got past the initial surprise of the matchup, there was no fear in his eyes, nor any kind of despair or disappointment. No. That greater demonic smile he bore did not harbor anything amusement and excitement. In moments such as these, orders were very clear from Moby himself, and once he looked down towards a sudden message from his watch, his resolve and delight were once again sharpened beyond what he first perceived. Do it. And good luck. If you beat him, I'd be glad to face you in the finals. Hey. You're Kai Fatebringer, right? A man looking over from the side came up and asked, before many others who only expected from a distance followed his lead. Yes. The one and only. You. You're facing Adam Walker, the Supreme General's flesh and blood. That look on your face, are you not worried? Scared that it's all over? Huh? Now why would I ever be scared of someone like him? He laughed. Just you watch. I'm about to put him in his place and show him what true power is. Chapter 409. The Grand Battle Arena was packed full of spectators, eagerly waiting for the beginning of the upcoming bout. This was as expected given who it was going to fight. One was undoubtedly the favorite to win the entire tournament. His presence took the breaths of many and demanded attention that brought upon the eyes of all, Adam Walker. However, the same could not be said about his opponent. Indeed, he was a part of an esteemed fire household, yet people did not look out for him as any kind of threat. The seats during his matches were rather barren, with only a few spectators watching each one. But, as he continued to fight, the more spectators returned due to first impressions, although little amount of people witnessed him, the few that did seem to have some sort of change of heart, like they were completely mesmerized. And one such person was sat upon the grand canopy with a wide, eager smile, overlooking the empty arena below. Miss Ashley Orbeck. May I ask, but why exactly are you interested in such a match? Excuse my rudeness, but Supreme General, why are you spectating this match out of all matches? She looked over towards her superior with a gleaming smile, removing her oddly colored black and white hair from her face. Well, it's the qualifying round for my dear grandson. I would never miss this in a million years. He chuckled heartily. Well, the same thing could be said about me. Kai Fatebringer is a fellow fire ability user. Our households may not be on the best of terms but. He's really caught my eye this tournament. Supreme General Sir, I don't think this match is gonna be so cut and dry like you assume. I think your grandson better watch out, what, the Supreme General's eyes burst wide open. Surely you just miss Orbeck, my grandson had never once lost a match since his infancy. No, he had yet to even struggle. I personally trained him myself to ensure his success. There's a first time for everything sir. You're not undefeated either Supreme General. Why don't we just wait and see? Let the kids do the talking. She smiled and leaned in closer, her eyes parched down towards the arena as the Supreme General to her side was left lost for words. But in the end, he opened his mouth, but spoke not, perhaps there was nothing more to say as he took a deep breath and peered down towards the announcer ready to speak. Ladies and gentlemen. It is an honor to be your announcer once more. I see that once again the stands are packed. Not a single seat left unclaimed. Very fitting for our very first qualifying match. You already know who's fighting here. That's the reason you've all come. So without further ado. Allow me to present our two fighters. As the announcer spoke, the crowd exploded into cheers. The two gates opposing each other opened at once allowing a passage from their dark tunnels, the sound of chains and metal filling the air as the gates lifted. On the right. We've got a man you've all come to know very well in this tournament. His record stands undefeated since his birth, and is undoubtedly the projected favorite to win this entire competition. Adam Walker. The crowd's applause filled the air, their eyes following the announcer's fingers towards the dark entrance. That slowly began to show signs of a figure that quietly trudged into the light, his blonde hair waved in the wind, tied neatly in a ponytail reflecting the bright space above. His glittering sky blue eyes were like a calming ocean set vibrantly staring at the path ahead, well complimenting his attitude. A small scar was clearly seen on his right cheek which represented the only time an opponent managed to even wound him, worn as a reminder of his mistakes, yet it did not detract from his looks, in fact, it even added onto his overall charm. The weapon strapped upon his back was now a classic that all knew him for. It was rather obscure compared to the standard sword or spear one would normally see. It was like two swords mixed into one. Two massive blades protruded from each end and a metal hilt connected them at its center where it was safe to hold. His face was indeed handsome, even amongst the very best of models. Yet, his perfectly sculpted face was far from what made his allure so mesmerizing. Despite this being a tournament that would decide one's future, he was calm as can be. Though, his face was nearly emotionless, completely unlike the stereotypes of the obnoxiously overconfident nobles. If anything, it seemed like he felt bad for his opponents. 
perhaps some sort of pity knowing that the opposition's bright future was snuffed out all due to their luck of being pitted against him. A. As he made his way upon the stage, the crowd's madness became even more apparent. Yet, he paid it no heed as he simply waited, taking a single glance at the announcer. And on the other side. We have a man who is no slouch. He made it this far in the tournament with nothing but raw power and intuition. A member of one of the esteemed fire households. Kai Fatebringer. Just like before, a small figure began to reveal itself from the opposite gate, yet the expression he bore upon entering the light was a contrast akin to night and day. Although the crowd's cheering was nowhere near as rambunctious as the opposition, he still wore a confident smile on his face as he looked up towards the crowds and not at the path ahead. His mismatched hair of orange and blonde was rough yet oddly elegant at the same time, parted away from his eyes that nearly glowed with a dominant yet casual air. The standard spear provided to him by the military shined brightly upon his back as he confidently strode up to the stage, gaping towards the canopy of judges before reaffirming his gaze towards his sudden wide-eyed opponent. Ah! Are you not scared of me? Adam Walker spoke, and at that moment, the entire crowd went silent. For that was the only time Adam Walker had even uttered a single word since the tournament had begun. Scared of you? Kai raised an eyebrow before his face turned into innocent laughter. Now why would I be scared? This is what fate has decided, and who am I to argue with fate? If I lose, then so be it. I've done all I can. But if I win, then so be it as well. I don't care what others think. Interesting. Adam narrowed his eyes and placed one hand on his chin and mouth. I've never met a man such as you before, even the most arrogant, overconfident fool would have cracks in their facade. I truly hope that your words are sincere and not just empty lies you placed in your heart to convince yourself of victory. He smiled from under his concealing hand as he further examined his opponent. Kai Fatebringer was it? MHM, he nodded. Member of a house of flames, I hope we have an interesting bout. I would love to put that confidence of yours to the test. By all means, test your heart's content. Incredible. Such sportsmanship from both competitors. Even I could have never foreseen this. I'm even more hyped to see this match now. So, if both combatants are set, allow me to count you down. The announcer looked over towards the two of them for a sign of approval, yet he seemed to receive nothing back as they continued to stare towards each other, but that was when suddenly, a hazy black blob emerged from Adam's shadow like leaking water, forming its way up towards his shoulders, and there, it formed a face of its own. Red, glowing eyes beamed through the sea of black, and a disturbingly wide mouth resembling that of human teeth began to open and close. It was like something completely out of nightmares, ah damn. That man. He is not bluffing. I sent something from him, something odd, odd indeed. Do not let your guard down. The shadow spoke in a low, almost hissing voice that no one else could perceive. His speech was heavily slurred, and the tone was something soft and ominous, almost otherworldly in nature. Hum? What exactly do you sense Nago? That. I do not know. Maybe it is this virtual world, or maybe it is something else. All I know for certain is that the power he harbors is potentially a great threat even to you. Chapter 410 the shadowy blob was slithering in front of the eyes of many clear as day, yet none seemed to be surprised by his presence. The Walker family was one of the most prestigious households in the world for a reason, and why a member of that household was the supreme general himself, that was because the Walker family was the only family that possessed the ability to interact with their inner spirits outside of their minds as a physical manifestation. As such, many people had dubbed them outer spirits instead. This unique aspect not only allowed for an ability and combat style unlike any other, but also strength and growth almost unrivaled. A person with the ability to not only speak to, but befriend that spirit was unprecedented. After all, one's power was extremely tied to their relationship and bond with their inner spirits. And even amongst the Walker family itself, Adam seemed to be a particularly talented and special case, this was. What truly made Adam Walker a dominant force unlike any other, a man seen with a godlike status, nearly untouchable even amongst those attending the school harboring the next generation's strongest. For truly, no other man could do what he could, but now, even he stood in anticipation, perhaps even nervous for the first time, hearing the words of his spirit's warnings and looking over towards that source. However, he would be lying if he told himself that there was no excitement and anticipation brewing under his outer facade. Nago, I understand your pleas. He closed his eyes and nodded, and a slight glow could be seen flashing in those red sockets of the shadow upon his shoulders. Very well. Ah da dum. He spoke slowly, his form withering away with a chuckle that gradually eased out of his ears. Hey. You done talking with that thing? Indeed I have. Announcer. I am ready to begin. Oh, oh. All right. He chuckled, getting past his initial anxiety of being ignored for so long. Both competents are set. So without any further ado. Let's get this match on the road. And as the announcer spoke, the previously deadpan crowd slowly began to regain that energy they once had as they too began counting down along with the announcer. And as the numbers slowly ticked down to zero, both Kai and Adam took up their respective fighting stances, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, begin. Like a clap of lightning, both instantly disappeared from place. Yet the sound of thunderous impacts did not fill the air upon their vanish like many expected, rather than the head-on approach, both found themselves methodically circling around each other looking for an opening, yet their efforts seemed to yield them no clear advantage. What is this? A game of cat and mouse. Although to any normal crowd what occurred was boring and rather lackluster, but the fact that Adam Walker had never once taken such a careful approach to any of his fights thus far put them on the edge of their seats. Their paths were nearly identical, and their speed matched in such a way that it would be nearly impossible to catch up even when trying to catch each other off guard switching directions, none would dare go towards the center lest they be trapped, and it seemed like the initial beginning led to nothing as the crowd waited with bated breaths for the two silent opponents to make a move as, they assessed each other, and make a move they most certainly did, only it was Kai who took the initiative, sending many fireballs in his opponent's direction that he meticulously dodged, whilst somehow keeping his momentum with unquestionable skill that appeared almost as casual as breathing. A. Dainty grin grew upon Kai's face, yet his opponent still bore his deadpan look, despite all the pressure that Kai only increased with more fireballs of orange and yellow. Hey! I can keep this up for a long time. 
you just gonna run forever. Or are you go, and even before Kai could finish his taunting words, his speech was cut off short. All of a sudden, Adam found himself hit, yet upon the clearing of the dust, he was nowhere to be found. In a mere instant, a shadow enveloped Kai. No, two shadows surrounded him from both ends like a sandwich. Only by crossing his eyes trying to look in both directions did he notice what it was. To his left was a shadowy shark swimming, within the very ground, his eyes staring him down like a laser and its sharp, infested mouth gaped open ready to tear him to shreds. And to his right was a whirlwind of darkness from that blade once strapped to his opponent's back, his deadly gaze only slightly visible from within the thick shadows. He was in the Iron Maiden, and the spiky hatch was inevitably going to close where there was absolutely no escape. Ha 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 ha. So quickly do the cocky fall. I should have never worried. The Supreme General laughed, yet the woman sat to his side bore an unnaturally serious expression. Apologies Supreme General, but I believe you should not have averted your gaze so soon, hum. What? He bit his tongue, unable to believe his eyes, his breathing grew irregular, his stomach sank to the deepest depths and sweat leaked out of his every pore. He now found his right hand grasping his throbbing chest as his heart rate immediately skyrocketed to something he had not felt in. Many years, his gaze did not meet a mangled, chewed up corpse nor an injured or disintegrated body. It met a body of a man on the ground unable to stand near the ledge, only instead of it being Kai, it was Adam instead, coughing with gaping eyes trying his best to stand as Kai continued his approach for a finishing blow. With his spear blazing with the intensity of A. Thousand suns, Kai jumped in the air, and like that sun had suddenly turned into a meteorite, he dug down straight towards Adam as though he was ready to deliver the finishing blow as his shadow spirit shielded him in a dome of darkness. Quiet the comeback right Supreme General. She smirked, looking over towards her clearly distressed superior who did not respond nor pay her any heed. As he clenched his open left hand into a fist, almost out of panic mere instance away from the supernova between Kai's spear and Adam's shield, the explosion was wild. Shrapnels of shard-like shadows exploded in all directions that were blocked by the outer shield that seemed to barely even handle the eruption of power displayed, the crowd got speechless at the display ahead of them. Unable to believe what had just happened. Wow. Unbelievable. Asterisk cough asterisk asterisk cough asterisk is this match already over? Even I who is standing amidst the mayhem cannot discern what's going on. This is the biggest upset I've ever seen in my life. At the last instant before defeat, Kai Fatebringer turned himself into pure flame and dodged what was otherwise certain death. And in a swift reversal managed to absolutely turn the tide of battle. The announcer broke the silence, and that evoked others from within the crowds to speak what was on their minds. Did. Did he just win? No way that just happened right. How is he that strong? I've never even once heard of this kid, the dense cloud of dust made it nearly impossible for anyone to perceive what had just happened, and the screens displayed all around them seemed to give them no better answer. There only seemed to be few people amidst the crowds that could see what others could not, and even they stood absolutely silent at the result that not even they expected. Artorias. Did you see that? How did he? I don't know Regret. I wonder how much is restricting himself to do this or what is allowed for him to do. But this is incredible. The power of a higher being, and as the clouds cleared from the battlefield, what was unknown to most made it to the light of the bright, virtual sun. Two figures were seen from within, standing on both feet, and as soon as they appeared, many sighs of relief filled the air and a weight was lifted from their hearts, although one was clearly more injured than the other, it was indeed not over, far from it, both fighters found themselves once again stood upon equal footing across each end of the arena. Yet unlike the beginning, both bore a bright smile unlike any other, their mutual glance spoke volumes to each other, and those were the only words they needed before rushing head on, but this time, there were no holds barred. The speed they once bore was made an absolute mockery by what they did now, so quick that most even forgot that they were witnessing a bout between mere teenage students and not veteran elites. Their weapons clashed, shaking the very barriers that contained the very arena and causing ripples in the rapidly regenerating ground. Blow for blow, they found themselves evenly matched in front of the quietly gazing audience. A fireball, or anything of the such always found itself squarely blocked by a barrage of thick, almost solid shadows and any trick one had found a match with another that their opponent kept under their sleeves, even in a two-on-one, where Adam's wild, shadowy spirit fought alongside him in a way no ordinary man would be able to predict, there seemed to be none taking edge. However, that was solely on a surface level. To the naked eye, most would believe Kai to be overwhelmed by the shadowy barrage of two godlike foes, but in reality, he was perfectly calm. Almost too calm as he narrowly dodged, and countered every hit in a way that appeared to be out of sheer luck from an outside perspective yet extremely calculated and intentional to those with a keener eye. Whatever Adam Walker attempted to do, Kai Fatebringer always found himself seemingly one step ahead. It was not a gap in power. No, it was a gap in talent or experience as if he had been fighting such battles for hundreds or even thousands of years. And in a mighty clash of fists, they found each other equally blown away towards their respective ends of the arena as if they had just entered once again, not moving a single inch as they both mutually used the time to steady their heavy breaths. Only this time, their expression and attitudes were completely dissimilar, nearly as though they had just entered as new people and that the true battle had yet to begin. You. You were holding back before, weren't you? I never thought I'd see the day. Adam spoke with a small chuckle, dusting himself off. Well, I like not to reveal my entire hand whenever I have the chance. But, I could say the same about you too. You almost took my head off with that sandwich of yours. What I don't understand is how you were able to block my final hit there. Kai grimaced, casually removing a shard of shadows from his left shoulder as he continued to speak. I. I honestly do not know. It was a special reversal to redirect, but even still. To be honest, there are many things I don't know about this match. This is a unique experience for me. I have never once been so injured let alone felt imminent defeat such as that in my entire life. You. You are a true warrior and rival to even I. I would have never believed a man such as you was so unknown to me and even resided within the same school. Kai Fatebringer. I shall never forget your name even if you do lose before the official tournament. For you, I shall reveal something that I had never planned to use against any human, especially in this competition. But for you, I believe you are worthy enough for me to test it. Chapter 411. The words he spoke were rather soft, yet it left the crowd utterly without words, understandably so. 
Nothing but a small whisper exited the mouths of very few as they watched with anticipation upon the grounds ahead. Ah, even the Supreme General himself could not help, but stand up from his seat absolutely shook at what he had heard uttered from his grandson's mouth. Yet not even he could say a single word as he was immediately silenced by a slight glare that set him back down where he stood, his hands dejectedly grasping his head and many thoughts on his mind, his being serious. What the hell? Kai Fatebringer, him of all people can't be this strong. He's even weaker than his little brother and lost so many matches in school. So how? Even if he was truly this strong, how can a brat like him have the patience to hide his power for so long? You all right, sir? He heard a gentle voice from his side. Oh, apologies, Miss Orbeck, I'm okay. I just never expected this match to be like this, hee hee, she chuckled. Neither did I, I thought that it would have been over long ago. But I think this match is already decided, yes, I think so too. He took a deep breath to calm his mind, leaning back on his seat with a wide grin from ear to ear, the ground below began to tremble, the bright, vivid colors that once encompassed the space slowly began to fade away, turning into something akin to a muted gray. The light that shined down became dimmer, and darkness began to consume all that was contained within the boundaries to the point that people started to have issues peering upon what was going on. Arga! News update folks. I'm in the middle of this hellish landscape and I can't see a single thing too from this darkness. The announcer grimaced. I think. I think Adam Walker is transforming. I never thought I would be saying this so early on in the tournament let alone my entire life. I promise we will try our best to get the cameras back and, no need for that, announce a guy. A voice encroached from the endless darkness, and as soon as those words were uttered an eruption of unspeakable magnitude exploded within the space like a supernova. The dome that was once completely consumed by darkness was suddenly lit up, almost as though an entire star had abruptly ignited from within, and at the heart of that star was the source of all this fiery light. His aura crackled like magma, his entire mass was drenched from head to toe in flames, even the clothes upon his back were set ablaze and the eyes sat within his sockets were hellish in nature. Two fox-like ears emerged from his head along with several whiskers of aura grown upon his face. Yet, what was most visibly noticeable and stunning about his appearance were the orange tails that sprouted from his back, crackling and sporadically waving in the air like an extension of his body, all nine of them over the size of his entire being. The power displayed from Kai Fatebringer's spirit mode was so powerful, that the darkness began to shed allowing his opponent's face to once again meet the light of day, yet it was not at all as it was before, similar to his opponent's fire, Adam was. Himself covered in inky shadows, yet these shadows that engulfed him were not a flowing mass of aura. It was more like a suit of armor, no, such a description would be inaccurate, it was more akin to skin, scale-like in nature and as dark as night, hugging his body tightly emphasizing his physique he appeared nothing like he was before, his eyes were like two pearls shining red through the endless darkness behind him, his teeth were white as snow, human-like in nature despite his now inhuman appearance and spanned his entire face in an all too uncanny manner. His head was clad in the same black. Scales as the rest of his body, shaped like a triangle that separated into two on its ends like spiky ears and two holes at its center representing his nose. Similar spikes found their way on his neck, gradually following his spine and were even present upon his elbows and the claws on his hands. The bright red from his eyes seemed to droop down his neck and on his chest like glowing water, flowing upon his skin like a river in an almost tribal-like pattern that were clear to see even amidst the chaos. Yet what was very evident even to the unperceptive were the two wide wings connected to his back spanning the length of his entire body. Its shell was akin to that same scale-like darkness of his skin and it was almost bat or even dragon-like in nature. The arena was split in half. The darkness now had a light, and the two opposing ends began to fight for supremacy at its center without one taking any edge over the other, like a perfect balance of yin and yang. Oh. Kai Fatebringer. You still have power to spare even as I transform. Impressive. Impressive indeed. The winged figure of darkness opened his gaping mouth of teeth, yet it sounded nothing like the Adam he once knew. It was a mixture between his speech and that of the spirit he had fused with, his voice was heavy, slurred, and cold, like he was no longer human. Well, of course. What kind of man would I be if I couldn't? He chuckled. But it seems like you fused with that thing you had. What are you even? A dragon? A lizard? Maybe a vampire or something? Wouldn't fusing just make you weaker since you don't have a double team? Oh. Quite perceptive of you. Quite perceptive indeed. However. You. You are sadly mistaken. You stand no chance. Boy. The darkness behind Adam began to shift and turn like dough, and out its seemingly endless expanses it spat out blobs, blobs that began to bubble and slowly move, and in droves, an army those blobs turned into that same monstrous spirit as before, laughing at him and clapping their hands like rabid beasts. Oh wow. I didn't expect that. Kai clapped. But if you think you're the only one who can summon here, you've got another thing coming for YA. Immediately as he closed his mouth, his nine tails began to glow and shake even more violently, and as they hit the ground, shards of what they were began to shift and turn until they became their very own foxes of flaming orange and gold, growling and ready to fight as though they were alive. Now we're even right? Ah. I suppose so. Adam shrugged. You are an odd individual. I could sense it. But even still, victory is not possible for the likes of you. It is too late for that now. Adam's body suddenly disappeared into the endless shade, and the army of red-eyed spirit blobs on the ground clapping and screeching exemplified as they charged head-on like monkeys with seemingly no strategy in mind. We'll see about that. And reacting to his opponent's moves, Kai tightly clenched his flaming spear and disappeared, blitzing directly into the dark as he left his summons to deal with the shadows. Indeed, the darkness was oppressive. Yet, despite its presence, the sound of clanking soon after filled the air, light began to twinkle within the darkness, and the blackness began to slowly dilute into grey, allowing all to gaze upon their bout. Adam made good use of illusions, his body was rock-solid yet malleable and stretchy at the same time which even extended to his weapon. Yet once again, no matter how he tried, he could never seem to bypass his opponent's guard, almost like he knew what he planned before he even did. Illusions don't work on you. Ha 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 ha. He laughed in that eerie voice even as he received a merciless thrashing for his attempts. Incredible. Both fighters are once again evenly matched. 
Even their summons fighting on the ground are evenly matched. How can this even be possible? The announcer's voice was quick and nervous as he tried his best to find the energy to speak, which was more than most of the audience could even do. The level of power they were showing had once again entered an entirely new realm from where they once were. This was but a preliminary match, but in their minds, it was as though they were witnessing the final match unfold before their very eyes, the eyes that for some could not even keep up with what they were beholding, but as the match went on, as though history was repeating itself, a victor began to show himself through the cracks. Yet the smile present on the faces of both contestants did not fade away. Supreme General Sir? Ashley Orbeck nudged her superior with a hint of worry that slowly turned into a subtle smile. Oh, don't worry Miss Orbeck. He'll win. No. He's already winning. Ha ha. My little boy always liked to have fun even at times like this. He laughed, suddenly clenching his left hand into a fist that began to tremble and strain his entire arm. Sir? You okay? You got scared that your grandson finally met his match. I thought someone like that would finally be happy he found an equal. Ho ho. I'm sure he would, but sadly that match is not this one. Just you wait and see. I'm sorry to say, but this fireboy never stood a chance. His laughter increased before settling down into a grin, his hands turning abnormally red from how tightly it was clenched. If you say so, she reciprocated his laughter, shaking her head and shrugging her shoulder with a smirk, as she continued to inspect the battlefield with open hands. As Adam flew out to keep his distance, he attempted to retreat to recover by masking himself within his shadows once again, since that appeared to be the only illusion that seemed to work. He was heavily injured from all the bad exchanges, his scales were cracked, his red eyes bled the liquid it bore, and his muscles ached. Yet before he could even intake a single breath, he was met with a deep, cracking pain on the back of his head, and the next thing he knew, he found himself hurtling towards the dark ground, a smile on his face and so much yet so little on his mind. It was the face of a man who accepted defeat. His eyes slowly began to close and succumb to the darkness, until abruptly, they suddenly didn't, huh? It's this feeling once again, asterisk crash asterisk the sound of heavy collision filled the air, and as the noise of its impact faded away, so did the darkness of the space. The heavenly light of day began to return once again. From the darkness, there were two figures coming into view, one standing proudly upon two feet while the other lay motionless on the ground. The only sound that could be heard was the sound of the blowing wind accompanied by the beating hearts of the masses, that collectively held their breaths with wide open eyes eager to find who was the victor. Chapter 412 the cloud of dust subsided, and the gleaming golden light of the heavens above pierced down upon the face of the victor who, almost out of instinct, lifted his head to block his keen ocean blue eyes. His golden hair that was tied behind his head was now disheveled, lacking the elegance it once had, his clothes were in similar condition, burn marks clearly visible and slight cracks upon his weapon. The crowd sat unmoving as that man removed his hand from his face that now fully embraced the light. It was a blank canvas, yet most people saw it as confidence, indifference, or even disappointment as he gazed down towards his unconscious foe. It's... it's over. Ah. My heart. I don't think I could have taken any longer. I can't believe it was only a preliminary match. But now it's all over. After a hard-fought battle the likes we've never before seen, we finally have ourselves a victor. The favorite to win. Adam Walker. As the announcer cheered, the masses did not reciprocate, at least not many. Most were still dumbfounded trying to internalize what they had just witnessed. And only when they got past that initial shock did they explode into cheers. Adam. Our victor. That must have been a very interesting battle for you I bet. Do you have anything to tell the world after such a stunning victory? The announce asked, yet there was once again no response, sweat began to pour down from his face like a waterfall, and his entire body suddenly became stiff, but none of that compared to when Adam finally moved his head, turning towards him with dark, empty, nightmarish eyes that turned his stomach inside out, almost like he was in sleep paralysis. Only when Adam averted his gaze, and began to walk back towards the tunnel in which he came did the announcer regain control over his body and his energy to speak. Ah, ha ha ha. I see. As expected. Well, there you have it folks. That is your winner. Adam Walker will be going on to the official tournament. I am excited to see what other battles he has in store for us today, but part of me doubts we would ever see a display of strength such as this. Black Diamond Black Diamond Black Diamond H. Hey. Artorias. How did Walker just win? Kai is even knocked out completely, I didn't even think that was possible, Artorias. Black Diamond Black Diamond Black Diamond, ah, I don't know regret. I most certainly don't. But. This can't be real. In all my life, bye. By a mere mort. No, he can't be, Artorias. Are you okay, Black Diamond Black Diamond Black Diamond, ha ha ha. Why were we even worried? I already knew he'd win. It was very close though, who knew the Fatebringer family son was so strong, damn right. He's strong. But Walker is still a good amount stronger. Look at him. He's not even shaken in the slightest. Very true, for the most part, the crowd all had similar opinions, and the amount they spoke, cheered, and laughed was something never seen before. There was an overall air of joy that encompassed the arena, all except for certain areas. Ha ha ha. That's my boy. He really showed him, didn't he? The Supreme General snorted and rolled back up to his seat with a wide grin from ear to ear. Congratulations on your victory General, Ashley Orbeck of the Flameseeker Guild side. Don't misunderstand Miss Orbeck, that boy was indeed powerful, but he never stood a chance to begin with. Oh. Is that so? Her voice was unnaturally monotone, a total contrast to her usual expressive, almost cheery self, she was like a completely different person. Don't worry sir, I'm not mad. Just perplexed, how so? If I might be so blunt, you've been acting really odd sir. You're not the completely calm and charismatic man I thought you were. You claim to have never been worried, but that worry was marked all over your face. You were sweating, and your entire body was jittering. She sighed once more, standing up from her seat before glancing towards her superior once more before her sight shifted towards his closed fist. If it hadn't been for us being in VR I bet that still clenched and jittering hand of yours would have popped by now. She walked away from the canopy, leaving the still stunned general alone. 
Suddenly, his gaze also fell down towards his still clenched hand, now abruptly opening it. And with many thoughts running through his mind that he shook away immediately with a deep breath, he continued to spectate his grandson's victory. Black Diamond, Black Diamond, Black Diamond Adam walked into the dark tunnel from which he came, storing his weapon away, not even batting an eye as the gates closed on him and the light of yellow torches rekindled the previously drab space. Ever since he had awoken to the light, his vision was an unclear blur, almost like a badly drawn water painting. The sounds of what he could only assume were the cheering crowds were a muffled mess, almost as though he had been swimming underwater. But even with such vision, the light of the yellow and orange torches could not escape his eyes. As he steadied his gaze upon its light, he felt a flash within his mind of something more ferocious, and he leant against the nearest wall clenching his head from the pain before shaking himself off with a heavy gasp. He continued his way down the hallway. The horizon ahead felt endless, yet he continued on to the muffled sound of his steps until suddenly, Adam Walker. That is your name correct? His eyes went wide. For the first time in seemingly forever, the shape of the horizon changed, and he heard a voice clear as day, one of a soft, yet powerful female voice. And as he lifted his head, he met the face of a shorter girl, or was it a grown woman? Her face was unclear, and other than her being female, even the simplest feature to identify her from was out of his reach. Although his vision was steadily getting better, the shape of the horizon was still far from crystal. Who? Who are you? And how did you get here? Are you paparazzi? If so, then I have no interest in conversing, my name is no great concern. And no, you can rest assured I am no paparazzi. Though, I have come here to ask you a few questions, Adam felt a tingle down his spine, one that was an odd feeling that he had never once experienced before. But that was when he heard Nago speak from his shoulders, and those thoughts were whisked away. Woman. He said no. No. Ge dash silent spirit. Although her voice was low, it shook the very ground. Unless I ask you directly or you have something important to say, don't even utter a word, uh. UN, understood, W what? I've never seen Nago act like this in my entire life. Not even to grandfather. What? What is this? Is he afraid? Even if she somehow kills us now we are in VR. Death means nothing here. So why? Who? Who is this woman, who? Who are you, never mind that now, I'm certain those answers would reveal themselves in due time. So, Adam Walker, I will ask you this once more. Can you answer these simple questions for me? Chapter 413 Hash H dollar percent hash asterisk I asterisk dollar at house he hash dollar percent H dollar hash asterisk him. In an empty void of absolute darkness, Rupert found himself suspended. The space felt like an odd liquid, wrapping its cold, unforgiving claws upon his naked frame. His mind and body were numb, he was unsure where he was, nor what he should even think. His soul was a blank sheet as he stared up at the sky. He was but a mere aimless soul residing in a barren husk. He had been like that for what felt like an eternity, and only now did he hear sound for the first time within this endless darkness. So it drew his interest. The sound was muffled, its origin unclear. But that was when the darkness of the sky began to form cracks. The sky. The sky is cracking. He murmured dot a single shard escaped, one made of pure darkness falling by him, narrowly missing his head and from its remains shined a blinding light, piercing his gaze. The cracks began to increase, and with it, so did the light and voices from the outside. Hey! Hey! His movie asterisk dollar percent, slowly, the shards began to crumble and drop one by one. And only when it became too damaged to maintain its uniform shape did it explode, and like pouring rain, those shards of darkness sped towards his face with a blinding yellow light overcasting the previously pitch black sky. Wah wah! As though out of instinct, his eyes went wide, his hands flung towards his heart with no thinking as heavy sweat dripped down his face. There was pain encompassing his entire system, yet he did not know for what reason. His stomach twitched, his muscles felt tense, and his cloudy mind began to thump as though it was begging to burst out his skull. Light once again entered his size, yet this time it was no superficial yellow. It was physical and more real than ever, yet still rather unclear. White, that was the only color he saw as he panned his eyes. His clothes were white, the blanket enveloping him was white, and the walls were an even purer white, where? Where am I? What's going on? He thought to himself, before a familiar voice entered his static-filled ears, the same one he had heard in that dark space. He's awake. He's awake. It's about time he woke up. Another voice sighed. Ha. Huh. Rupert coughed, finding the energy to rub his eyes. I was so worried about you Mr. Kai. Welcome back. W-H, huh? Well, welcome back. He turned his head, and there sat next to him was a familiar smile he would have a hard time ever forgetting. Her brilliant white hair blended well with the walls, and her childlike innocence brightened the room even more and instilled a sense of needed calmness within his uneasy heart. Girl, you say that like I was dead, he chuckled. Oh wow, you seem to be taking this better than I expected you to, a different voice spoke, and that was when he noticed the other figure stood beside Hikari, Elizabeth Eleonora. However, beyond her, there was none present, Moby, nor Regret and Artorias were anywhere to be found. Taking what better? What do you mean by that? Hum? She raised an eyebrow. I thought you were gonna be all sad and Moby-like, I'm a disgrace, how can I ever look him in the eyes? Huh? Now, why would I ever do that? Do you not remember what happened? Look around you, what kind of room do you think this is? Hell if I know. I've never been to a place like this. It's all white, full of machines and needles. Ack! I should have expected this knowing who you are. She shook her head. This, this is a hospital room. A hospital room? His face widened. Yes, you were taken here after you lost your match against the Supreme General's grandson, Adam Walker, El Lost. He leant back onto his pillow, his voice was somber, and the weight it carried put the room in uncanny stillness. Ah ha 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 Rupert clenched his stomach, from pain, and tears began to fall down his eyes as he rolled back from mass hysteria. Lost? Do you have any idea who you're saying that to? In a place like this? Now now, can you really tell me the real reason why I'm here, no stupid answers please? 
his laughter only continued to increase, but as he looked back towards those next to him, they did not seem to be as amused. B but. Mr. Kai. It is true. You did lose. Hikari scooted closer and showed him her watch, the news on its screen written in large, bold font clear as day. You went unconscious then you were sent here. We might be in VR, but it was your mind that was injured, not your body. You've been here now for hours not responding at all. We were so worried about you, I. Hell lost? He uttered those words again, only this time did he realize its true impact, his pupils dilated, his right hand clenched his heart while his left grasped his guts. The world was suddenly enveloped in a layer of haze as his stomach sank from pure anguish. It was a similar pain that he felt before, only this was far more intense and was not induced by maddening laughter but a maddening realization. Sudden bursts of bright light flashed within his dizzy eyes of memories, memories of what had happened past. Those shards in that dream, they were no mere illusion. They had truly stabbed him prior. He was winning, winning with ease, until for one instant, he suddenly wasn't, this. This can't be real. No, but it is real. His mind ran rampant. More than anyone, Rupert knew what was dream, illusion, and reality, especially now that his mind was cleared, he was a greater demon after all. But that was the same problem. Even if he was holding back immensely, he was still a greater demon, so how? Chapter 414. Asterisk Gerg Asterisk he fell down from his seat and crashed towards the ground, his mouth gaping open as though he was ready to barf. Yet nothing escaped his mouth but a puff of air. Ah, please. Mr. Kai. Calm yourself. It's okay. It's really okay. Hikari hurried to aid her hurting comrade with all her heart, pulling his frantic, senseless body back onto his bed while Elizabeth simply stood and watched. Ah. Now that's the reaction I was expecting. She snickered. Elizabeth. Please help me. Do you know any healing for this? He's getting even worse. Well, I suppose I can try, she waved her hand, and a green light enveloped Rupert, and his frantic nature slowly reverted into hyperventilated deep breaths. Now, Kai, if you calm down now. We have a few questions for you. Do you remember exactly how you lost? None of us could really see it at the end there. Elizabeth asked her question, yet she received no response beyond a slight glance and continuous breaths with his hands clenching his vitals. I don't know. I don't know. I really don't. I don't know how I lost. Where? Where is Lord? Arg, calm down Kai. All's gonna be okay. Please. Hikari held his hands tightly. He's not mad at you. He even commended and congratulated you on the fight. He said you did a good job. Don't patronize me. And. Even. Even if that is the case. I failed in something so simple. I can never be trusted. Oh shut up. Elizabeth snorted. You're acting like a child. If you really messed up I'm sure he wouldn't be sugarcoating it. He's a pretty direct guy. Trust me, he's not mad or disappointed. He's still certain of victory. He made sure to tell us that, B but how? It's impossible. If I couldn't beat him how see you, are you really questioning him now? I thought you were the biggest advocate of never questioning his wishes even when we tried to give suggestions. What happened now huh? Are you really so shallow? What happened to your pride? Broken so easily. How would he think of you now in such a pathetic state? Elizabeth. Please. You're being too harsh. Hikari wept, tears falling down her face. N, no Hikari. She's right. Rupert sighed extensively, the wind slowly whistling out his mouth. He shook his head and stretched his back before looking back up with a stable yet unsteady gaze. So. I've been asleep for hours now, right? A few rounds passed. What exactly happened at that time? Elizabeth widened her eyes at his sudden shift in attitude, but once she got past the initial shock, she went back to normal. In short, I got out in the first match of the top 16s against Artorias, pretty easily might I add. And Hikari made it one round farther only to lose to Moby. We're the only two out, that's why we're here. I. I see. So what round is it now? Where are the others? Moby has already got past the quarterfinals and has entered the top four. And now it's the final round of the top eight quarterfinals. Final round? He muttered. Who's fighting who? Is it, yes, I think you could already guess. It's Artorias facing Regret. Speaking of which, that match is starting in two minutes so I'll be on my way. She turned around and strode towards the door. Hikari, you coming? I can't leave now. She immediately responded, only for her two to be cut off. It's okay Hikari, you can leave me be and go watch the match. Rupert smiled. Be but. No buts. Now, you go off and watch the fight. I'm sure Artorias and especially Regret would appreciate your support. I'll be fine. Plus, I think I need time for myself too, oh. Okay. She mumbled, stepping away slowly from his side with a sniffle. Hey. Hikari. I'm leaving. You gonna join me or what? Coming. She hurried through the door after Elizabeth, but before she exited the room she turned a quick peek back towards Rupert with clear concern towards his state, but that look slowly turned into a gentle smile as she nodded and left the room, gently closing the door behind her. Rupert was all alone once again. The room bore a hollow empty feeling, and the cold muted colors did not help in that aspect. He shook his head, leaning back on his pillow and stared towards the empty ceiling of white, arum. Hi. Kai Fatebringer. I'm not sure if I'm intruding or if it is the right time. I don't think we know each other. We haven't met other than today and I believe a few rare family gatherings when we were kids. But. I just wanted to talk and ask you a few questions. Is. Is that okay with you? Chapter 415. Come one come all to the last and most awaited quarterfinal match. Today has been a rather long day, but I'm sure none of us are complaining right. The announcer lifted his hands up in the air, and the packed crowds returned his energy with widespread, boisterous cheering that echoed to all ends of this white void. All right. 
Seems like everyone else is excited as I am. Once again, it is an honor to be your announcer and commentator for this match. I would like to thank every single one of you for showing up. And I would also like to thank all that are watching from home. And a special thanks to our lovely group of judges looking out towards us as well. None of this would be possible without you. The crowd cheered once again, their sights now at the canopy above where the six figures sat, some silent, cold as ice while others smiled and waved back towards the cheering crowds. This final match of the quarterfinals might as well be the most exciting. Both fighters have pushed thus far showing little to no effort. They had yet to even reveal their spirit modes. And now we will see what happens when two such freaks of nature fight. But despite their amazing show of strength today, there can only be one victor who will move on. So without further ado, allow me to introduce both combatants. The announcer waved both hands, and the two gates barring the entrances lifted open with that now all too familiar sound of rolling chains. Over to my right, there is a man with a piercing lion-like gaze. His will and skill are a sight to behold, and his drive for victory could be seen from his every step. A fire-wielding demon. Regret Oswald. The crowds applauded, and Regret stepped into the light, slowly yet not so gracefully. The two katanas sheathed upon his waist glistened under the bright void, yet what shined even brighter were his keen, reddish eyes hidden under his scruffy orange hair that he quickly parted to the side, his strut was deliberate, his hands casually held his waist and the smile on his face was far from hidden. Yet despite its presence, it did not scream over confidence or arrogance, no, it was clear excitement and pure adrenaline that rushed through his virtual, empty veins. And from my left is no nobleman. Yet his noble elegance and masterful air is undeniable. For being someone so unknown, he might quite the debut this tournament, and I'm certain many in the crowds kept a close eye on him. And that man is of course Artorias Calamite. As soon as a semblance of movement was seen from the dark entrance, the crowd absolutely exploded, far more than that for Regret. It was like comparing the sound of a running car to that of a roaring jet engine. As he confidently strode into the open he did, not hesitate nor bat an eye at all the sound. In fact, his eyes of entrancing gold were closed under his calm, silver brows. Unlike almost every other combatant, he bore no weapon on his body. It was not concealed, that was proved by many of his earlier matches. His flowing, silky smooth silver hair hung slightly over his still, snow-white face, and his shoulders were out broad as he continued his march towards the stage. And only when he reached his destination did he take his first breath, and opened his eyes to calmly meet that of his opponents before glancing over to his side where the announcer stood. I didn't think it would be like this. But seems like this is what fate had in store for us. Artorias sighed. Huh? Regret raised an eyebrow. I thought you didn't believe in fate. I most certainly don't, then what? You scared that I'm gonna beat your ass in front of so many people? He laughed. If you believe that to be the case, then I'm not stopping you. But if I were you, I'd try acting dignified. You're no longer a child you know, now, you're just making a fool out of yourself. I'll do whatever I want. You're not my mother. Quite observant of you. Indeed I am not. But I believe your mother is indeed watching this match unfold. Artorias commented. Suddenly, Regret went silent, and for that moment even Artorias could not help be taken aback. Yeah. You're right. She is. You hear me, mom. He lifted his head and pointed directly at the cameras. I'm gonna win this match just for you. Just you wait and see. He's gonna be crying on the ground begging for mercy when I'm done with him. However, that moment of calmness did not last for long, and Regret laughed returning back to what he did best. Although Artorias smiled and felt rather indifferent, the same thing could not be said for others. From how Regret acted, it was clear that he had already made many enemies from the crowds. Yet, he paid them no heed. That was how it was his entire life. And nothing he did was going to change that fact, it was not now that he began acting like someone who he was not. Aha! I see that both fighters are already excited to fight. And who am I to stop them from proving which of them is superior? Now, if both fighters are ready, I'll count you down. And as soon as he spoke, the announcer immediately received that very same confirmation he sought, a clear look and a nod from both fighters. All right. The announcer giddily lifted one finger up into the sky with a grin from ear to ear. I see both fighters are ready to get at it. So without further ado, allow me to count down. The announcer did a swift backflip from his position on the stage, landing swiftly onto the outside grass where he would be relatively safe. Three, two, one. Start. Chapter 416. The match had officially just begun, yet there seemed to be no movement from either side. It was completely out of character for both fighters who would have immediately rushed their opponents with no hesitation in their previous fights. The crowd held their breaths, most in a mixture of confusion and anticipation. But, upon closer examination, all became clear. Their eyes were deadlocked, like fierce predators sizing each other up, both in their own special way, like a lion to a fox. Despite all their previous talk, it was more than clear from their gaze alone the level of respect each bore towards the other, yet, it did not take too long for them both to do their first moves. A brilliant aura of flowing power twinkled and swirled beneath both their feet like a ferocious yet gentle typhoon, a typhoon that slowly became thicker and wilder until one point, both erupted into bright light. Regret's body was now covered in flaming orange from head to toe, his previously bland. Armor now had an extra layer of flowing translucent cloth, almost like that of an ancient fighter with a fox-like appearance. From shape alone, it incited a certain reaction from the audience. For indeed, they had seen this form before, or at least something very similar. It was the exact same form as Kai Fatebringers, only his form seemed to have been far more orange than yellow and only possessed eight tails compared to the usual nine. They were brothers after all, but some spectators did not even realize considering their different last names. Not only his weapons were set ablaze, but also his heart that burned passionately, perfectly reflected by his open smile towards his opponent clad in all white, the armor of aura he conveyed was far more solid. His eyes pierced through his waving silver hair past the sockets of his bird-like helm that only covered half of his face, and did not extend down past its beak-like nose. The elegant curves and aesthetic of this armor extended down towards his waist where two large feathered wings were found, puffy and white as snow. 
However, it was only below that did his image take a more feline approach. He was a griffin, a spirit beast that almost none even knew existed. Regret had both katanas now unsheathed, yet Artoria still had seemingly nothing to fight with, at least for now. He slowly brought his claw-like gauntlets out in front of him, and from his palms, a bright light of blinding white began to manifest. And from that bright gleam, something began to mold like dough until it took form. A long sword of light, encrusted in breathtaking gold with an edge so brilliant that it would cut even some of the hardest metals like mere butter. Compared to his armor, it completely stood on its own far above, such was the aura it emanated dot on opposite ends, they both stood grinning, and in the next instant, they were in the middle clashing blades with that expression in their opponent's face. Incredible. Things were going so slow, but it suddenly just sped up to blistering speeds. Both fighters have already entered their spirit modes. It's like they read each other's minds. No need to set up anything for their transformations. Clanks permeated the space, the bubble protecting them shook and the crowd turned from silence to absolute madness as they watched with clenched fists and wide open eyes. So. Where's your ability? You gonna show it to me? Regret mocked as they clasped blades. Now is not time to talk. But if you must know, this very sword is my ability. I guess you can call it my Excalibur, Excalibur. Regret laughed. Your name is Artorias, not Arthur. I'll make that sword of yours melt like butter. Suddenly, Regret's smile widened, and along with it, the flames upon his blade also expanded in both volume and strength in a form like a roaring fox, that engulfed the entire arena in scorching flames. Asterisk erg asterisk from above, Regret's sword slowly began to make its descent upon the struggling Artorias. He gritted his teeth, the ground beneath his feet started to crack and melt like putty as he began to sink down into it like quicksand. The sword held within his hands began to slowly falter and be pushed back near his chest. He narrowed his gleaming eyes, and strengthened the grip on his sword, bending his knees to the point of almost kneeling down, all looked grim from the blazing inferno below. Yet through the flames, Artorias' gritted teeth slowly softened into a confident smile. Suddenly, his holy blade's glow expanded, and like it truly was butter, it slid upon the edge of Regret's blades until they were no longer locking. Edges, the impact from Regret's momentum left him tumbling down off balance. The only thing he witnessed in that moment was Artorias dodging his falling katanas with his sword aimed directly towards his head. I in that moment, his face widened, his heart sank as time slowed down within his mind. He was witnessing his own demise, yet he could not control his falling body nor his flailing arms, and in the very next moment, it was like time had sped up once more, and his all was consumed by darkness, yet it was not at all the darkness he expected. It was grey, and dusty, not the black emptiness he thought, wind blew past his face as he found his footing, and silence filled the air. His hands unconsciously lifted towards his neck where he thought that sword would strike. Yet there he only felt, but a small scratch, yet that mere scratch burned like the surface of the sun heim. Alive? That was when suddenly, he heard the very first sound within his hazy mind coming from behind. And when he turned around, he bore witness to Artorias coughing on his knees, his hands grasping his blade that was stabbed through the ground for balance. Sweat rolled down his face like a river and his eyes lost some of their previously vibrant colors, ha. Ha ha. The relief that Regret felt in his heart was immense. His previous attack must have weakened him enough to disorient his final blow to the point that he completely missed. There he saw an opportunity, and he used it to his advantage, his grin once again returned, and his blades roared even more furiously than before. He blew past the dust blocking his way and lifted his blades up in the air in the shape of an X as he dug down towards the recovering Artorias, who immediately reacted by lifting his sword up to block. For a brief moment, they once again locked blades, yet this time it was interrupted. Swiftly, swords of light unmasked themselves through the dust and fell down like shooting stars towards Regret, though, such tricks would never work. If anything, he almost felt insulted that Artorias would ever try something so amateur against him. Had he forgotten? They were indeed quick, but due to Regret's demon vision, he was able to see them through the dust clear as day. Regret grew even more ferocious as he dodged all the attacks that would have turned him into a pincushion like they were rocks thrown by a child. Artorias was left absolutely stunned by what he witnessed, and Regret used that distraction to strike with a cross slash towards the chest that sent him flying and teetering over the edge. Had he not stabbed his sword through the ground to lessen the impact, he would have most certainly gotten eliminated by a ring out. Distance was put now between them, and Artorias used the time to ready himself and catch his breath. Yet Regret would not allow him such luxury as his blazing figure was seen racing towards him. Slashes of light from Artorias's blade whipped past his face like nothing as he closed the distance in no time. The tides of battle had so suddenly shifted. Once again they fought in close combat. Their swordsmanship was masterful, two uniquely distinct styles that were almost polar opposites clashing against one another. Only this time, it was the style of demonic fire that was clearly on top. Artorias' movements had become sluggish. A quick parry immediately led to a counterattack. A clash of blades led to him losing a few steps back and his movements became easy to read and dodge. Still, despite that, he still managed to land several blows, ones that Regret agonized over far more than. He thought he would, a pain he had little to no experience dealing with, yet through his adrenaline, he shook that seething pain away. For the first time, Artorias flapped those bird-like wings and took flight above the ground preparing an attack. But, Regret's eight tails expanded and pulled him back down only to see that he had used his own move against him, propelling himself down like a diving falcon. Regret's ex-formed katanas blocked the impact, only just. The look in Artorias' eyes was fierce, yet that fierceness was so suddenly obstructed. It was only for a second that they locked eyes, as the tip of Artorias' Excalibur made it through both of Regret's blades. Time slowed down once more. Yet this time, Regret did not quiver nor quail, no, he even smirked. By the time his sword slipped past, Regret had already been ducking. And in an immediate reversal, he dropped his now useless, tangled blades on the ground and lit his fist ablaze. And as if it was the very sun in his hands, he struck Artorias as chest. Asterisk boom asterisk like a volcano erupted from the impact. Black dust consumed all and quickly faded away. Like always the crowd sat silent, yet it was not in anticipation of who had won, but what they had just witnessed. The victor was more than clear, Artorias was now sat on the grass struggling to stay conscious. Black chars filled his heavily breathing face that no longer had that same elegance as before. His spirit form armor was cracked beyond repair slowly faded away, and even the standard armor underneath was in a similar state. It was all over, W what a match. It was obscene. Art, Artorias Calamite has been knocked out of the ring and is unable to fight. 
Your winner that will be moving on to the semi-final round will be the blazing fox standing in the middle of the arena. Regret Oswald. The announcer was almost too lost for words to speak, and the crowd did not fare much better as they recounted what they had just seen. So many times, Regret seemed dead, yet he always managed to escape. It was almost like he could see the unseen. By the times they could notice the sword slashes of light from within the haze, he had already dodged them. Or an illusionary attack, he would strike with confidence as if it were not there, sweat began to fall down the announcer's face. The crowd was silent yet he did not know how he could hype them up again. He struggled to formulate words. And within that panic mind, he noticed something, asterisk clap asterisk, asterisk clap asterisk, asterisk clap asterisk, asterisk clap asterisk, from the grand canopy of judges, Ashley Orbeck, the leader of the Flame Seeker Guild had just so suddenly stood up out of her seat with a gleam, slowly clapping, soon, others followed suit. One man stood clapping from within the crowds, and that motivated another. And another. And soon like dominoes, nearly the entire crowd roared in applause at the spectacle that they had just witnessed, however. The man stood in the center, the focus of that very same applause did not celebrate, nor ride in the victory. No. That very same overly vocal man stood in absolute silence, his spirit form slowly fading away, not even batting an eye towards the crowd. Instead, he looked down towards his fist that had delivered that very same finishing blow with wide open eyes in some sort of grand realization, that narrowed soon after, the announcer spoke, and the crowd cheered, yet he did not hear any of that as he lost himself in his own mind. Only the sudden appearance of a shadow caught his attention, and by the time he looked up, he saw a figure standing directly ahead of him. The very man he had just defeated was still in pain, yet slightly more healed due to external reasons. The crowd's applause grew even more boisterous as he approached with that calm smile of his yet. Regret did not return that smile that he gave. Asterisk TCH asterisk he inwardly scoffed, shaking his head. You did great out there. You were much stronger than I ever expected. Artoria spoke. I can tell you've really been training hard for this. Congrats. And good luck with your next match. He brought out his arm for a handshake. Regret's eyes widened then narrowed even further glancing down towards his extended arm before, looking back up towards his face, unconsciously, his fists were clenched, and his teeth were gritted underneath his closed jaws. Artorias. You. Who do you think you are? Don't you dare patronize me. Chapter 417. Regret's voice was low, yet despite that, all could hear what he spoke. His thick words ominously permeated the air, and the atmosphere suddenly turned grim as the crowds gradually began to lose their previous excitement. The silence slowly grew and spread like wildfire, and before it could become too overbearing, Artorias spoke with a simple smile. Patronize you? Whatever do you mean? Apologies if my words came out wrong, but I was truly trying to congratulate you. You're the victor here, am I really though? Regret scoffed looking at the ground and clenched his hands tighter, small sparks releasing from them. Well, certainly so. You have bested me. Are you trying to argue that you somehow lost? Artorias chuckled. Regret's arms began to tremble, and those small sparks upon his hands slowly began to flicker into flame. And with the flaming orange eyes of a predator, he looked up to meet the gaze of his foe and at the now tranquil gaping crowd staring at him from behind, yet, when he did so, the eyes he met were completely unlike that of what he expected. They were serious, with the ferocity of a lion yet with the calmness and wisdom of an owl. His arms were still out wide, looking for a handshake, even despite all that had just transpired. Asterisk TSK asterisk Regret scoffed once more, relieving his pressure, the flames upon his shaking hands slowly dispersing into nothingness. Keep your hand to yourself. He took a deep breath and smacked Artorias' hands away in disgust. And with those parting words and a scowl on his visage, he walked away towards the tunnel in which he came, ignoring all the silent stares targeted at him like daggers. Black Diamond hash Black Diamond hash Black Diamond hash the fight had officially ended, and it was once again time for a break before the semi-final matchups were announced, and at a time like this, the group had never been more separated. Moby was in places unknown, Rupert was in the hospital recovering, Elizabeth was all alone and Hikari seemed to be elsewhere she could not find, there were only two men who found their way together. In a dark tunnel underneath a cave where the bright light of the heavenly space could not reach, Cracked rocks of grey filled the walls, water droplets gently dripped down from the ceiling and rodents scurried the ground and played within the filthy puddles, there, at the edge of such a place peacefully stood one man. His silver hair could not gleam like it once did, his arms crossed and his golden eyes staring keenly towards the wall as though he was waiting for someone's arrival. And that most certainly seemed to be the case as the sounds of footsteps and splashing puddles were heard from behind, turning his previously blank face to something more natural. Tell me. Of all places, why choose this one? Because no one would be able to hear or spy on us. The figure responded. I. I see. He grinned, turning around to view the face of the same regret he fought on the arena, no, this one may have been even fiercer. So, why exactly did you call me here? What's on your mind? Don't act fucking stupid. I know you let me win. I've worked hard to reach where I am here. I don't need such handouts. Let you win. He raised an eyebrow. Now, why would I let you win? What made you think that? Even if I was holding back somehow, so were you. There's no blood in this space, so you couldn't go full power. And besides, my holy Excalibur does extra damage to demon kind so you even managed to win against the odds, there you fucking go again. I'm no idiot. Did you really think I wouldn't notice? How I just miraculously dodged attacks that would have otherwise killed me. How your movements were odd, not to try and mix me up, but give me an easier time. Hell. You even used useless techniques you knew would never work on me. You even tried to make me look good in front of the crowds. Why? You let me win. You were so mad that you went all this way to tell me that. Well, hypothetically, let's say that I for some reason did do all that stuff you said, I failed to see the problem. In the end, you still won, isn't that all that matters? No. You made me look like a fool. I can't stand for such an empty victory. Don't look down on me. Regret roared, an aura of flames enveloping fists is slowly lightening up the darkness of the space. But that was when Artorias' smile faded away, and his expression shifted, like a mask had suddenly fallen off his face and was now dissolving on the puddle beneath his feet. You claim you're no idiot. But is that really true? You came into the arena as the villain. 
and you could have left as a hero. You won the match, won the favor of the crowds. All you needed to do was act natural. Just thank me and shake my hands. But you blew it. Something so simple, and you threw it all away. I tried to be nice, give you an opportunity at glory. Now you may never get the chance. You let your pride get in the way of something so simple. Your pride got in the way of common sense. At least you showed some restraint there at the end, or else you would have gotten disqualified. But. What happened to getting to the top? Isn't it by any means necessary? Wasn't all your hard work in order to help your mother? How is what you did supposed to help her? You're being selfish. What would she think when she watched you do all that on TV? Proud. Don't you fucking dare bring my mother into this. You know nothing. Regrits roared, his voice echoing off the rocky walls as he heavily shook his head. Do I really know nothing? Artorias slowly approached. If you think so then so be it. You call yourself a rival to Moby Kane. What a joke. You're just a pathetic child. I thought more highly of you in the past. This will be the last time I ever think about helping you. He slowly walked past the clearly distressed and motionless Regret, and soon after did he disappear into the shadows. Good. It's not like I even needed your help anyways. Chapter 418 the many places on display in this virtual space were bustling with people as far as the eye could see, yet most populated of all was still by far the Grand Amusement Park. The tournament was reaching a conclusion, and that was more than seen by looking at the excited faces roaming through the well-paid streets. However, there was one girl who stood out from the rest. There was worry and a hint of uncertainty in her eyes as she ran rapidly through the streets. Unlike where most people were, she always found herself in odd corners and vastly underpopulated areas. It was like she had lost something important to her, and to some, it was almost as though they were watching a small child frantically looking for their mother. And in a dark corner with a single beam of light shining in, she was suddenly enveloped by a large shadow coming from behind. As soon as that happened, her heart skipped a beat. The shadow was all in the form of a human and she immediately tensed up and turned her head. There you are Hikari. I finally found you. You just ran off on me without saying anything. You didn't even answer any of my texts. What's gotten into you? Elizabeth? Yeah, it's me. Something wrong? Forgot about me already? Have. Have you seen Regret? I've tried to reach out, but I can't find him, Regret? She raised an eyebrow. Now, why would you care what some idiot like him is up to? Well. Um. I'm just worried. Have you seen him anywhere? I have a lot to say but. He just ran off without saying a word, ran off without saying a word, huh? Sounds familiar. She remarked before continuing. But no, I haven't. She sighed. But I wouldn't worry about a guy like him. After what he did in the arena it's no wonder he wants time to himself. He's probably not in the best place mentally, even more so than usual. Why yes. I I know. Hikari lowered her head. But. It's just the way he acted. I, you really care a lot about Regret, don't you? Elizabeth abruptly interrupted. Ah, uh, well. I suppose I do, I see. She sighed heavily before her expression turned into giggles. Luckily for you, I can help you with that. Ah really? Hikari's silver eyes glowed like moonlight. But, I thought you didn't know where he was. Well, yes, you're not wrong. But, I do know where he's going to be very soon, where? In. The arena of course. How didn't you know this? His match is coming up in a few minutes. Ah, already? Hikari's eyes grew wider. Didn't you get any notifications on your watch or anything? And no. I never noticed. I did check my watch every now and then, but all I focused on was messages from Regret, so I never noticed anything else, I see. Well, you already missed one match. Moby's semi-final match against Sol Rinwell has been already over and done with for a while now. Wait really? I guess I must have lost track of time then. Did he win? She leaned in closer and asked. Well, of course, he did. Pretty easily too. It was almost too easy actually, too easy for him to beat such a formidable semi-finalist, especially of the Rinwell household. That's good to know. Hikari breathed a sigh of relief, only for distress to once again take over her senses. W wait. If Moby face Sol then that means, yep. Regret is going up against Adam Walker himself. Come on, he'll be fine. Elizabeth patted her on the back. Why yes. I hope so, that was when suddenly, voices from the light outside were heard, and although it was all uniform, it was clear what the topic was. Shit, we're gonna be late by the looks of things. We should get going, Artorias is probably already there waiting for us. Elizabeth turned around and moved towards the distant light, Hikari following close after her. Hum? What's with that look on your face? Elizabeth asked. I'm just, do you not have faith in him or something? She teased. HMPH asterisk yeah. You're right. I should have more faith. What am I even doing? Hikari shook herself off and smacked her pale face several times to the point of turning red. It was so abrupt that even Elizabeth was taken aback at such a display that she would have never expected from Hikari. Well, anyways. Glad to see you better. You seem to have a lot more faith than me that's for sure. Anyways, you haven't answered me properly. Why exactly do you care so much about regret anyways? You look pretty intense. You just worried or is there maybe something more? Elizabeth nudged the confused Hikari as they walked with a smug expression. Something more? She questioned, pondering in her head before her cheeks turned rose in realization. No. It's nothing like that. I'm just worried since he's my friend. If it was anyone else I would have done the same. Ha ha ha. No need to get so flustered. I was just teasing. But most importantly, I'm kinda surprised you managed to even pick up on what I meant. You're not so innocent anymore are you? Please stop Elizabeth. You're embarrassing me, black diamond hash black diamond hash black diamond hash unsurprisingly, the grand arena was packed. 
Upon their arrival, they were immediately hit by a tsunami of people for as far as the eye could see and an even bigger wave of very vocal voices. The arena they stood upon now was far larger than any other from the past matches, yet every seat seemed to have been taken, and Hikari seemed to be gawking far more than her friend considering she had not been there for the previous semi-final match. It was almost too much for her to take in. Her sights wandered aimlessly throughout the space, moving in a circle until her eyes met the now even grander canopy of judges silently peering down towards the stage. And then, that was when she followed their almost laser gazes towards its focus, the eye of the arena, the white tiled battlegrounds below. Regrit. She uttered, yet her voice was drowned out by the many others around her. In fact, she did not know if she had said that out loud or if it was a thought within her mind, indeed, they appeared to have arrived to be quite late. Regret and Adam were already stood upon the stage with the announcer not too far away. Yet, luckily for her, it seemed like the match had yet to begin, she stood motionless, many emotions emanating through her shaking eyes as she tried her best to read his expression. Sweat began to pour from her temples, and her hands unconsciously clenched seeing what she saw. Hikari, Hikari, Hikari. Why yes. She looked around frantically only to be met with Elizabeth's face. Oh, good to see you're still with us. Anyways, we should probably get to our seats. Our seats? Yeah, over there. She pointed, and as Hikari followed her finger, she did indeed see empty seats where only one man sat near. It was Artorias, he had most likely reserved it for them as he waited calmly as usual. Or was it even calmness he was exuding? It seemed so on the outside, yet Hikari could not help but sense something else. Even if it were only for an instant. Chapter 419 As Hikari walked down the stairs, the almost homogeneous sound of the crowd slowly began to become more separate in her ears. Her face saddened, it was just as she expected, yet she could not let it bother her too much. However, the exact same could not be said about Regret Oswald. He and Adam were abnormally silent, staring at each other. Both seemed rather unusual from how they last appeared, most notably Adam Walker himself who seemed to be almost smiling as he spoke. So you must be Regret Oswald, brother of Kai Fatebringer. I have forced myself to refrain from watching any of your previous matches. I have been looking forward to our inevitable bout. It has been told to me by rumor that you are even more powerful than your older brother, is that true? For someone who stayed quiet for the entire tournament, you sure do talk a lot. If you want to see how strong I am then face me and see for yourself. As Regret spoke, the crowd became even more vocal hurling insults and mocking him. Yet, he did not even bat an eye to their words, either because he simply ignored them or that he could not care less about them. Teach him some manners Adam. Put this kid in his place. His usual expressive face was stagnant, it was almost impossible to assume what he was thinking. That was the case unless they knew him and could sense the emotions he kept hardened beyond his clenched iron fists. Confident, I see that you and your brother are quite different, Adam's subconscious smile slowly began to reveal itself upon his face. Very well, I shall see for myself then, the crowd now cheered at Adam's words as the announcer lifted his hands up into the sky and looked up at the approving judges. All right. It seems like both fighters are ready for battle. The second semi-final match of this great tournament is about to begin between Regret Oswald and his flaming swords and Adam Walker, with his puppets of shadows. Three. Two. One. Begin. The signal rang throughout the entire space, drowned out by the sound of the exploding crowds, immediately, with their blades in hand unsheathed. Both fighters disappeared from place, and what followed was a clanking of metal filling the air, though. Unlike most fights that were met in the middle, their figures clashed far more near the right end where Regret previously stood. I in fact, it was almost as though Regret had barely even taken two steps, such was the difference in overwhelming speed, and... In that next instant, Regret found himself flung towards the barrier surrounding the arena, bouncing off of it before recovering safely to the side of the ring, a smile on his face and his swords crossed like an X, preparing to strike, flames rekindled his body, and his breathing was steadied as he stared towards his now blank-faced opponent. Regret Oswald, you disappoint me, Adam's voice was deep, like an ocean of darkness consumed the entire arena in a thick miasma fueled by his emotions, his eyes were narrowed, and the grip upon his two-sided spear tightened almost out of anger before it loosened, allowing him to completely unsheath his weapon, now standing still with his arms fully crossed, the crowd stood silent, one almost inexplicable as they processed what they had witnessed. Even the canopy of judges could not help but widen their eyes and lean closer into their seats at such a display. What, what did you say? Are you trying to mock me? Still, the silence could not last long, as there was a single voice that shattered it completely, like the roar of a demonic fox. Regret's eyes shined like orange stars, and his body and blade coated itself in flames that boosted him towards his unarmed opponent, almost immediately closing the distance, and with one mighty slash aimed directly for the head, he strived to end it all. Yet what he struck was not flesh, but nothing but thin air. Adam had suddenly disappeared from place like he were never there. For a moment, he was overcome with confusion, only for that confusion to be replaced by immeasurable pain in the next. Adam's fist found its mark on Regret's liver, rocking his entire system. He gagged, his eyes rolled back white to the back of his head, and he felt like his spirit had exited his body. Before he could even realize, in the corner of his hazy vision, he witnessed Adam Walker's stern face, leaning closer to his ears. Did you not hear me the first time? I said you disappoint me, you're nothing like your brother, if I were you, I'd just give up now to save myself the embarrassment, don't act like a lion when you're nothing but a mouse, now resign or stay down, understood? His voice was nothing but a soft, deadly whisper in Regret's ears, yet to him, it was fuel for his blazing heart. The flame in his eyes was once again lit, and with all his might, he retracted his head and headbutted his leaning opponent. The blow took Adam by surprise and hit its mark, pushing him back to the edge almost off balance. I said don't fucking mock me. Regret promptly seized the opportunity, entering his spirit mode and rushed his rocking, recovering opponent with his dual katanas, but sadly for him, that opportunity may have been his last, like second nature. Adam ducked below Regret's slicing blades, tripping him and kicking him to the side. Cracks filled the air from Regret's bones as he skipped far on the tiled hard ground. Still, despite such an impact, he stood back up on his two feet and rushed ahead once more with those same eyes, like that of a demonic raging ball of flames. Foolish Adam punched him once again, even harder than before, yet Regret could not stay down, it was like child's play. Every attack Regret would throw no matter what he tried missed by a casual dodge that was nearly always followed by counterattacks. 
However, even though all the pain, bruises, broken bones and ruptured organs, Regret persisted dot a kick to the stomach, a jab to his nose, an elbow to the ribs, a punch in the eyes the pain would grow, yet Regret could not care or had simply lost himself. Over, and over, and over, and over, and over again, nothing changed. I in mere minutes, Regret found himself looking like a bruised and bloated mess, barely even managing to breathe. Had there has been blood in this space, he would have undoubtedly been dyed scarlet. However, despite that, his attacks were still just as powerful and ferocious. It was a miracle to most that he could even stand yet, to the crowds now watching, it mattered not. At first, they laughed and cheered at the display of dominance they witnessed, and some still did even now. However, for the vast majority, they grew abnormally still. Even the announcer could not bear to commentate, what they witnessed was no fight at all. It was more like a sad massacre, at a man consumed with emotion smashing himself on a brick wall so many times, yet standing up from each one and trying again. Like a bully picking on the determined weak. It was almost too gruesome for some to watch, certainly, had it not been for the set rules of the match, it would have all been over long ago. But as long as Regret stood inside the ring, there was no end in sight, at least, that was the case until now. Die. I have had, enough of this, the last thing Regret saw from those hazy, slit-like, bruised eyes of his was a shadow of darkness, its corrupted teeth of white opening wide numbing his consumed body and soul. Chapter 420 For hours, the hospital room of complete white had been dead silent, although there had been two people present. They sat near each other, yet they spoke no words as they stared blankly at the wall, almost like they were trying to disregard each other's presence, the atmosphere was slightly awkward between the two. Both bore hair with bright colors of flame. One, sat on the bed with hair of half orange and half gold while the other, a female with hair of bright scarlet was sat upon a stool to his side, hints of sweat on her face and her hands clenched on her lap. But that all suddenly changed. The man on the bed abruptly sighed and sat up straight, catching her by surprise after he had kept to himself and ignored her for so long. What do you want? He muttered, taking a deep breath and shaking his head. You said we met before, right? What's your name, and state your purpose, apologies. She lowered her head. I seem to have let my manners slip, I have yet to tell you my name, my name is Abby Reed. Reed? His eyes gently opened. Where have I, wait, I've read this somewhere, wasn't your entire family executed? Yes, they were, she nodded. I was the only survivor all due to the mercy of my stepfather, are you not distraught over that? No, of course not. I feel no remorse for the likes of them, Rupert was taken aback by her sudden change of expression as he leaned back on his pillow. Hum, I see, that seems like a sensitive topic, so I won't pry any further. But, can you explain to me how you even know me? Kai Fatebringer. How can I forget? When we were children, the fire families would always frequently meet. The adults would go to their own places while we children were left in another room to socialize. I would always get picked on by all the other kids, and especially my older sister, but it was always you and your brother who stood by my side. Especially your brother who would always stand up to my sister like some sort of hero or champion. However, he was rather cold and unkind when I would try to thank or help him, while you on the other hand were far more open to conversation. She gripped her hands together and stared down as she did once before. I'm sorry, but I can't seem to remember any of that. Rupert shook his head. It's not surprising. We fire household stopped doing meetings after I had turned ten. But, I promise you I speak the truth. Don't worry. The way you describe regret really does seem accurate, so, I believe you. Still, I can't guarantee that my intentions at the time for helping you was any pure. I had a troubled past you see. But that's behind me now. Anyways, why exactly are you here again? Is there a reason I shouldn't just send you away? I don't ever remember inviting you. I got special permission for entry figures, I came here to thank you for your help in the past and to ask something else. Yeah? What is it? Spit it out, he responded with clear disinterest in his voice. I spectated your match with Adam Walker. It was truly a spectacle to behold. The way you used fire was unlike anything I ever thought was possible. It was almost inhuman. Would you be willing to teach me do the same? Asterisk TSK asterisk, who the hell do you think I am? He scowled. Don't think just because you got a pretty face and a nice chest that I would teach you. Of course not. I would never. I have something else to offer. She stood up out of her seat straight as an arrow with firm, angered, gleaming eyes of crimson that immediately left Rupert speechless. Asterisk HMPH asterisk, whatever it is you offer, I doubt I'd agree. And besides, why would you want a failure like me to teach you? Failure? She raised an eyebrow, slowly sitting back down in her seat. You almost beat the strongest student in history. If you are a failure, then I am even worse than trash. Well, then maybe you are, excuse me. You don't understand Rupert's tone suddenly lessened, and the glow around the female to his side began to subside. I had the power to win. I had more than enough. But I had lost and let down the person I admire most. Now, I doubt he'd accept me or even bat an eye at the sight of me without disgust. Huh? Who is this person of yours? Some sort of superior? Maybe he is. Maybe he isn't. You have no right to know his name. Perhaps so. But I do have the right to speak what's on my mind. And I think whoever it is, if that's truly how they feel, then they are not worth serving. Ah, uh, how dare you utter those words. Black flames engulfed Rupert's figure, slowly turning orange as they burned off the bedsheets wrapped around him. With a dominant force nearly unrivaled and a stare that could melt steel, he stood face to face with the girl ahead of him, yet despite his presence, she remained firm, no hesitation in those crimson eyes. A great man once told me, when I too was a pathetic sob like you. No. I was even worse, he told me, how many times do I have to tell you this? You have it all wrong. No matter how weak you get or how far you fall behind, you will never be useless or be mistreated by me because you are more than just a tool, a servant or subordinate. So keep your head up high and think of the future. I am sure you will get past this eventually, I know you will. That's what he said. If you understand you tried your best and put your whole heart and soul to serve, that should suffice. Despite the overwhelming pressure ahead of her, her voice remained strong. As she spoke, the weight pressed upon her began to lessen, and the face of anger upon the man ahead slowly widened following suit. Of course. 
That does not mean that you should not always strive for success, but that does not excuse any of this. Think about what you can do to make up for it and how you can better serve in the future. How is what you're doing going to help your situation? You think I don't know anything, huh? Do you? I've been in that exact same position as you before. Pathetic, drowning in my own delusional misery. If your superior would so easily neglect and throw you away then he is not worthy of your time, effort, or loyalty. Once more, the room found itself engulfed in quiet. The aura that Rupert once held had all but completely subsided. And his dark face that grew may seem to have rekindled some of its lost flames. Those words they sound familiar, who was it who said them? Just like you won't share the name of that seemingly heartless superior of yours, I have the right to reserve the name of mine as well. She smiled. I, I see, that is very understandable, hum, looking out into the future and trying my best to move forward, is that the reason why you came to me for help in fire training? He smiled back. That may be the case. I can't say for sure. Anyways, so, what will it be? HMPH, I guess I can consider your proposal, of course, depending on what it is you have to offer. He waved his hands enthusiastically. Well, that's a relief. Because I'm certain you won't be disappointed. Her closed her eyes and confidently puffed her chest out forward with a chuckle. But that was when their conversation abruptly came to a halt and the doors of the room found themselves flung open. Hey Kai, I've come to check up on you. Regret's match just ended and a pink-haired girl emerged casually scratching her hair. Her head was looking towards the ground with lazy eyes, yet those eyes became gaping when she looked up to see what happened. Abby Reed? Elizabeth Eleonora? Abby responded. Wait, you two know each other? Rupert asked. I guess you can say that it's been a while since we last met eye to eye. I can't believe she's still even alive. Anyway seems like you're suddenly doing a lot better, why is she here? She exchanged glances between both of them. That's none of your business Elizabeth. What are you? Jealous. Jealous. Jealous of what? Asterisk arch asterisk whatever. Seems like you're better now. So, you coming or what? What is there to come to? Rupert questioned, Elizabeth sighed shaking her head before responding. Regret lost his match against Adam Walker. As expected, Rupert interjected. So, you know that it means that it's now Moby Kane against Adam Walker. The final round is starting in a few minutes. I thought I'd come here to see if you're good enough to go. Of course I'm coming, he sternly responded before looking over to his side. Do you want to watch with us too? Ah uh, no, sorry. Abby aggressively shook her head. I'm already watching this match with my stepsister. I can't simply leave her alone. Especially this match that we have been dreaming about watching for almost a year, oh. I see, well, it's your loss. Rupert shrugged. My sister should already be there waiting for me. I should not keep her waiting. Thank you for talking to me Mr. Kai, this conversation has been truly insightful. If it is okay with you, I would like to contact you after this tournament is over. Fine by me. But it should really be me who thanks you, they both bowed and exchanged a mutual expression, and soon after did Abby leave the room, leaving Elizabeth and Rupert to themselves. Why was she here anyway? From when were you two friends? Elizabeth questioned. I'd stay as far away as possible from her. She's only trouble, we only just met now, he responded. Is there something going on between the two of you? No. Of course not. She's not that kind of girl. Yes. But you're that kind of guy. Chapter 421. The arena where the final match was going to occur was still relatively empty, only a few people arrived to take an early seat, most of whom were VIPs with explicit permission, among these few people who had already arrived, six of them stood out standing in a secluded canopy along the top. Usually, there would be some late arrivals, but considering the excitement brimming from each of their faces and the fact that it was the final match, none would dare be late. Oh, man. Today's been a long day, hasn't it? Wilhelm Ortiz, the ashen-haired leader of the Hunter's Guild stretched and looked over towards his fellow judges. Agreed, it was quite long, but I barely even felt any of it. This year's fighters are truly something. The Flameseekers leader responded cheerfully. I suppose that is the case. Yes. They will certainly make for good soldiers for me in the future. Yuria Dark, the mistress of the Cells Word Guild chuckled, rubbing her cherry lips and parting her deep red hair covering her right eye. Is this not the standard of power each year? This seems very close to when I was their age. Grey Osborne, the young leader of the Hawk Guild uttered. Ah, I suppose that this is your first time spectating such a tournament. The Supreme General interjected. But, I can assure you what they speak is the truth. Last you entered this tournament, it had been the most competitive lineup of fighters in many years. This is the equivalent of that. No, maybe even beyond. I see. Gray stroked his chin, his perplexity slowly becoming into a smile. I guess I'm lucky to be able to have this as the first tournament I properly spectate. Yes. Miss Rayner Davis has done an excellent job managing and teaching this year. This is all due to her hard work and dedication. The Supreme General cheered, and suddenly, all eyes were placed upon her, catching her greatly off guard. Oh no. Please, you give me too much credit. These kids are the true people you should be congratulating. They are the special ones here. She blushed, scratching the back of her head. Oh. Don't be too modest Principal Rayner. Certainly, these kids played a big part, but it was all you who made it happen. Don't think I didn't catch notice to all those extra hours you would put in every day. The Supreme General laughed heartily. Miss Rayner, may I ask you a question? Wilhelm Ortiz leant in closer. Yes, you may. What's on your mind? Well, I've been wondering. By far, out of all of us, you spend the most time with these kids. Gave them tests and exams and watched them train in class. Has the results of today so far surprised you in any way? Hum. Now that's a hard question to answer. But, to be completely honest. No. Give or take a few surprises and upsets, this is exactly the result I expected. Even the match between Adam Walker and Kai Fatebringer? Gray asked. Oh no. Not even I could do that. She chuckled. 
Mm, I'm curious, that does assume that you predicted that the final match would be Adam Walker against Moby Kane. Yuria Dark smirked, narrowing her dull green eyes. Yes, you were right to assume so Miss Yuria, ho ho. So you truly had that much faith in that boy? She bit her lip and leant back into her seat in amusement. Well of course. He's been the most promising student I've seen my entire life. She puffed her chest forward, almost as though out of deep pride. Your entire life? Wilhelm questioned. That's quite the claim Miss Rayner. Are you saying even more so than Adam Walker? Perhaps. She grinned. So, out of these two finalists, who do you see as winning? He leant in closer to his seat to ask and suddenly, the atmosphere was drowned by his words, becoming abnormally anxious, yet that tense nature did not seem to affect the gleaming Rayner nor her judgment as she immediately responded. I think it will be incredibly close, yet I believe Moby Kane will definitely come out on top. Ah, uh, you can't be serious right? Wilhelm responded, with hints of sweat on his face. I'm dead serious. Why would I be joking at a time like this? Her grin widened. Indeed. You must be jesting Miss Rayner. My grandson had never lost a match in his life. This is all but guaranteed to be on his side. What do you all think? The Supreme General asked. Of course Adam. There's no doubt in my mind. Wilhelm immediately answered. I think Moby Kane will win. Ashley Orbeck grinned a grin not too dissimilar from that of Rayner. What? Now, why would you think that? Wilhelm nearly jumped out of his seat. Principal Rayner predicted it, so why would I not believe her? After all, she does know them the best, doesn't she? And besides, anything can happen, just look at Kai Fatebringer. Ash. You're just being a bias fire ability user as always. Besides, Fatebringer still lost. The same will probably happen here. Think what you'd like. Our bickerings won't change the outcome. All we can do is wait and see. She shrugged, disregarding his words. Asterisk arg asterisk he shook his head. Gray, Uria. Who do you think will win? He turned around and asked. First of all, who gave you permission to call me by my first name? Uria scowled with a sigh. But, if you must ask, I strongly believe Adam Walker will win. Although, if Kane does win, I wouldn't mind nor be too surprised. That boy is always full of surprises. She giggled. A slight smirk grew upon Wilhelm's face. Ha ha ha. At least someone else here knows how to be a proper judge. You're acting immature, Wilhelm. And here I thought I was the most childish one here. She shook her head, yet Wilhelm seemed to pay her no heed as he gazed over towards Grey who was the only man who had yet to answer. He crossed his arms, and legs leaning back onto his seat with his brows furrowed, clearly deep in thought. And after several seconds, the humming and groaning exiting his mouth abruptly halted as he took a deep breath and gave his answer. Moby Kane, what? But why? Wilhelm stood up, nearly falling out of his seat. I don't know. Call it a gut instinct I guess, he innocently smiled, scratching the back of his head. Wilhelm's face shook. The sheer shock and surprise on his expression could not help but inside sudden laughter from the smug Ashley Orbeck sat next to him. Ha 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 ha. See. Now sit down and watch like a good boy. Let's all see what's gonna happen. Asterisk arg asterisk he grimaced. Fine. We'll see. He sat back down on his seat, a scowl on his face and his teeth anxiously gritted. Come on people. There's no need to get so passionate about this. All I said was my own opinion. I had no intention of starting a war. Raina tried her best to help. Too late for that now. Don't worry, it's not your fault, but peace is no longer an option. Ashley laughed. Damn right it's too late. Wilhelm interjected, a small smile slowly growing on his face. How about this? We'll make a bet. Oh. I didn't know you were a betting man Wilhelm. She smirked. Well. You thought wrong. He returned the sentiment. Okay, guess I did. So, what you got in mind? HMPH. Let's bet our guild weapons. As soon as those words exited his mouth, the air enveloping the space suddenly took a drastic turn with a single thought shared through all of their minds. Our guild weapons over something so petty. You can't be serious right? Ashley's face widened. I'm in agreement here with Miss Orbeck. That's far too valuable. The greatest treasure a guild possesses over a simple squabble? Uria added. I'm dead serious. I'm going all in. What are you scared? You realize your idiocy now. He laughed heartily, a small vein appearing upon Ashley's face as she abruptly interrupted. Fine. Guild weapon it is. I accept. There. You happy now? Ha ha ha. Yes. That's the spirit. M. Miss Ashley. Are you sure about this? You could have just declined. No one would have blamed you. Gray leaned in and whispered in her ears. And let this idiot have the last laugh. In his dreams. Besides, the principal, Raina Davis herself said that Kane is gonna win did she not? So, there's nothing to worry about. I have full faith in her. B but. Miss Ashley, Raina tried to speak. S-H-H-H-H. I have full faith in you. No need to doubt yourself now. This is all on me, if things don't go right I don't blame you at all. Ah. All right. Children these days. Yuria deeply shook her head. Sir, what do you make of all of this? She asked her superior. I say let them enjoy themselves. Who am I to stop them? Although, I do believe that Miss Orbeck just made the rashest mistake in her life and that Wilhelm made one of his best. It's more than clear that my grandson will be the victor. I feel bad, I'll most likely reimburse her for her loss after this is all over, I appreciate your kindness Supreme General sir, but... I have no need for your pity. I am ready to take accountability for all my words and actions when this is all over. That is, in the case that I am wrong that is. Her eyes sparkled, and her smirk gleamed as she turned around to meet the face of her superior. Those were not the eyes of a desperate gambler betting against the odds, but the eyes of a shark certain of the choice she had made. Indeed. 
We shall see soon enough who is right or wrong. Chapter 422. By the time the judges finished their bickering, the empty arena had suddenly become far fuller. Every seat now had a bottom attached to it, and those who could not find anywhere to sit simply stood where they could find the chance with seemingly no complaints. The amount of excitement generated in one room was immense, had the sweat been swept from their palms, it may have even satiated an entire basin of water. Elizabeth. And Kai? Hikari called out, waving at the two figures slowly approaching in the distance. Hello. Rupert waved and took a seat where his allies had been saving for him. Nice to see you finally doing better, Artorias remarked. There was nothing to worry about. I shall take on any and all responsibility for my failure. But that's not my main concern right now, by the way, where's Regret? He late or something. No, he's not with us. Artorias sighed. Not shocking following his latest showing, still, I do believe he's still somewhere out there, spectating from the crowds. I see Rupert nodded. Well, I don't know much about what happened last other than he lost pretty badly. As Rupert talked, Hikari clenched her hands tightly and looked away, yet no one seemed to notice. That he did, Artorias shook his head. Hey, Kai, you're the most powerful one out of all of us here, I've been wondering, who do you think will win? Be honest with me here, around them, the volume of the cheering crowd swiftly lessened, yet that was merely an illusion in their minds. The almost casual sounding Rupert had before suddenly took a far more somber tone, and the facade of calmness he once wore began to slowly crumble. To be completely honest, I think his chances are very slim. Adam Walker is far stronger than I thought, although Artorias asked for an honest response, he did not actually expect to receive anything of the sort. However, he abruptly continued. Knowing him, he'll still win in the end. He's been so confident throughout. Even watching through all the matches. I'd be surprised to learn he has nothing new up his sleeve. Maybe the him in my mind I thought I knew would probably lose, but the him of reality will find a way to win. Have faith. Faith is absolute. Okay, now that's the answer I was expecting to hear. Elizabeth laughed nervously, almost as though taking a sigh of relief. I concur, Artorias nodded. I shall hold on to this faith as well. No matter how grim and meager it may yet be, don't worry. Big Brother will win. Just you watch. Hikari leaned over into her seat with her fists clenched and an unknown expression behind the cloth covering her mouth. A I A I A I. All right. It seems like everyone is finally here. The crowds are filled, and the time has come. Thank you all for spectating. And once again a huge thank you to our faithful judges watching over us. After a long day of non-stop battles and excitement, I expect you all to be rather tired. But. I need your energy for one last battle. Are you all ready to deliver? The announcer raised his hands in the air, and the crowds went absolutely wild. That's what I wanted to hear. The announcer yelled. Now. Without further ado. It's time for the final match of the tournament. Both need little to no introduction. They've clawed their way up the ranks and proved to us all why they deserve to be here. Now the question is who is it? Who is it that is more powerful and deserving of victory? Usually, I'd announce both fighters separately. But for this match, they shall arrive at once and meet each other eye to eye. It is with great honor that I call upon our two finalists, Moby Kane and Adam Walker, to enter the stage. Simultaneously, the two gates set at opposite ends echoed the crunching of metal, slowly lifting and revealing the deep darkness lied within. And at once, two figures gradually entered, although this was the final match, each fighter still wore the exact same standard equipment provided by them, yet, that was not where they would express themselves. No, all such things found themselves plastered upon their faces as they entered the light, Moby seemed relaxed, almost too much so as he calmly strode across the paved path with a slight smile. It was a smile that was not disrespectful, but one that he bore as he subtly acknowledged the crowds. On the other hand, Adam seemed stone cold. Yet upon closer inspection, one could see slight sweat build up and a small shake in his muscles and especially in his mouth, like he was trying to hold himself back. It was not out of nervousness, but clearly something else, the crowd erupted upon their arrival, like two volcanoes exploded to shake the ground with mere voice alone. Each volcano cheered for its preferred fighters with great seething passion, almost abnormally so. And, surprisingly, both volcanoes were nearly equal in size and volume, clashing against one another fighting for supremacy. Wipe that look off his face Walker. Don't let this phony beat you. Knock him off the throne Kane. Humble him down to earth will you. Still, these people seemed passionate, yet relatively calm compared to the horde of fangirls who arrived armed and dangerous, ready to defend their favorites like life or death. I came here just to see you. Canny. Adam I love you. Uh, you see that? Kane waved at me. Know me. Who cares about him? Adam is much better. Shut up. Hey, kid, calm down. What's the big deal? What's the big deal? You kidding me? It's Moby fucking Kane. Beyond the incessant screaming and screeching, those were the only words some could make out. A great amount of these girls were underage and rather young, yet there was still a far greater amount of adults and fellow students who did the exact same thing although, they were not much in the grand scheme of things and certainly not all females participated. I in this modern time, power was everything. The music idols of the past were no longer as important as young upcoming fighters. These are the types of people who would be hard-pressed to go anywhere without paparazzi. At the same time, they both ascended the lengthy steps to the stage. And when they reached their last, they found themselves staring eye to eye, asterisk HPHM, asterisk a small grin grew upon Adam's face, it was clear that he could no longer hold himself back. The rush of blood pumping through his veins must have been immense. So we finally meet, Moby Kane. Chapter 423. I honestly didn't expect you would be the one I would face in the end. I had heard many a rumor about you, you're quite the topic of conversation you know. You honor me with those words grandson of the Supreme General. Moby bowed. But I must ask, are these rumors good or bad? Hum, I can't say, Adam shrugged. I dare not complain though. You have come this far, thus, this means you must be the strongest this school has to offer. Does it not? I can say the same for you as well. Moby returned. Oh such boldness, Adam's grin extended. Last I heard such confidence the battle turned out to be a great disappointment. 
Don't worry. That won't happen, I can assure you of that. I hope so. Adam sighed, that was when Moby walked away from his position, heading to the center of the stage. And in a move that no one foresaw, he brought out his hands. I hope we have a good match. Upon witnessing this sight, Adam's face widened, and the quivering sweat around his body intensified. He walked up towards the center to shake his opponent's hand, in a sign of unforeseen sportsmanship. I hope so too. And good luck. The crowd applauded as they shook hands. Their eyes locked, their warrior gazes trying to withstand the other's pressure and read their minds. To the audience, all that was invisible, yet these mind games lasted long before they both went back to their own respective sides, with the announcer rambling about how impressed he was at what he saw. Yet, for Adam who was still walking back, that voice was nothing but ambience to his own thoughts, this guy, that gaze of his solid, ominous, with no sign of wavering. My body is acting up now even more than before, what's up with it? Ever since I came on stage I've been shaking like crazy. My blood is pumping, my fingers are tingling, Nago, why is that? The spirit, toothy red-eyed blob of shadow slowly emerged from his feet and slithered towards his back with heavy breaths. Adam, indeed you thought right, this man is different from every other, even more so than that fire fox of your, your body is sensing something, and is reacting to it without your knowledge, yes, I can feel it too, this is true excitement, Adam. The feeling of a worthy foe. Nago's soft hissing seethed into Adam's ears like a typhoon, and his mask of proud indifference began to crumble into an open grin. Yes I truly hope so now. Allow me to count you in for the beginning of this match to end all matches. Adam noticed the announcer as he backflipped off of the stage and out of the way, yet his steady gaze was sharpened, never venturing to leave his opponent, three, two, one, begin. What? Adam inwardly shouted dot he had yet to even blink, but the enemy once in his sight suddenly disappeared into thin air like he had never even stood there. For the second time in his life, he inwardly panicked, looking everywhere he could in the time he could, all but one direction. Up. Like an eagle, Moby soared down from above, camouflaging with the blinding light slashing down his black, purple pulsating katana. Had it not been from Nago's foresight erecting a shield of shadows, he would have most certainly been cut. Adam's vision was blocked by thick darkness, yet luckily for him, he and Nago shared senses allowing him to see through his beating red eyes, Moby was pushed back from the attack, yet before he found ground he created several purple ice knives and threw them at him. But, just like his previous attempt, his attacks proved futile, bouncing off the erected shield of shadows that Adam immediately dispelled to go on the offensive, however, just when he thought he was safe, Moby once again disappeared into thin air. And the next thing he knew, a katana was stabbed through his chest, just narrowly missing his heart due to Nago's quick thinking. Asterisk gug asterisk Adam gagged. And with shadows engulfing him, he exploded a force field around him, sending his opponent flying, giving him time to calm and catch his breath. Fortunately, a plate of shadow armor built up within his body, yet he could still feel every moment of that sword plunged into his system, however, he would only get a mere moment to take everything in as a voice rushed in his ears. Those knives. He can teleport to them. Nago immediately followed those words by shrouding the ground in shadows that engulfed the knives, immediately destroying them, once again, both fighters found themselves standing at their respective ends, the only difference being their condition and the expression upon their faces, the crowd's cheering somehow became even louder, and the announcer began speaking with heavy breaths like he was on the verge of having a stroke, yet none of that even made a dent on either of their concentrations, especially that of Adam. He could not allow his opponent to gain the upper hand once again and humiliate him by disappearing before his very eyes. He could not guarantee survival the next time such a thing would happen, and in that moment of deep intensity, something changed within him, his eyes widened. Like a rush of power, or some sort of energy was now permeating through his veins. His eyes glowed, and his vision reflected that. He felt empowered. It was an odd feeling, yet one that he had experienced once before during those final moments with Kai Fatebringer. There was no doubt in his mind, it was the same exact thing, and in the next moment, he noticed something. Two throwing knives were headed his way, only one was secretly hidden behind the other. That was when the figure from behind began to glow a deep purple glow and disappear. In that next instant, that same purple glow transferred over to the hidden knife, out of instinct, his body reacted. This moment was so surreal. From before, no matter how hard he stared, that purple glow just before teleportation was virtually invisible in his eyes. But now, it was clear as day. There was a weakness in his moves a clear delay in teleportation, and Adam planned on capitalizing on it. With his two-bladed spear in hand and shadows strengthening its tip, he dashed over towards that glowing knife like a blurry charging ball. And just like he expected, there he found Moby exactly where he expected, their blades clashed. Moby only just managed to react and block his move. The absolute shock on his face was evident, filling Adam with untold euphoria as he sent him flying. And whilst Moby was recovering in the air, there was Nago waiting for him as a thin shadow slithering on the ground in waiting. When he reached above him, that was when he struck, turning into a shark and snapping his jaws down at him like it had just escaped the murky water of haze, leaving nothing behind in its wake but the sound of its roar and echoing jaws. Chapter 424 However, that sound of snapping did not come from the sound of this shark of shadows closing its jaws, but from something different. Upon closer inspection, it was clear to see that the shark's mouth was jittery, still slightly open, and looking even closer would reveal the face of a grinning man, his sword was horizontal propping up the shark's mouth open. Its metal was bent abnormally and cracks filled it from edge to hilt. It was more than clear, the sword would not last. And like a toothpick, it then snapped in half, shrapnels of metal flying in all directions as the shark's jaws finally locked in place, yet, this gave more than enough time for Moby to spring himself out of the jaws of hell, safely landing on the outside with heavy breaths. The crowd almost lost their minds, one second it seemed over, and in the next the battle continued. First, it was Moby with his katana stabbed into Adam, and now it was Adam nearly eating Moby alive. So much had happened in mere seconds that their hearts could not contain the excitement. AIAIAI, you see Ash. You should have not talked so big. When Kane was winning, at the start, Adam was clearly toying with him. Wilhelm Ortiz chortled, and the Supreme General who sat not too far away smiled his words, his right hand tightly clenched as he leaned on his left. Toying? You blind? These two are giving it all they got. Supreme General sir, what do you think of all of this? Oh. Apologies. I must have lost myself in the battle, what is it that you need? 
Um, what is it you think of this match so far, sir? She asked with an odd expression on her face as she closely inspected him, her eyes always finding themselves locked on a certain part of his body far more than the other. Oh, well. I think it's quite obvious that my little grandson here is just having some fun. I've never seen him so happy before in my life. So if he's happy, I'm happy. That's my thoughts right now. He laughed heartily, leaning back on his seat and crossing his hands ready to enjoy the show. AIAIA the battle raged on, yet this time Moby had no blade, his only weapon was his bare hands. At first, they seemed evenly matched, trading blow for blow. It was clear to see that both of their martial arts and fighting prowess were unrivaled, especially for their age. It was like witnessing a dance between two master fighters weaving and attacking with grace, however, as the battle continued, a clear winner began to show, Adam was not alone, Nago was always not too far away from his side. It was clear that Moby had trouble tracking and fighting both, especially with no weapon. And worst of all, every time Moby would try to teleport, he was always countered, all he had to work with was his ice, and that seemed far from enough for victory. In one final seemingly desperate attempt, Moby created several ice shards that shot out a beam of energy that surrounded Adam who immediately blocked, no, even reflecting the attack back at its sender, yet before the beam could make contact with him, he sent those still floating shards towards Adam and teleported to one of them only two. Find himself blocked as soon as he did, paying dearly for it. Adam's initial slash to Moby's abdomen missed its mark, yet the shadow spike stabbing the shoulder and the kick to the gut that sent him flying most certainly did not miss. The two fighters once again stared each other down waiting for the first move. And sooner than expected, the first move did come, yet it was not in the form of an attack. What's with that look on your face Kane? Does it look weird to you? I hope I haven't been a disappointment to you so far like you feared. No. Not at all. He chuckled. But, I've seen through your teleportation, and your weapons are no more. How is it that you're going to face me now? Mum, is that what it looks like to you? That sword the military provided was nothing more than a toy. I don't need it he smiled. I have a much better one. Moby lifted his hands into the air, a smoky purple glow surrounding his fingertips. It was clear that he planned for an attack a powerful one at that. Adam could no longer hide his excitement, he lifted his blades and prepared himself, charging his own attack to match, the ground shook, and the masses waited with bated breaths for something to happen. But, for several seconds, nothing came, at least until one wide-eyed man from the crowds noticed something and pointed. What is that? There, above the heavenly clouds at the edge of the arena's barriers, he saw a sword, one made out of thick, bright purple ice. Or, could was what he saw even be called a sword? It was more like an iceberg, in the shape of a sword, the detail engraved upon it was immaculate, yet it quickly became hard to tell as such a behemoth began its journey down, only then did Adam Walker catch notice, looking up past the subtle clouds of light, the crackling sound of ice crystals and wind permeated through the bubble, blowing away all in its path, however, even in front of such a monster, Adam smiled. Casually, he raised one hand that he had been using to channel his shadows and pointed it at the sky. And with a simple flick of his wrists, spikes and malleable tentacles of umbri rose out of the ground, attacking the falling sword from every angle, quickly, the sword began to crack, and not too long after did it shatter into several small chunks falling down to the ground like large, but simple hail, completely harmless. The attack was quite the surprise to Adam, not because it was strong, in fact, it was the contrary. It was far too weak, he had wasted too much power on dispelling it. Luckily, he had only used half of what he had been charging, yet he could not shake the disappointment from his face even as hail showered down on his head feeling more like a light shower. But that was when the disappointment was erased, and he finally realized his opponent still smiled, even as his ultimate attack was so casually defeated, his eyes grew wide as a goldfish, and the gears in his brain began to turn in overdrive, and at that moment, he witnessed that same purple glow that flashed when he was ready to teleport, and in the next moment, he disappeared. Adam's mouth flew open, where? He had kept his eyes on him at all times, he had yet to throw a throwing knife to teleport, he made 100% certain of that. So now where did he go? In that mere instant, his brain worked harder than it ever had in his life, and in that moment of immense shock, out of the corner of his eyes, he remarked an unnaturally bright purple light, signals went off in his head like wildfire, it sensed danger, and his body moved on its own by mere instinct, and as he jumped away, he felt a stinging pain riding out of his right side. And as soon as he landed, regaining his balance and vision did he see what it was his arm, his right arm that was previously attached to his shoulder was cleanly severed. It was not a sight he would have ever imagined to see in his entire life, and what made it even odder in his mind was the complete lack of blood he would have expected to be spraying from it like a sprinkler. Still, no matter how much it hurt and how much he was stunned, his eyes could not dwell on his arm for long. No, it kept steadfast on his opponent and his zealous, almost bottomless glowing purple eyes. In his hands was a cartana made completely out of purple ice, almost an exact replica of the giant one fall dowing. And in that moment, Adam realized what had happened, this seemingly harmless hail, all of it were marked for teleportation. It was all premeditated and planned. He used his own attack against him, he could not believe he was so easily fooled, his smiling, ha ha, slowly, the expression of shock and sweat engulfing him began to dissolve, and what came to replace it was not grief or anger, no, it was joy, pure joy and unrivaled excitement with every part of his body jittering in glee. Ha 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 ha. I didn't expect that cane. You got me good. But. This is the last time I'll allow you to make a fool of me. Show me what you've got. Don't hold back. Chapter 425. From all corners of the space, shadows emerged, flowing and pooling underneath his feet, Nago, his shadowy spirit, laughed with a bright glow in his eyes as he soon after dissolved within the ocean of darkness, this thick dust crawled up onto Adam's feet and immediately spread towards his severed arm, completely replacing it with one made completely out of shadows. And from there, the energy continued to flow up, reaching his neck until it completely covered his grinning face in the thick, uniform, darkened scales, the shadows all around him hardened and formed into shapes, like a skin-like armor of scales, two massive wings springing out as he opened his claws and let out a piercing roar that shook the entire bubble around, and destroyed some of the still falling hail that was then immediately stopped by the dome of darkness raised throughout the space. Now face me. Carney E. The laughter and excitement could be seen on his transformed face even more so than that of his original. 
His jagged pearly white teeth were always open, and the sheer passion in his now beating red eyes was unlike anything the crowd had ever seen from him before or even imagined, especially considering this was nothing like the silent, laid-back and somber Adam Walker they knew for their whole lives. I in the face of this ever-growing darkness looming over him, and the wind blowing upon his face from his opponent's roar, Moby calmly stood his ground with that now all-too-familiar expression of confidence, seemingly unfazed. And by simply closing his eyes and spreading his arms wide, he began his retaliation. Gladly, the flowing darkness began to sidestep where Moby stood as energy began pouring and flowing all around him, one ominous, pitch black, and dark in nature, far different from that of his opponent. Such energy made the already trembling ground exponentially more unstable. His aura followed his body up, forming into scale-plated armor and gauntlets that possessed sharp, demonic claws. Home black scales slowly crawled up his face and stopped sitting firmly under his eyes in a serrated state. The shoulder pads were not at all symmetrical, the right one being far more spiked than the other that looked very lacking in comparison. Scaly wings that were bat or maybe even draconic in nature spread wide behind his back, and similarly, pattern scales extended from his neck all the way towards his glowing eyes, jagged and rough around the edges. I in fact, the same could be said about the rest of his appearance, it lacked polish. It was unbalanced, some parts seemed to be completely missing and others were mismatched. I in all places, the crowd never expected to see such a thing here. An incomplete spirit mode. Yet, even at such a sight, no one dared to raise their voice in protest, after all, the energy and presence expelling out of that man were undeniable, in many ways, these two spirit forms looked very similar, and in others, they seemed completely unique. Thus, the question on everyone's mind was, through this now ever-thickening darkened arena, who will emerge victorious? Good. Adam laughed. Now let's go. He waved his hands, and an army of Nago spirit summons emerged out of the darkness at his feet like a small battalion that he sent. And once again, in the face of such a force, Moby's smiling composure remained as he nodded and rushed straight into battle. He opened his left fist up in black and purple light, and after crushing it, the falling hail that was once blocked by the Dome of Shadows began to once again rain down, cracking and breaking through the erected barriers with more power and ferocity than before. These large spikes of hail made their mark on Adam's summons who shrieked in defeat, and allowed Moby a perfect way in with his teleportation. The battle that ensued could only be described in one word. Legendary, their abilities perfectly complemented and countered each other. Moby's clones that he used to trick his opponent, and confuse him with teleportation proved to be excellent distractions for the ever-growing army of summons, and Adam's crafty manipulation of his shadows was perfectly matched by Moby's purple ice. Nothing but the sound of weapons clanking and the ghastly wails of dark energy filled the arena. All sat silent, sweating uncontrollably watching the fight. That was, assuming they could even watch the fight. Everything moved so fast that even the strongest beings sat in the crowd struggled to keep track of their movements, as they flew zooming across the skies like dark blurs, the power ceiling seemed to have no limits, the more they fought, the more insane it all became the barriers placed to protect the crowd began to crack aggressively, more and more as the fight continued to the point that staff was forced to reinforce it as they fought, yet, despite that fact, the two fighters never acknowledged that nor once ceased battle, they were far too lost in the adrenaline and rush of combat to even care about anything else, and that fact was especially true for the openly beaming Adam, black diamond hash black diamond hash black diamond hash, so, Wilhelm, have you changed your mind yet? Ashley Orbeck smirked and nudged the man to her side who leant forward in his seat almost unable to believe his eyes. Why, why? Yes Ash. I, I believe you okay. This cane is no joke, even with his incomplete spirit mode. He gulped. If this is how strong he is when it's incomplete, it scares me to think how he'll be once it gets perfected, so, you ready to hand over that guild weapon of yours yet? She burst out laughing. Hey. Calm down there. Who said I think he's gonna win? Wilhelm immediately turned his head. It's a close match, but Adam's still gonna squeak it out. Right Supreme General. He looked over to his superior looking for comfort. Ho ho. Yes yes. Don't worry, leader of the Hunter's Guild. My grandson is guaranteed victory. Most certainly so. He confidently stroked his beard with his left. Hum? Are you sure about that Supreme General? Your sweaty face and shaking right hand of yours sure tell a different story. You may be trying to hide it, but I can see through the cracks clear as day. You shouldn't give him false hope you know. She smugly retorted. Ah, the fellow judges who sat all around promptly stopped what they were doing as they stared directly towards Ashley with apprehensive expressions, did she really just say that, they all thought in unison, for all their lives, they never once heard the Supreme General be addressed in such a way and they expected to see some consequences, yet, despite all they thought, that was not at all what she received, ha ha. You think so Miss Orbeck? I understand that I may not always predict things right, but your words may have been too harsh no. Nevertheless, we'll see in the end who's right and wrong. Oh, in fact, the match seems to be coming to an end now. He assuredly acknowledged and leaned back onto his seat, which led the eyes of the judges away from him and back glued on the fight below. Black diamond hash black diamond hash black diamond hash abruptly, the seemingly never-ending hail falling from above ended, and the cracked dome of shadows closed from above, never to be opened again, as a result, the arena darkened, and the thick miasma of Adam's shadows finally began to take root. That was the first time the fight had stopped for even a moment as the two severely injured and heavily. Breathing fighters acknowledged what had happened with two drastically different reactions. Adam's smile now extended to his pointy ears, and his eyes were now the only light that could be seen from within the space, for the first time, a look of true panic appeared on Moby's visage. His source for escape and teleportation was no more, and he was now defenseless in the face of Adam's crippled yet still potent power. It was a moment that Adam could not allow himself to pass, thus he swiftly acted. With his newly summoned minions unhindered, he surrounded Moby from all sides. There was no escape as they slashed and bombarded him while he tried his best to use his ice as a shield. Surprisingly resilient. Adam commented. But that ice can't save you from this. He hoisted his right arm up in the air in magnificent spectacle, and the shadows all around Moby began to dissolve and mold into a new form, together, they combined in a new figure, that of a perfect sphere, a floating ball that completely encased Moby's entire body, whatever material that shadow was made of, it was solid to the core. The sound of heavy echoing of crashes emanated through the inky void as Moby hurled his hands from the inside trying to escape, yet no matter how much he tried, it all proved to be futile. 
The ball did not crack nor did it even vibrate anything substantial. The sound of Moby's attempts at escape sounded like music to Adam's ears as his twitching arms continued to keep the ball afloat. Ha, ha, ha. It's finally over Kane. This. This was it. Although it's now over, you did not disappoint. That was by far the best time of my life. Thank you so much. But don't think this is over. We will fight again. And next time. I will be stronger. And I hope you will be too. But for now. Goodbye. Chapter 426. Adam lifted his open right hand even higher from his head, and with much tension in his arms, he closed his fists of darkness with a noise akin to shattering glass. Suddenly, the ball of shadows floating above in the sky began to twitch, and in the very next moment, the twitching stopped. The sound of agony and metal could not have been any clearer. The ball that had once been as smooth as could be was now a disheveled monstrosity of spikes like that of a sea urchin. Ha ha, it's over. Adam cheered and celebrated in his mind, not trying to suppress that monstrous grin of his. Hey hey now, there was nothing but silence, his subtle laughter was the only thing entering his ears beyond his own thoughts. That match had taken out of him more strength than he could have ever anticipated. He closed his sights and took a quick breath to ease the pain of his aching body, and that was when he opened his tired, blurry eyes only to see a light flickering in this dark, somber world of shadows, ah, beautiful, purple, purple flickering. What could this mean? HMHM, it was a subtle purple light on his still lifted right hand, one of an origin his distressed mind could not yet discern nor care about much past its extravagance. But that was when something happened that he did not ever anticipate at this very moment abruptly, that purple light disappeared, and in its place emerged pain, pain unlike he ever felt since birth. A sharp, stinging pain that no doubt originated from the heart. It stabbed deep, churned, twisted, burned and pulsated throughout his entire body. Asterisk AGH asterisk he choked. His eyes of haze shot wide open, a feeling of lightheadedness and nausea took over, and he felt like he would pass out at any moment. But before he did KKNE, he blurted. Impossible, the gears that had nearly halted in his mind began to work in overdrive, reinvigorated, fighting through all the pain. No doubt, that was the man he saw, holding his sword of ice stabbing it deep into his agonizing chest. But, how could that be? He had died right before his eyes, impaled by several spikes that he erected from within, there was absolutely no escape. He should have been a mangled corpse. So how? Unless abruptly, a flash of light filled his vision, and a realization widened his face, it was the memory of what happened at the start of the match no, perhaps even before, that handshake. That handshake of goodwill at the beginning may have not been at all what he expected. He, the man who stood above all in power had been tricked by something so elementary, hazy, confused and weak in his knees he felt as if he could collapse under his own weight at any moment. Yet, he gritted his teeth and pushed on still despite this weakness. He could not allow himself to fail. The voices in his head that normally contradicted each other now screamed in unison, and told him to stop what he was doing and find a way out of this desolation. The road ahead was a tough one and right now he wasn't sure whether he was willing to walk it, let alone whether he was able. Yet he went on nonetheless, however, his attempts quickly proved futile, I, I can't move. A numbing sensation along with. Even greater pain met his resistance full force. It was purple ice that spread from his heart, all the way to the rest of his body, he was being frozen alive. The fact that escape was futile quickly set in, yet the final nail in the coffin came from an outside voice. Farewell, you did better than I thought, ah, be better than I thought you say, is that so? Adam's expression calmed down, slowly soothing into a smirk, looking up with what little vision he has towards Moby's face, his body was fine, uninjured even. Had I been underestimating how much damage he had dealt this entire time? He could have killed me all this time no doubt, yet he waited for the perfect time to reveal his trump card. He baited me all into this incredible, his smile softened, so, this feeling, I've never felt like this. It's so utterly absolute, bitter, yet at the same time so sweet. So infuriating, yet so satisfying, so demoralizing, yet so motivating, finally, what could it be? Is this this defeat? Those were the last words that exited his mouth before he succumbed to the freezing cold, his vision slowly turning from crystallized purple to pitch black as his body was now nothing more than a block of ice. Suddenly, the dome of shadows was expelled, the light of the heavens above once again set in brightly on the nearly destroyed arena below where one man stood, his hand shielding his unaccustomed sights from the glaring sun, all eyes silently gazing at him. Indeed, the match had ended, yet. That fact did not seem to set in well just yet in the minds of the spectators. The last most of them saw was Moby encased in a dense ball of shadows as he struggled to escape. After that, the ever-thickening darkness made it nearly impossible to see, there, they held their breaths. They heard the sound of screaming, and they thought it was over only to see a slight purple flicker beam from within the umbri. And now, the victor had finally appeared standing before them, and the one defeated was encased frozen in a block of ice, no doubt unconscious still. Most curious of all was the expression he wore on his face through that solid sheet of purple frost. It was a smile. One that, despite defeat, was oddly peaceful and at ease, like he had fully accepted his fate. It, it's all over. The winner of this year's heavily contested arena of champions. The man who fought against the odds and proved himself the strongest. Moby Canny. Chapter 427. For a very brief, yet preciously peaceful span of time, a small sigh of relief exited the Supreme General's mouth. His furrowed temple softened, his arched back laid back onto his throne and his heavily jittering right hand opened and relaxed from its closed fists, finally, it's all over, was the only thought present in his mind as he closed his eyes and once again sighed his stress away, after all, his grandson had finally won, and his lawful words were once again upheld like holy scripture, however, that brief moment of serenity was precisely as it was, brief, and the tower he had all built thus far. Came crumbling down on him head first, when he opened his eyes, the world of shadows was no more, and both fighters were once again on the ground, yet instead of Adam standing victorious, he was in a block of ice, and instead of a mangled corpse, Moby stood tall and proud as the victor, W-H-A-A-T-T-T. -T. His eyes spurted bloodshot as he leaned forward in his seat with an open mouth, yet despite such an act of pure instinct, he could not speak even a single word, all went on within the machinations of his mind, ah. How could this happen? There was no mistake. There should have been no way. I made sure of it. Ha 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 ha. I knew it. See that Wilhelm. My main man came one. You ready to pay up now? 
I expect my new guild weapon delivered by tomorrow, 12 p.m. sharp country X time, Ashley openly laughed, gloating in the glimmer of sweet victory. This this can't be, Supreme General. How did Adam lose? I thought you eat, yes. And I was certain. Cade Walker, the Supreme General interrupted the sweating man to his side. There must have been something wrong. I'm confident of it. B, but sir, are you really S, yes. That's the only way. Everyone watched stunned within the canopy, they had never once seen their general act in such a way, even in the most intense of war meetings, he had never once crumbled nor lost his composure. He was always ten steps ahead of everyone else, if anything, this was further proof to them of how certain he was of victory. Once he noticed the gazes of shock, Cade calmed himself down and once again leaned back in his seat with narrowed eyes, his grey brows once again furrowed as he stroked his beard. As he was thinking, the announcer continued on with his praises and words of victory, and in the midst of it all, the Supreme General's face lit up in realization, his eyes widened, and a surge of what could only be described as subdued rage overcame him as he abruptly stood out of his seat and looked over below. Moby Kane. As the winner of this entire tournament, would you like to give us and all the people watching at home your final comments and closing words? What is it that you would like the world to know as you now stand victorious? The announcer leaned in closer and asked a confidently smiling Moby who immediately nodded. Yes. Of course. I'd be honored to. What I objection. Suddenly, a loud, authoritative voice rang, echoing to all ends of space, from boisterous, immediately, the crowd was silenced, left sweating as their heads snapped to where the sound emerged, such was its power. A supreme general? Few muttered, it all thought within their minds. With my power a supreme general of the military and overseer of this tournament. I hereby have you disqualified. Disqualified? The crowd gasped, yet before they could speak they choked over their own words from such astounding pressure, most in the crowd were gasping for air, and some forgot how to breathe altogether. Yet, despite that, even as the target of such force, Moby stood his ground, no, he owned it with confidence, completely unmoved. In fact, some could have sworn he even looked smug. Supreme General Sir. Excuse my rudeness, but what mistake have I committed to be the bearer of such harshness? Don't you dare fool me boy. I know what you did. You had marked my grandson for teleportation, yet the match had yet to even begin. That is clear cheating. And as such, you will not only be disqualified, but also severely disciplined to dare pull off such a stunt. Me? Cheating? I would never. Moby raised his hands. Little for me to argue with the Supreme General himself. But even if that were to be the case, where in the rules does it state that what you described is against it? What? The Supreme General retorted. You heard me. State to me where in the rule book does it say that I'm not allowed to set up traps or tactics until the referee starts the match? Hey, boss, should I keep running the cameras? This is looking bad, one man from the side nervously stuttered. Shut off the cameras. You crazy. We've just struck gold. Keep rolling like your life depends on it. I'll walk on your corpse and continue to do it myself if you pass out. Understood. Why yes sir, mum? Nothing? Still thinking? Moby placed his hands on his right cheek like he was pondering deeply. You know why you can't tell me? It's because no such rule exists. I've carefully read the entire rule book from cover to cover many times over, yet nowhere does it state such a thing. In fact, I am far from the only one to employ such tactics. As long as your opponent doesn't pick up on it, you're free to do so. As such. Such disrespect. How dare you speak to your supreme superior in such a way? Veins pulsated out of the supreme general's skin, the rage he had held back before seemed to be on full display, forcing some spectators on their knees, yet their Moby was with that same expression as before. With all due respect sir, you may indeed be my superior. Yet, even if you are, does that not give me the ability to stand up for myself? Here you were ready to threaten me with cruel punishment and disqualification over something completely vague and made up, this is the least I could do. I am far from the only person to employ this legal tactic, yet you single me out. Why would that be? Don't answer that. That's a rhetorical question. The answer is clear. You're clearly biased towards your grandson. That was the thought on everyone's mind, yet none had the audacity to speak it out loud, and even through all that happened, they never expected Moby to keep going under such a deadly glare. And to that, I can't blame you. How could you not be? His family after all. However, sometimes one must distance themselves from relatives and loved ones in the pursuit of being objective. Still, second place in such a tournament is no small feat, it could have gone either way. Your grandson was extremely formidable, far more than the imagination. I greatly look forward to our next encounter. And I truly hope that maybe, we could call ourselves friends someday, I, I've calmed myself, and, I apologize for anything I could have said or done, I truly do. I am completely willing to relinquish my victory to him now, but would such a victory be satisfying to him? Would he want it or even stand for such an empty triumph? That's something to think about, a few minutes ago, very narrowly, it could have been me in his position now, that is something I have been thinking about ever since it all ended. You should not be saddened. Nor should you be angry. I completely understand, and I appreciate having a supreme general with a big heart. Someone who truly cares. And for that, I am thankful. Truly, thank you, Supreme General Cade Walker. Asterisk clap asterisk asterisk clap asterisk asterisk clap asterisk asterisk clap asterisk clap asterisk 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 swiftly, the previously muted crowd went wild, clapping and cheering even more than before, praising the Supreme General. A reignited flame by a single match dropped into a field of grass spreading like wildfire, and that match was none other than Moby's passionate speech, more than before, the Supreme General was left utterly speechless. Sweat dripped from his every pore and his eyes could not stop from shaking, what's going on, how, how could this boy bring this crowd up from the dead like some sort of necromancer, impossible, they're so passionate, even I couldn't do such a thing, yet this measly little boy, his mind spun round and round, looking for an escape, yet he found himself choking over every word that he wanted to utter, all led to a dead end, he was completely cornered, bested in something he thought he had. 
Master Dot if he pushed on despite it all, he would be labeled as harsh and tyrannical, and his appeal with the masses would plummet. And, on the other hand, if he were to accept and try to damage control, it would prove all of Moby's words and claims as factual, and his grandson would remain the loser. All moves led to checkmate, faced with such an ultimatum, he had to make a move, and out of both moves, he chose the lesser of two evils, ha 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 ha, the supreme general's face relaxed, and his expression went into soft laughter, his aura was immediately dispelled in the wind, diluting as if it were never even. There. Apologies boy. I should be the one thanking you for your kindness. The crowd as well. Such bright talent indeed. Thank you for looking at things through my lens as well. Not many people could actually do such a thing during stressful times. I suppose the realization that my little grandson is no longer undefeated really had me acting abnormally. I guess I should look forward to him now having a new rival. He laughed heartily. Young Moby Kane. Winner of this tournament. How could I ever make it up to you after what I've done? Sir. Moby smiled, saluted, and deeply bowed. You grace me with such words. I dare not ask for any reward. After all, as you said, I have already won myself a new rival. What more can I truly ask for? Chapter 428. At last, the tournament was finally over, yet the headache brewing in the mind of the Supreme General had just only begun. For several minutes, a smiling facade remained on the Supreme General's visage like a mask, hiding what truly laid within. All the spectators had long cleared out from the stage, and all the competitors along with them. What remained still present were the canopy of judges, still excited as ever conversing about the match that had recently transpired before they left to prepare for the award ceremony. You see. You idiots should have trusted the principal. She knows her students best doesn't she? Such a good teacher. Ashley Orbeck grinned, wrapping her hands around the slightly flustered principal Raina Davis in celebration like they were best friends. Miss Orbeck. Please stop. You're giving me too much credit. It was but a hunch. Ha ha ha. Nonsense. Nonsense. You were right on the mark. She laughed. Hum. I do admit, that boy. Kane. Hum, quite the rare specimen. Shame on me for thinking lowly of him. Yuria Dart parted her hair and bit her lips as she leaned back and crossed her legs. Although I am not in complete accord with the fashion you make of this Miss Yuria, I am in general agreement, the boy is special. His abilities are still rough around the edges as well, he has so much untapped potential. Don't you think so Sir Wilhelm? Grey Osborne, leader of the Hawk Guild commented and looked around to see his fellow male judge. Huh? You asking me? Can't you see I'm too depressed, crying over losing my guild weapon here? You can continue crying Wilhelm Ortiz, but while you do that I'll think of how I can make that boy my own. Yuria Dark giggled, narrowing her eyes. What? You didn't even have faith in him before it started. What makes you think he'll join you? With two guild weapons at my side now he'll no doubt join me. Ashley proudly exclaimed. Ladies, ladies, calm down. We will see when it all happens. I also look forward to seeing who it is that will win him over. He and Adam Walker were evenly matched, but sadly for us, Adam will no doubt follow in his grandfather's footsteps and join the ranks of the military, isn't that right Supreme General? Grey Osborne looked around to meet the cheery yet dull eyes of his superior, and after a moment of odd silence, his eyes moved and he began to speak. Well of course. My grandson is not for sale to any of you. He'll no doubt be my successor. We, humans, are strong, but not immortal. Even I. He laughed out loud before casually standing up from his seat. Where are you going, sir? Do you not want to relax and hang out with us? Wilhelm raised his head and asked. Apologies young leader of the hunters, I would love to stay here. But sadly I cannot. This is no time for relaxation, I may be old, but I'm still the supreme general. There's always work to be done. He chuckled heartily, like the tender laugh of a caring grandfather and with an equally bright smile to follow it. Damn. I would never survive being supreme general. But at the same time, it makes me so grateful to know we're in good hands. He raised his head, almost forgetting about his earlier depression, only for it to be once again returned in full by the supreme general's ensuing words. Oh, and I did not forget. I'll try my best to reimburse you for your lost guild weapon. It may not be exactly as valuable, but I'll try my best. It was my fault you lost it after all. Oh, oh no. It's fine. Please. You don't have to. But if you really want to. Then I guess maybe you can give me something, Wilhelm reverted back to his earlier state, and the entire room collectively fell into laughter. This has been quite the experience conversing with all of you. I've been to many of these over the years, yet something tells me that this one will be special. I'll certainly have a hard time forgetting this one. I should get going though. So long. Everyone said their farewells, and the Supreme General coolly walked from his seat heading towards the teleportation corridor where he had arrived, yet, before he entered, he heard a voice call him from behind, open your right hand Supreme General. You're too stressed, I can see the veins. Or is, it was the voice of Ashley Orbeck, leader of the Flame Seekers, lively and upbeat as always, yet, before he even had the chance to hear it all let alone react in his ailing mind, his body had already been whisked far away, leaving him all alone back in the isolated comfort of his own room, suddenly, his heart sank, his brain began to throb and his head began to hurt. It did not feel real, almost like he was undergoing an out-of-body experience, his eyes widened, his racing heart and heavy breathing entered his ears as he witnessed droplets of his own sweat slide from his face, and onto the teleportation pad below, and before he could think any further, he slowly moved his head and steered his wide eyes onto his right hand, indeed, it was closed shut like adamantine, sweaty, shaking, veiny, and bright red, his face was again broadened in panic as he tried to unclench his hands. And even for him, in that brief instant, he did not know how, until he truly forced himself to do so. For how long was that thing like that? He muttered under his radically increasing breath. Ashley Orbeck. Did she figure me out? No. She couldn't have. And even if she did. She has no evidence. No one would believe her. He slowly tried to laugh off his worries and return that fake lively mask of his, yet no matter how much he tried he simply could not do so. Kane. 
That boy. That evil spawn. It's all his fault. My perfect public image has been stained. My poor grandson. He ruined everything. Why? Why 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 wh why why? If it weren't for him I'd, no 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 no, it's not his fault. It's all mine ha ha ha. He gripped his old wrinkled face with all his palm. I greatly underestimated him. Like his parents, I should have gotten rid of him while I had the chance, just to be safe. Even worse. I allowed him to gain popularity and power right underneath my nose. Unlike his unknown parents who knew nothing about how society functioned, he has the people on his side. They worship him like the new savior of our race. There would be public outcry if, oh rah, rah. He heavily shook his head. Oh rah, rah, indeed, you're put in a tough spot, now aren't you supreme general of the military? Abruptly his world of dark, self-isolation was invaded by another. The sound of a female, one that he had never heard before, strong and proud unlike any other he could even dream of. His senses were heightened, and his spine shook like crazy for reasons he did not even know. Ah, he quickly scanned around the room that he thought he was alone in, and only then did he notice a figure carelessly sitting upon his couch looking the other way, only the back of her silky head of purple tinted white hair showing. So. We finally meet face to face. Do you act like this often? Quite pathetic for the overlord of these humans don't you think? She casually laughed from her seat, her head still turned. What is this? How long were you in here? Who are you? This is my special room. There should have been no way for you to enter unless given my permission. HMPH HMPH. Oh. Apologies. I must have forgotten to introduce myself. My manners must have been getting rusty, I rarely get the chance to actually talk to people you see. She chuckled once more, now standing up from her seat yet still not turning around. As that happened, the Supreme General's imagination went wild, willing things into existence that were not even there. Subconsciously, he took a step back from where he stood, his eyes solely on the woman ahead past the world of nightmares. I am known by many names all throughout the three realms. But you, you can call me by the name I'm most famous for. I am Queen Avilia Greymore, the first Demon Lord. Chapter 429. D. Demon Lord. He quaked, taking another unconscious step back. Did I stutter? Lord of Humans, finally, she revealed her face. On the outside, she looked merely like any other schoolgirl. Her smile was white yet innocent. She was rather attractive, her features looked completely human, and the outfit she wore perfectly matched that of any ordinary girl. Yet, the feeling he received from her was anything but ordinary, she had no horns, no fangs, no wings, and her aura was non-existent beyond a slight glint in her purple gaze. However, from his shaking eyes, those things came to existence. Feelings that had remained dormant for his entire life had suddenly resurfaced in full, primal fear, intimidation, inferiority, he once thought of himself as a dragon ruling over a horde of puny drakes, but now he felt as meager as a rodent. His imagination played tricks on him, making a reality of his internal fear. With every step she took forward, he unknowingly took one back, step by step, quickly yet so so slowly. Until suddenly, he ran into a wall, and his weak legs could move no more, that sudden impact jittered and ruptured his entire body, like a slap to the face returning him back to his supreme senses, what the hell am I doing? He inwardly screamed. I, the supreme general, am running away from this little girl. Hey hey. I truly have sunk so low, haven't I? All due to that Moby Kane, abruptly, his expression displaying primal fear was changed. He gripped his fists tight, his bent knees soared back up, and subtle laughter exited his mouth. Demon Lord, huh? Don't make me laugh. Little girl. You dare trespass onto my private living quarters and try to make a fool out of me. I don't care how you little slut managed to get in here. You won't fucking survive. You have no idea what you've got yourself into. In this world. I am God. And you will obey. You will soon see that. He shook himself off, smiling with his teeth openly gritted, and his eyes monstrously beating red, dark aura exited his body, covering the entire room in dense mana. The ground shook beneath his feet, and the previously organized room began to crumble, like a hellish tornado had suddenly spawned. Now. What do you, and at that moment, his sights dilated, and his heart lurched, sunken down once again. He peered ahead, through the cyclone of murky madness, there she was, the self-proclaimed demon lord standing there like she was feeling the morning breeze of a summer day. Her eyes glimmered through the darkness like stars, and with her casual strut forward through the dark blizzard, those stars became larger and brighter, accompanied by that same smile of domination, once again, he lost control of his body, no matter how much he wanted to move, all he could do was wait and watch from the outside. And before he even knew it, she had already arrived in front of him, her hands slowly extending towards his eyes until his feet could no longer feel the ground. His aura dispersed as though it had never even existed. Her hands were clasped around his mouth, raising him high up in the sky. He heard cracks, his skull was slowly crushing and collapsing onto itself. God of this world! She burst out in hysteria as the Supreme General tried desperately to escape her iron grasp. I fought and killed so many gods in my life, you don't even cut it for a servant boy. Are you sure you don't care who I am? Her aura of royal purple intensified, compared to what the Supreme General displayed, it was not on the same plane of existence. He inwardly screamed. His eyes were locked onto hers even still, and upon seeing her smile further, he panicked. Like a worm, he tried to wiggle himself out. Human nature kicked in. He frantically tried to escape, he bit her fingers, yet all that led to was broken teeth, like attempting to gnaw at diamond, and when he tried to kick her with his dangling legs, it rattled him to the core, like he was trying to kick open the gates of hell. So. This is the supreme general of the military. Doing such petty tactics. Quite pathetic don't you think? She crushed his face further, and his world was narrowed and slowly consumed by darkness, despite his fake, virtual body, the pain was insurmountable. It would not stop even as all went dark, had he died? Was he in some purgatory? No, that couldn't have been. He still felt that tight squeeze sucking him dry, and death was impossible in such a world, his panic continued, until suddenly, he was dropped, and he found himself crushed on the ground barely able to breathe from his deformed, almost alien-like face. Kh, he coughed with no restraints, scanning all around him, there was nothing. 
The room he once stood in was no more, and all that remained was a vast space of empty darkness. When he looked down, he managed to see the faint figure of his old body, shaking uncontrollably to the point that the most advanced vibrators would pale in comparison. Um, am I dead? He thought once more, an illogical thought, yet somehow the most logical thing he could think of, but that was when in this darkness, he heard a sound. An heart began to thud like an engine attempting to blow out of his hurting chest, and out of pure reflex, he turned his head, only to gaze upon the figure of that same demonic schoolgirl as before. Was this some sort of hell? Punishment for all the sins he had committed? Perhaps divine retribution? He knew not the answer, but his body most certainly did. It was a pure living nightmare. Stay away from me. He attempted to flee, yet no matter where he crawled, there she was, smiling eagerly at him with the same amused expression, omnipresent in her step. Oh, how the mighty have fallen. I do commend you though, you lasted much longer than most people, and far exceeded my expectations. I can't imagine an ego so big that even for a second, you believed you could defeat me. She giggled. Ahh, who the hell are you? This is my VR space. I'm in control here. What have you done? Where is this place? I can't even escape back into the real world. Huh? Did you not hear me? I don't usually repeat myself, but just because I'm in such a good mood, I'll humor you. I'm Avilia Graymore, the first demon lord. Do you really think that your puny existence, even as a cheating entity, can handle my soul? Don't make me laugh. This world is mine to control. I can do whatever I want. Try all you might, but there is no escape. You can't be. That's impossible. I, his words were cut off short by pure pain, ahhh, purple energy engulfed him, and he began to burn. Yet it was no mere burn, it lacked heat, and more than made up for it in pure pain. It was unlike anything he even knew could have been possible had any other form of torture been offered to him, be it slowly peeling his skin off with a rusty scalpel inside and out or bathing in the hottest magma from across the universe, he would have absolutely chosen that alternative, however, despite such agony, all he could focus on was her gaze beyond the flames, piercing into his very soul like peering into the depths of hell. That shook him more than anything, yet it was her otherworldly voice that set in, etched, scarring his heart. I made the exception to repeat myself twice. But no man, in my thousands of years of existence, has ever lived to hear me repeat myself thrice. When I speak. When I move. When I breathe, you listen and understand. My word is law. You will not escape. No one will hear your agony no matter how loud your scream or call for help. Your pathetic existence is in your hands. Understood? And with those words, the pain disappeared, leaving him to his own devices once more. Understood. He murmured, catching his breath. Demon Lord. What business do you have with me of all people? What have I done to deserve this? Oh. So we're finally getting to business, are we? Smart man. She smiled. I've come here to ask you a few questions. Care to answer them? Oh. You too. You can answer as well. She snapped her finger, and like tugging a spirit out of his mouth, something escaped into this new existence. It was a dark, ominous figure. Toothy with bright red eyes, very similar to Nago, the spirit possessed by Adam Walker. You. How did you pull me out? How is that possible? He hissed, clearly stunned out of his mind. I have my methods, she retorted. The Supreme General watched in pain and horror as his very own spirit was forcefully ripped out of his body, yet he could not remain on the hurt for too long, lest he dare make her repeat herself. You need questions answered? I'd be honored to help. Ask me anything. Cap would as well answer, I'm certain of it. He looked over towards his spirit. This being. I. Yes. I shall answer. I am at your will, excellent. She smirked. Let us commence with something relatively simple. Did you cheat in order to rig this tournament in your grandson's favor? Out of all the questions and possibilities that sprung up in his mind, that question had not even been on the radar. It was an easy question to answer, yet he thought deeply for several seconds, gulping with a shaky smile. No. Of course not. I am a man of Honu, ahhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhh
Spineless. You had absolutely no intentions of a fair match, but a guaranteed victory. That is somewhat admirable. Doing something for your own devices under the public eye. Yes, a very demonic thing to do indeed, Millimeter, he gulped trembling in confusion. Speak not, for that is the only compliment you shall receive from me. I will not come here to claim to be some kind of saint who would never do such a thing. I am a demon. Yet I am no hypocrite claiming to be a saint even at a time like this. Why, yes. I understand my mistake. It must be habit to try to make myself look good at every passing second. Please forgive me. Yes. I truly am a corrupt, despicable human being and a disgrace of a leader. I've known that for long. I cannot count how many times I've deceived and oppressed for my own benefit. The space was deadly silent, existing in a state of unease within the mind of Cade Walker. Time slowed waiting for any response, and he dared not lift his head. All he could hear was a ghastly voice whispering in his mind and the shaking and clattering of every bone in his entire body. The pain of waiting almost outweighed the pain of the burn, he could not take it any longer, so he forced his mouth to open and break the silence. Oh, oh 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 great demon lord. Is there any more questions you want to be answered? Why yes. She gleamed. Whatever question your gracious majesty would pose to a lowly human like me, I'd be honored to, yeah yeah, enough with the formalities, she scoffed, and the supreme general stiffened once more to her own amusement. Firstly, I will ask you one simple question. Serena and Horace Kane. What happened to them? W-H-A, how, he suddenly lifted his head. Do you want me to repeat myself? A-H-H-H, no 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 no. I heard. He quivered, like a hand gripped his very heart. Then what is the problem? She raised an eyebrow. I, I just can't, and why is that? She stepped on his back, grinding the tip of her boot on his spine. I can't say that either. He shook his head vigorously on his knees. Ha, ha 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 ha, ha ha ha. Ha 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 ha. Out of nowhere, laughter exited his mouth, yet it was no normal laughter, it was heavy, dark, and reeked of abnormality. I won't tell you. What am I even doing? This world is fucking VR. I can't die in here. And this tournament won't last forever. He shook himself off her feet and looked up, gazing eagerly into her royal eyes of amethyst with a wide grin from ear to ear. When I don't show up to the award ceremony, they will send people to find me. Then you will be finished. I can assure you of that. I've wasted enough time here. Losing my secrets, my power. That is not something I will be willing to sacrifice. Whatever pain you want to inflict, go ahead. I, Supreme General Cade Walker will more than withstand. There was a stunned look on the Demon Lord's face, and that stunned look only worked to further fuel the laughing grin on the Supreme General's own. However, that did not last for long. Her face suddenly changed, a mixture of awe and amusement returning to her once baffled visage as she scoffed and spoke the final words that he would hear in this world, so be it, asterisk snap, asterisk abruptly, the darkness surrounding him grew darker. The demon lord once stood to his side suddenly faded into the background, his pounding heart softened, his body relaxed as he sat silently in a place even more unknown. There was an odd serenity that he had yet to experience before in his life, there was no stress, no fear, no worry. Like a baby born new to this world. He was at peace, however, the peace did not last for long, as light entered his once secluded dimension, blinding him, accompanied by an overly obnoxious sound, that he would never forget in a million years. Asterisk H U U H H H asterisk his eyelids woke, and his hands lifted to shield his eyes from the light. His gaze opened, quickly gaping all around him, and his eyes flung touching all parts of his body like he was trying to sense if all was intact before it returned to his heavily pounding heart. There was a familiar warmth wrapping his body, and an equally refreshing cool breeze. The walls around him were pure white, decorations and golden awards for as far as he could glance. The crack on the wall where he had angrily thrown a picture was there, the coffee mug, steaming hot that his servant always left him when he woke, the sweet smell of cherry blossoms entering his nose. There was no mistake, this room. This. This is my room. Asterisk ring asterisk asterisk ring asterisk asterisk ring asterisk, this sound. He peered over to his left. That's my alarm, he sat silently in his king-sized bed, his head slowly turning to every corner. For several minutes, he continued, all the while his expression subtly shifted, for only now did it begin to fully set in, he, 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 he. With a smile on his face, he sprung out of bed like a child on Christmas Day, and the first thing he did was grab his phone sat atop his counter, checking the date on the calendar. 8 colon 00 and June 31 ST. That's the day of the big tournament, ha HF, ha 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 ha. Chapter 431. Ha 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 I knew it. It was all just a nightmare. Like any of that would ever happen. A demon lord randomly showing up to question me. Adam losing to a fraud like Moby Kane and Kai Fatebringer. In what world? Ha 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 ha. His laughter continued, youthful and filled with life. It reached to all ends of his estate and had almost made the ground shake from where he stood from the pure emotions emanating from him. Supreme General Sir. Is, is there a problem? A man burst through the door unannounced. He wore an all-black suit, his jet black hair was slicked back and shined brightly under the golden light, and his face of worry was covered in subtle sweat. Ha ha ha, oh. Joey. The Supreme General halted his laugh acknowledging his faithful butler. Don't mind me boy, I was just having a good time. The big tournament is today after all. He continued. Ah, that's great sir. I'm delighted to see you so happy. He wiped the sweat along with the concern from his face. I will get everything ready for you. If you need any assistance please don't hesitate to call. Joey deeply bowed before his master and gracefully exited the room, leaving the Supreme General all alone once more with an even greater grin on his face. The joy and relief from the deepest depths of his heart made him want to burst into laughter once more, yet he managed to control himself from doing so, with a spring in his step, he hopped out of bed and immediately went to the washroom, showered and brushed his teeth before donning his special military attire for the day using his storage. 
ring, and before he left, he made sure to inspect himself in his grand mirror, ensuring all looked appropriate. Smiling in various poses, something he could not remember doing in years, he almost felt like a new man. Upon leaving his room, he was met with an all too familiar long corridor, yet he wasted no time walking. Instead, he teleported to the dining hall where his breakfast had already been prepared, along with a special guest who came to visit for this special day. Ho ho! Adam! It seems like my grandson has come to visit me today. He laughed upon his arrival, quickly taking a seat in front of his plate, his grandson on the other side of the table. Greetings grandfather. Adam swiftly raised himself and bowed. It is only natural I would come to see you on such a day. Ha ha ha. No need for formalities boy. We're family. He laughed zealously. As you wish, Adam slowly nodded and took his seat once more. It's been a while since we last met. How is training? Excellent grandfather, I have all but perfected what you have taught me. His voice was almost grey and monotone as he spoke eating his food. I'm glad to hear. He smiled brightly. Grandfather. Excuse my words but. You seem. Odd today, oh me? HMHM. I'm just happy. Why shouldn't I be? My grandson will take first place and bring honor to the family. Why don't you seem happy? Yes. Indeed I will win. Quite easily at that. No one in this school could hold a candle to my power. That is fact. Maybe even law, indeed. He proudly nodded. But that's the problem. Apologies grandfather. But I truly want to challenge. He lowered his head and gritted his teeth. The Supreme General halted and gazed intently. In my dream, this never happened. But, I always knew this boy wanted a challenge. Huh, I guess that's the difference between dream and reality, he inwardly snickered. Don't worry boy. Once you graduate, in the real world you will face much hardship. That I can guarantee. There was no response, and the room grew awkward before he once again tried to restart the conversation. So, who in this tournament are you keeping your eyes on? Normally, I would say no one. But from rumor, and my gut instinct. I'd really like to face this Moby Kane fellow, M. Moby Kane. The Supreme General's voice shifted, and Adam clearly took notice as he looked up with brighter eyes. You know him? Oh, well of course. That boy is kind of famous you know. He is a top student at this school, but beyond that, he's nothing to worry about. Oh. That's a shame. Last night, I had a dream. A dream of a good fight with an equal, I don't remember who had won. His face was obscured in my memory, but I believed it to be Moby Kane. Asterisk I asterisk I've never been a person to believe superstition, but here I am, upon hearing those words, the general's heart skipped a beat, and the thump that came after rattled his entire chest. However, he could not let a stupid dream sway his heart, so he disregarded it. I feel your pain boy. I truly do. But don't fret. Don't fall for such superstition. Here is advice from an old sage like me. You understand reality, you know what is real and what is fake. If something seems too unreal to occur, then that is most definitely the case. That's how it's been all my life. Th, thank you, grandfather. I truly do not deserve such kindness, I am truly grateful for everything, and I will surely pay you back in the future. Black diamond hash black diamond hash black diamond hash breakfast had ended, and Adam once again left to prepare at his own dorm. From the moment he had entered his very own grandfather's house, he had spoken no words to anyone but the Supreme General, such was how he normally was, so he paid it no heed, there was little more to be done, and preparations ensued as usual, all handled by the young butler Joey before the Supreme General finally made it to his own special VR room where he would attend the tournament, and as he fell dormant within his machine, his mind wandered off to his new reality, seated upon a grand throne. Looking over the waves and waves of ant-sized masses cheering below, the arena itself looked identical to that of his memory, and the cheering was just as energetic as he imagined, filling him with much needed strength. His fellow judges had already arrived sat next to him, acknowledging his greatness by lowering their heads. And now that he had finally arrived it was finally time to begin, the students were then soon after teleported upon the stage, gazing upon all the wonders of this reality. Before gawking up at his greatness at the canopy dot he smiled down at them proudly, yet he grimaced for a mere instant when he noticed a familiar face, his eyes of green looking aimlessly past his messy yet oddly pleasant looking hair of black and red, cane, however, that grimace indeed only lasted for an instant, for in the next instant his expression completely changed, his body quivered, his eyes trembled, and his arms clenched tightly. His expression changed into primal fear, and all that Kane did was simply lazily glance at his direction and smirk with an absolutely dwarfing aura, and as he blinked, the smirk and the aura had suddenly disappeared like they had never even been there, which was the only logical conclusion. That damn nightmare is making my eyes play tricks on me. Luckily, it seemed like none noticed anything. He shook his head and once again wore his mask of greatness, raising his hands to address the crowd with a great speech of his own. His voice kind yet demanding respect, black diamond hash black diamond hash black diamond hash what followed was standard. The opening ceremony was usual and was oddly similar to his nightmare, yet far from exact, which the Supreme General only attributed to his impeccable memory and imagination, the tournament then began, and the rounds randomized were familiar. They were identical to his nightmare, that was the first sign of clear unease in his heart, yet still, he did not mind it, like before, Moby Kane had the very first round of the tournament, and there he sat in his special room with his great friend, Pope Ruth III. The match that had transpired seemed too familiar, and the power Kane displayed gave him goosebumps. When he looked over to his friend smoking on his couch, he could not help but feel the unease that he had been there before. That man. He's up to something. He might be some sort of demon. Kai Fatebringer. Inspect him too just in case. This time, the Supreme General made certain to be even more adamant. Even he himself could not believe his nightmare was anything more, yet deep down, he felt like there may have been merit to suspicion, especially after what he had seen. Fatebringer? They would never. The Pope casually laughed, taking a puff of his cigar. Just use the cube on them. There's no harm in doing so no. What if they are heathens? Then we'd get a big reward. Kate old friend, you need to calm down. You're stressed over nothing. After we took care of his parents, I sensed him with the cube, and nothing came up. 
I've had a close relationship with the fate bringers, and the cube has never reacted, he's completely safe. And as you know, there is no conceivable way to turn a human into one of those heathens, so there should be no worry. Unless you're trying to tell me you know something I don't. No. Of course, you know more than me. But, I'm sorry Cade, but I've got to get going. Normally, I'd call anyone like you crazy, but since it's you, I give you more credit. You may be onto something I don't know. I'll think it over. For you Cade, I'd do anything. Don't take my playful banter too seriously. I don't know, maybe I'm just denying it because I'm too afraid to consider if it's true. He stood up and left the room, leaving the Supreme General stunned, all alone once more with a sense of unfathomable deja vu black diamond hash black diamond hash black diamond hash welcome. To the last qualifying match of the day. One that has been much anticipated. Adam Walker, grandson of our Supreme General and Kai Fatebringer. The boy of flames. The announcer yelled as the crowd roared. Supreme General, you look shaken, what is it on your mind? Are you worried? Ashley Orbeck, leader of the flame seekers asked. Oh, me, worried? No no. He laughed. My grandson will surely win, there is no doubt. If you think otherwise you're just being a bias fire user. Who? I wouldn't be so sure. Fatebringer has shown much promise in the last few matches. This is no bias at all. She proudly proclaimed. Yes yes, I know. I've watched them too as I was doing paperwork, but he still stands no chance. Huh, Ashley looked rather stunned, keeping a keen gaze upon her Supreme General. Well, let's just watch and enjoy the show. Shall we? The Supreme General took several deep breaths, blood pressure was already at an all-time high trying to keep himself under control, yet even with all his mental preparations, none could prepare him for the ensuing nightmare ready to occur. Through the bright flames and thick shadows, the Supreme General's mind went rampant, this, this can't be happening. How is Fatebringer winning? Am I still in that damned nightmare? What is this? He leaned in closer, my fists clenched tightly in anger and his eyes nearly bursting out their sockets, and as soon as his hands closed, the tide of the match shifted as expected, yet it was still a back and forth of immense power almost none could keep up with or see. Supreme General. I thought you weren't worried. You look pretty stressed to me. Ashley smugly proclaimed. Me? Stressed? No no no. He shook his head, trying to calm the nerves that had taken control of him. Hum. Supreme General. Open that fist of yours, excuse me. It's shaking like crazy. My flames have healing and soothing properties, maybe I can. She slowly reached over to open his fists. His heart sped up, time slowed, and his survival instincts kicked in. Stay away from me. He angrily shook his hands away, taking all beside him by surprise. In that moment of awkward silence, within the darkness of the fading shadows, a victor appeared, Adam Walker standing proud over his fallen foe with an expression of sadness and joy indescribable, and upon seeing the result, his hands opened in relief, and he slid his back once again towards his chair with a sigh that turned somber. Apologies for that. I didn't mean to hurt or startle. Yes, I may have been slightly worried about the results, and clenching his fists is a way of stress relief. That Kai Fatebringer is much stronger than I thought, but my words still stand that he stood no chance. He smiled. No sir. I must be the one to apologize. I had another motive, nothing sinister of course. She made sure to clarify. I just thought that there may have been something else. If you don't mind, can I ask you a simple question with a lie detector? No. Young miss. How dare you ask such a thing? Maybe I got too friendly. Had you forgotten who I am? Not only do I not kneel to such tests, but I've also much to do now. He angrily released his drowning aura of darkness, and, with clear grandness and superiority in his step, he closed his eyes and stood up out of his seat, leaving through the teleporter without batting an eye to anyone else. Fuck 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 fuck. What's going on? She. She couldn't have. But she has no proof. But the suspicions are still there now. Ag. I'll deal with her later. Now. Kai Fatebringer. How is he, he's a demon. He screamed in realization within the seclusion of his own room. I need to kill him now. He and, and as he yelled, his voice suddenly stopped by an all too familiar aura, and a sound that had left a scar on his very soul. A demon? Kill him now? How did you figure that out? Mum. You may be smarter than I gave you credit for Supreme General. His spirit lurched, the air felt thin around him, and his eyes shook uncontrollably seeing that luscious hair of very bright purple, standing up to reveal her smirking, demonic face. A-H, A-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-
Only the shadow of a voice addressing him from above. Oh. So you knew I had ulterior motives? Well, doesn't matter, only means I'm gonna have to do this the hard way. Let's just get straight into business. Supreme General. I have a few questions for you. What the hell did you do to my parents? And what ticked you off about me? Ah, uh, what, who? Who are you? He looked up to meet his hellish gaze. I'm asking the questions. Do you really think you're in the position to question me? As he witnessed him speak, he quivered, gritting his teeth and clenching his body preparing for the pain. HMPH. Well, maybe you do deserve to know. Remember this well human. I am Obi Kane. The future demon lord. You never stood a chance, so don't try. There is no escape. Satisfied? D, 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 demon lord, now. Will you answer me? Or must I torture you with the worst pain imaginable for you to speak and maybe jog your memory, N, no. Please no. This can't be real. Someone save me, -E arg. Chapter 432. His maddening screech filled the air, and a familiar feeling of odd pain and serenity took over him at that moment as all went dark, but then there was light. Ah! Asterisk beep asterisk 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 huh, his head shot up like a rocket, and there he found himself staring at gold. This, this, he gulped and stared at his jittering eyes. His saliva fell down his throat, yet it could not reach the bottom of his pain-filled stomach that had sunken to the deepest pit. Sweat leaked from his every pore, and time stood still as he took in his surroundings, the beeping sound from his left. The aroma of cherry blossoms. The sight of steam from the fresh coffee brew to his right. The room of golden trophies and memories of many years. There was no doubt, this was his room, yet it did not instill him the comfort and peace of mind it did before, there were too many questions. How was he here? Mere moments ago he was on the verge of death under the grasp of a pure monster, and now he was sitting in bed completely unscathed like it was all just a nightmare, had reinforcements come to save him? If so, what happened to the tournament? How could his lowly servants defeat such a monstrosity, one that even he could not dare topple, he did not know what to think, nor what to comprehend. All that he knew was that he was not safe, his soul still shook trembling and his heart was full of unease. Supreme General Sir. A voice came bursting through the now open doors. Sir. Are you all right? What was that shriek? I came here as soon as I heard. J. Joey. Seeing that man's face, he felt calmer. He tried to force a smile seeing his butler, yet his mouth could not complete it, shakingly stopping in the middle of the road. Yes sir. It's me. What is the matter? Don't mind me boy. It's just I had not fully recovered it would seem. Tell me. It's all taken care of now? P. Pardon sir. What is it do you mean? Preparations for the tournament. Hum? Tournaments. Had the tournament not ended yet? Ended. His eyes shot wide in confusion. Heavens no. But yes, preparations are complete. That I can assure you. Like a punch to the gut, the Supreme General gulped. In that moment, so many questions popped up in his mind, and with one question, they could all be answered. Joey, time and date. What is it? I need to know, ah, sir. It's 8 a.m. right now, the day of the tournament. Your grandson should, as he heard those words uttered out of his own servant's mouth, the world began to darken around him. His face grimaced and crumpled into each other. His skin went numb, his hair stood on its own, and his visage turned into the most fearful face imaginable. Ah. He shrieked, his voice causing tremors of pure agony in the air. Sir. What is it? What's going on? Please and out of my way now, in pure panic, he jumped out of bed, shoving his very servant to the ground as he rushed frantically towards a heavily secured door to the back of his room. What's going on? Am I still in that nightmare? Am I stuck in a time loop? Am I in hell? What is this? T, time loop. Yes. It must be it. If I can just defeat those two monsters and break the cycle I can, Supreme General Sir. What is this? What is the matter? Stay out of my way boy. He squealed imputing his biometrics on the terminal near the door. Stay out of my room and only call me when absolutely necessary. Is that clear? Why, yes sir. Understood. He muttered, standing on his two feet and rushing out of his superior's room, not before witnessing him enter a certain room he had never seen open in his entire life. Despite the nearly impregnable security applied, the room was rather empty, devoid of any life. Yet that was a mere illusion for those who did not know. Within the darkness, the Supreme General's ghastly figure darted, activating a secret button that teleported him elsewhere. A small, somber place of creaking rusty metal, dripping liquid and pitch darkness where lied a single metallic safe, despite his panic, even he gulped in the face of this rusty old thing. It was a sight had not seen since the very start of the war, still, he did not hesitate, nor waste any time. He shook himself off and approached, teeth clanking and bones rumbling, despite all the time, he did not forget the code. And how could he when his very life depended on it, and within the agonizing seconds that felt like an eternity, the magic safe opened, and inside of it was the most prized possession he owned. To any man, what lied inside seemed like nothing but an ordinary flute, yet that was anything but true, for this was his very lifeline. Once again he stood motionless, however, it did not take long for his old wrinkly hands to once again start moving towards it, gently picking it up like some sort of holy relic, fondling it gently within his two fingers. Ha, ha ha ha. After all these years. It has come to this. Smoothly, he raised his hands with the flute in hand, pressing his mouth onto the hole and played, it was a soothing melody, resounding softly in this dark, unknown space. His face turned natural, his movement softened, and his heart rate relaxed as he played notes unfathomable to the human ears and would bring most men to tears, with grace, it began and with grace, it ended. He dropped his flute to his hips and sighed heavily with closed eyes. 
He fell down with his knees crossed in meditation, taking several deep breaths, his job was now over, and all he needed to do was bide his time and wait, and wait he did, and wait, and wait, yet no matter how long he waited, there was no response. A drop of water dripped on his head, and his heart began to thump. Any second now. He mumbled. They should be here soon. It was mere minutes the last time. D, did I play the melody wrong? But I practice every day. Have my old breath muddied the song? Slowly the build-up and unease grew. His patience had reached its limit, and chaos began to take its hold, but that's when he realized, N-O-O-O. This flute. It's not real. It's damn fake. He hurled the instrument at the wall, snapping it in two. How? This place is impossible to find. Only I know about this. Why now? He tried his best to wrap his head around what he saw, yet nothing was able to save him from delving deeper into the sense of lost hope. His fears kept up ever so slowly, like the feeling of constant danger, like a tarantula was forever crawling on his back. Always being watched, hunted from the shadows, his survival instincts kicked in, they screamed at him to survive. And that's what he attempted to do. Kill him. I need to kill him. It's the only way. Swiftly, he teleported back to his room, not bothering to lock any door behind him as he rushed out, there he saw his servant, Joey, waiting outside restlessly on guard, precisely as ordered of him. Sir, your BA, his face brightened, quickly dimming soon after. What time is it now? I've little time to talk. The tournament begins in 30 minutes sir. Your grand, perfect. Those were the last words Joey heard before his master disappeared from sight. Black diamond hash black diamond hash black diamond hash it took several minutes of preparations, yet it was finally all finished. Even in such peril, he could not help but chuckle at the work of his own hands, looking down at a certain student VR pad. From memory, he knew which one Kane would take for the tournament, and he acted accordingly. Disguised as a regular safety check he managed to poison the very pad he would rest at dot of course, he fully knew a demon's immunity to poison, he was certainly not ignorant, for this very poison was holy in nature, personally gifted to him, said to have properties to even kill the most powerful of demons if they were exposed to it for very long. Kane was no exception, normally, a demon would be able to easily react and evade death. However, in VR, things would be different. His connection to his body would be nearly completely severed. And by the time the tournament ended, he should be more than dead. Plus, considering how this was no ordinary poison, it would seem like he died of natural causes and would absolve him of all suspicions, finally, after all the pain he had found solace, yet it was no time to celebrate. No, even if he died, there was still that other demon he had to worry about. And that one may have been even more dangerous, and thus, with a grinning smile he kept hidden under his veil of professionalism, he exited and went to his own special VR room to begin the tournament, like before, all began standard with the opening ceremony. The only difference was as soon as he witnessed Kane arrive, he activated the poison he had laid, and so, the tournament progressed as normal, and the entire time. The Supreme General kept tabs closely on Moby's condition, yet so far there seemed to be no change. But considering how there was still over half the tournament remaining, he had yet to completely panic. I in that time, he talked to his dear friend Pope Rutherford. He explained to him how the flute had somehow been stolen. The response he received was as expected, he lost his casual air and had nearly lost his mind upon hearing what he had heard. That was, but the beginning of the Pope's shock, what? So you're telling me that Kai Fatebringer, Moby Kane, and some other powerful demon are laying in wait within this very space? He muttered, intaking all he had heard. I am 100% certain. I know it all too well. They're too powerful to take on alone, so I was aiming to get reinforcements. Especially that other demon girl. He shivered, only for that shivering to turn into a maddening tremble after what followed. Other demon girl, you say? You wound me with such words. You somehow seem to know a lot about me. So at least do the courtesy of mentioning me by name. A demonic, all too familiar female voice reverberated to all ends of the room, his spine quaked and his knees grew weak hearing her voice. And before he even had the chance to squeal like a choking pig, the world around him grew dark, and he was once again met with a world of void still fresh in his mind, there that very demon girl in uniform stood, grinning at him with that same expression. All he could do was watch in horror. He was all alone, and the Pope was nowhere to be found. He had once again entered hell, and the doors had shut tight in his face. So. You must be Cade Walker Supreme General of the Military? My name is Avilia Graymore, the First Demon Lord. She spoke, yet she received no verbal response, a reaction she seemed to be all too accustomed to. You greatly surprised me. How did you know about me? I had fully made sure to mask my presence. How did you know about Moby Kane or Kai Fatebringer as well? Nothing seemed out of the ordinary. But more importantly, how did you get your hands on such a powerful divine poison? That thing was made to kill greater demons. H, H, how D, do you know AB, about that? He muttered, managing to find his lost breath. Oh. So you do know how to speak. For that, I'll give you the courtesy of getting your question answered. You see, I keep a close eye on Moby Kane, he is a protege of mine in some sorts. The poison certainly activated, and had he been anyone else, he would have been dead. Lucky for him, that poison doesn't work on him. She burst out laughing, his mouth fell openly shaking, and he delved even deeper down his abyss of hopeless despair. What, what is it do you want from the likes of me? A lowly human. Why should a demon lord of your status want to talk to me in person, ah? Getting down to business I see. Smart man. So, I won't waste any more time. I think it's quite obvious what I want. I want answers. How did you get such poison? How did you know about me and the other demons you mentioned, what ticked you off? Oh, and what exactly did you do to the parents of Moby Kane? I. I can't answer any of those questions. He mumbled faintly. Excuse me. Her eyes glowed a demonic purple, and he was set ablaze in flames of amethyst forged in absolute anguish. It was a sensation he had now felt many times before yet could never seem get used to as he rolled on the ground screaming in maddening horror. I said I can't. Why me? Why do I deserve this? Everything had gone perfectly so far. So why now? Ah. Uh, I just can't say it. 
I may have given you too much credit for your own good. You are no smart man at all. Very well then. You will suffer, the dark became darker, the quiet grew more somber, and the pain turned peaceful. And then light broke through the glass of shadows, and he opened his eyes only to be faced with a room of golden trophies, the ringing of bells, the smell of fresh coffee and cherry blossoms mixed with unease and the ever-growing sense of death, why? Why am I back? Why is this happening to me? Ah, uh, I have to break this goddamned loop no matter what it takes. Chapter 433. I, I give thee up. Please have mercy. Ah! He broke down crying, trembling out of control beneath the mighty boot of the supreme demonic overlord. The very same girl who was now ingrained in his very being and instilled almighty dread, unlike anything his limited human mind could even fathom, Cade Walker was indeed a resilient soul, with every new beginning after a nightmare of despair, there laid a hint of hope. Dim, ever so meager, it still remained, a new beginning, a new chance to escape this hellish nightmare without death, but no matter what he did. Whatever method he would employ no matter how creative. There was absolutely no escape, with his knowledge, he conducted several intentionally failed attempts simply to gather information before killing himself to reset, but even still, using any kind of loophole, his chances were grim, any form of assassination ended in failure. Any time he would even attempt at exposing Kane to the public, they would scoff and not believe a single word, especially when he would do a public lie detector test. His various attempts at contacting a higher power were completely futile. All ended in his cruel torture by the hands of those two same demonic figures, and all were followed up by darkness and the light of a new day, or rather the same day, the day he could never escape, all of this led up to this very moment. After a time that not even he knew. For what felt like several lifespans, he had finally cracked and had succumbed to reality, a reality that he now barely knew he never adjusted to it all. For how many times he had spent within there, his sense of being faded and his memory waned. His previous life of glory, and the original timeline that had entered him into this predicament were grey within the nightmare of bloody red. All he now knew was fear and pain. There was no hope left, and all he now wanted was the sweet, sweet release of death, and to do that, he must finally speak aloud the pocket of memory he had held on for so long, HMHM. So you finally speak then? A very wise decision. She laughed, her voice echoing in this world of endless shadows. I am curious. You are free to speak. Yes. Yes. I shall reveal everything. He wailed. He shook crying, gritting his teeth before he looked up to face her with reddened horror. Oh, one hundred years ago when the green light of creation was blessed upon us. It was by no mere accident. Green rain happens on many planets, transforming alien animals into frenzied beasts and changing how its world functioned, yet the earth was different. These beams of light. We. We are one of the Empyrean pillars, ah. Abruptly, as he uttered those words, his body began to glow a brilliant white that shined to all ends of the space. For an instant, even Avilia shielded her sights from the stinging pain before gazing back at him beneath her with open eyes. There was a beam that suddenly entered the space, smiting the general where he stood. His eyes were yeary red, his paws leaked disgusting ooze and his mouth foamed like waterworks, yet surprisingly, there he stood conscious through it all. Empyrean pillars? Avilia questioned as she assessed the situation and brought out her magic to keep things under control. Yes yes. He shrieked. I don't know what it means. I really don't. That's just what the angels told me. Angels. Her eyes grew wider. Angels yes. I've spoken to many. They first came here when the light showed up. He coughed, screaming at the top of his lungs and slowly losing his voice. They didn't say much. All they said was to keep an eye out for any demons. They even gave us devices to track them. That's how we found out about Cain's parents. The angels gave me a flute that allowed me to summon them by playing a melody. I handed them over to the angels. But I made damn sure to torture those weaklings for all they knew. He laughed through the maddening pain. Fun. Yes. It was much fun. Yet they did not speak. Not even a single groan of pain. It was silence. It got on my nerves. I didn't get anything beyond their names. No motivation, no status, no nothing. Yet there were people around me who made a big deal about those weaklings. Ha ha ha. I would have done the same for you. But the flute has been stolen. He laughed once more, his body slowly fading into oblivion. That's it. That's the truth. Now let me finally die in agony with the little sanity I have left. Asterisk asterisk Avilia grunted trying her best to comprehend and contain all that happened, but that face of struggle slowly melted into a grimace, and a wide face of frustration witnessing the Supreme General disintegrate into white before her very eyes, laughing through all the pain. What's going on? He's killing himself. But how? She lifted her arms out wide. Her eyes shined royal purple along with the tips of her fingers, as she created a bubble around the Supreme General trying to stop whatever was suddenly happening with all the power at her disposal. What happened? He's gone crazy. Ah, the angels and gods must have placed a spell on him to keep his mouth shut. Those damn angels. How did I allow this to happen? How did I not realize this? She began laughing through her gritted teeth, that damn general. How long was he in that nightmare spell of mine? A few days? A week? A month? Perhaps even a year? Or was it even longer? She wondered. All I set as a requirement for him to break free was to speak the truth, yet he refused for so long until he completely gave up on living and chose the only way out. The angels must have promised him the worst pain he could ever imagine if he spoke, and only now did he break and completely give up on living. I, Demon Lord Avilia Greymore will not allow this to happen. Chapter 434 With its winner decided, the tournament finally came to its conclusion, yet the air of excitement never left the looming air. The spark of fireworks followed by the crowd's boisterous cheers and the world-famous band, by Ken, playing its song of celebration marked the beginning of the award ceremony as one by one, in order of status. The top 32 fighters of the tournament proudly entered through the main gates. Point one would expect nothing but upbeat smiles, and a deep sense of pride from these. 
people, however, reality was very different, some remained rather quiet and reserved like Regret Oswald and Adam Walker, and others did indeed arrive with their heads held high and their spirits over the moon, but in the same breath, there were people kicking dust with a frown of disappointment and anger upon their faces, some even with a hint of fear and anxiety. Nearly every single person within that line belonged to a family with considerable prestige, and a varying degree of tolerance and expectations. And with so many families who had such high regard for their children, there were bound to be several crushing disappointments. These expressions of gloom and anger were suppressed for the eyes of the public, yet to their fellow classmates who stood mere inches away, it was more than apparent. It was something that the victors found great delight in and further boosted their ego and extensive grins, yet even still, all that paled in comparison to the sheer presence one of them displayed, it was as though he possessed his very own gravitational force attracting the eyes of all, and how could he not after such a showing, of course, that man was none other than Moby Kane, with both the grace and rigidness befit of soldiers, they all lined up upon the stage, their hands clasped behind, their backs looking up expectantly at the canopy of judges above. And as they did, they could not help but notice there was something, or rather someone very crucial missing. Black diamond hash black diamond hash black diamond hash Hey, do you have any idea where the Supreme General is? I get he's supposed to have a dramatic late entrance and all, but shouldn't he have been here by now? Wilhelm Ortiz, leader of the Hunters Guild subtly leaned over and whispered towards the chair to his side where the Queen of Flames, Ashley Orbeck sat today. The hell if I know. She shook her head. But, knowing the Supreme General, I wouldn't worry, she casually ignored his plight. I agree with Lady Orbeck here, Uriah interjected. The General is both a strong and handsome man. He shouldn't be too long. Her subtle smile took over her face as she crossed her legs and adjusted her hair. Yeah, I get that. But this is weird. All my time knowing the Supreme General has never been this late. I'm getting kinda worried. Worried for what? Gray could not help but chuckle. Supreme General Cade Walker is very capable I'm sure you know. What would be able to loiter someone like him? He casually commented. Hum. You know, he hasn't been acting very well lately. It's very, odd. Principal Rainer Davis suddenly interjected. Not feeling well? You mean he's sick or something? Wilhelm blurted, his expression filled with clear worry. I'm not exactly sure. She shook her head, trying to formulate an answer. She's right, Ashley sighed, drawing all attention now towards her. Right about what? The Supreme General has been acting very odd. I've noticed it all day, it's like he's been hiding something. And it couldn't have been more apparent than after his grandson lost. Ah. Yes, I do admit that was rather out of character for a man like him. Gray pondered. But, at the same time, it's something wholly understandable. A man of high stature such as he must be under much stress, and he kept that hidden away from us all. I assume when his grandson lost so unexpectedly, he let it all out. Also, it is only natural for him, the Supreme General to have various secrets, I do not see that as any problem. He spoke with a serious tone. Think what you want to think, I know that there's something deeper going on and I plan to get to the bottom of it. She shrugged, only to be interrupted by the sound of sudden footsteps and a voice that startled even her from behind. Ah, it seems so lively here now that all the tenseness has faded. What were you all discussing in my absence? From the looks of it, it seemed rather interesting. S, Supreme General. You're here. Hum, yes, it does appear to be so. At least I think it's me. He jested, inspecting and patting his body with an open smile before he sat upon his throne-like chair looking down towards the crowds, and the victors awaiting their award. Greetings to you all. I'm sure you know me quite well by now, so I won't bother with introductions. This tournament has truly been a spectacle. In all my years of experience and in all the countless tournaments I've spectated, nothing could match the sheer spectacle and caliber displayed today. It was certainly an honor that I could live to witness it. Truly, as the Supreme General, watching the future generation fight has filled me with so much hope for our people. Everyone most definitely worked hard, and it showed. Not even I could have predicted the outcome. He chuckled to himself as he addressed the crowd cheering and clapping, proudly congratulating the contestants. Now, without further ado, before we judges propose our offering to today's winners, let us present them with the awards they deserve. Let the ceremony begin. He raised his hands up into the sky, and fireworks once again sparkled in the heavens above before the announcer took over where the Supreme General had left off. All right. Ladies and gentlemen. I don't know what I can say that's not already been said several times. So, I'll save you the talk and do what you all came here for. Give these winners what they deserve. He pointed one finger to the sky with over-exaggerated flair, his blonde, gelled back hair wobbling like jello in the breeze. First is our prizes for our top 32. Your reward will be something very simple, but still more than exciting. Each of you will walk away with 50 million dollars. A light shined upon the arena, 16 beams abruptly striking the ground mere inches in front of the feet of several students. And as the light faded away, it revealed a table where laid a single ring, encrusted in gold and engraved with red glowing words, mystical in nature, clearly, it was a storage ring that housed what they had won, yet at the same time, it served as an excellent award of distinction, a unique ring marking them forever as victors, better than any trophy they may have asked for. I in unison, these 16 students gazed upon their reward and eagerly or hesitantly grabbed it, placing it on their fingers. And as they did, the table that housed what they claimed suddenly disappeared as if it were never there. Next is our prizes for our top 16. Your reward will be a varied assortment of rare training items to aid you in your training. Keep them safe and use them cleverly. They are extremely rare and nearly impossible to find and buy. Eight more beams of bright light struck in front of the next eight students, and in its stead appeared a nearly identical table. The only discernible difference was that the ring was colored ruby red and appeared far more expensive than the last, signifying a superior rank. It's time for the top eights. Not only will you get twice as many training items, but you will also have a chance to attend a special training session with the Supreme General himself where he might teach you some special secrets. This goes for all who ranked eight or above, not just from eight to four. Now, we have our top four prizes. The two of you who were just shy of the finals. And for you, we have something special. 
Each of you has one voucher to freely choose a single weapon, or item from the military's maximum security vault housing some of the rarest items in the entire world. We knew you most likely, each of you had different opinions and preferences, so we decided to give you the choice. We hope you're satisfied. As expected, there appeared a table before them with a white ring at its center, the first of the top fours grinned eagerly ogling his ring, puffing out his chest and grabbing his ring with pleasure, yet whilst he did that, the other who stood to his side was unusually silent. TCH. Hope you're satisfied huh? Regret Oswald mumbled in a voice nearly indiscernible to the ear before for the first time, taking a single glance up towards the audience and grabbing his ring. It was as though the world was a complete, empty void to him, he was barely aware of his surroundings and the many gazes on him from not only the audience and judges, but also his fellow classmates. All right. It's time to award our second place winner. Adam Walker. Not enough good could be said about how overly unexpectedly good and thrilling that finals was. And as such, I think we've chosen a very fitting reward. At least, that's what it said on my script. He began chuckling to himself in front of the now confused crowd. It seems to be something top secret only for you. But that is all I know on that end. Still, whatever it is, I'm more than certain you will enjoy it. The table that now appeared seemed far different from all the rest, grey with blue, liquid like lights flowing through like several intersecting rivers. And in its centre was a pitch black ring shadowy in nature. It was almost as though it was custom made with him in mind as the wielder. I shall humbly accept this reward. Thank you all for your generosity. He bowed before raising his head. As I was previously unconscious, I did not get the opportunity to address all those who came to cheer me. I will not come here to apologize if I disappointed any of you. Because the answer to that is clear, I tried my absolute hardest, and I did not disappoint. Moby Kane was simply the better fighter, that is no secret. This defeat was a first-time experience for me, and like all things in life, I shall use it as a learning opportunity. It seems like I finally have something to strive for. He giggled genuinely for the first time out of battle before grabbing his ring and turning his head. I did not have the chance to properly thank you for such an experience. I could never have imagined it, it was truly wondrous. He brought out his hands towards the man to his side going for a handshake, taking the initiative, unlike the last time. Yes, that battle really was something to remember. I hope we spar once again in the future. Not as fellow enemies or students, but as rivals or even comrades. Moby fully accepted and shook his hand, and Adam's grin shone brighter. Likewise. The crowd joined in unison for such a moment, and even the announcer could not help but comment. Both sides, previously mortal enemies supporting their party cheering as one voice, truly a sight to behold. Now. Is the moment you've all been waiting for. The award for our champion. Moby Kane. It is something not physical, nor is it something one would be prepared for. His reward will be what has always been given out to every single winner over the history of this grand tournament. A reward usually reserved for heroes of war. You will be allowed to wish for a single wish that lands within the power of the military. Of course, there are limitations that will be deeply specified such as no killing the innocent or no wishing yourself to become supreme general. But. If one were to think creatively, this might be worth several times that of anything else awarded today. Chapter 435. The table that held the award for the victor appeared in a brilliant beam of light, illuminating all in a heavenly aura of gold that made what came before it seem like a mere flashlight in comparison. As the light faded, it did not reveal a table akin to the rest, yet the ring still remained. Royal purple shining like amethyst, floating in midair with an uncanny green sparkle surrounding it. The crowd stood mesmerized by the sheer beauty, unable to speak. They only watched with eyes glued to the stage as Moby stepped up with pride in his step to grab the reward that was rightfully his, and place it upon his finger. Only then did the crowd regain themselves and rightfully applaud. The awards have been handed out. Phase one is complete, and now, will come phase two to follow. Here, each contestant will be given various offers from all of our judges. A once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. So without further ado. I will hand over control to, hold on one second. Suddenly, a voice emerged, soft yet potent interrupting the announcer, and when he looked, he witnessed the face of a smiling Moby, his right hand up in the air, and suddenly, all eyes once again sat solely on him, especially from the canopy above who leant in particularly closer. Ah, pardon my manners. It seems like the winner of this tournament had something to say. He nervously began sweating. What words does the champion have to grace us all and everyone watching at home? Thank you for entertaining my selfish request, announcer. He smiled closing his eyes. But, what I will say is no victory speech, I can assure you that. The truth is, I would like to use my wish right now. What? That was the very first word that came to everyone's mind, yet only some spoke them out loud, their mouths shot open, their eyes expanded like the universe and their bottoms suddenly found themselves leaning forward near the edge of their seat. Even the judges could not keep their facades of calmness and professionalism, those watching at home spat out their drinks, some nearly choked on their food, whatever they were doing was of little importance to what was happening in front of them. Out of everything that had happened in this tournament so far, this was the thing they least expected. Ah, I can see many of you are shocked, Kane scratched the back of his head. Well, you see, I did come into this tournament planning to win, and I had already formulated what I wanted to do with it well in advance. Ah, ah, the announcer looked around in panic, from the canopy to the champion in utter loss and confusion. He had not prepared for such a turn of events, and he knew not what to do, more so than anyone else especially since he was put on the spot. His stress was starting to opening show, and just as he was ready to crumble, a voice emerged to save him. I see. HMPH HMPH. A boy who is independent and ready to control his future. Teenagers are so hasty these days. I like it. The Supreme General broke the mayhem. I would be lying to say I saw this coming, but out of anyone, it would make sense that you would be the one. After all, you have no family ties to bind you to their whims and decisions. That may be true Supreme General, but I can assure you this decision was not made in haste. Moby bowed respectfully. Is that so? Now you have me even more curious boy. Then allow me to hear this wish of yours. I'll see it done to the best of my ability. 
Thank you, Supreme General, he lowered his head even further, only to raise it up high the instant after with an unshakable determination in his very presence. I wish to create a top rank guild, and to do that, I request the highest level guild weapon item and a chance to become a judge in this event. Ah, the Supreme General stuttered before smiling and shaking his head. I see now why you couldn't hold off on this wish of yours. Ho ho, I see you're trying to poke some of the best prospects from us. But, a wish is a wish, and I am in no position to decline a request such as this. It shall be done. But allow me to ask you this. Why do this? What is your motivation? What inspired you to create a guild now of all times? I. This has always been my main goal. As many of you know, although here I stand as a world champion, I am an orphan. My beginnings were anything but spoiled, my parents were taken away from me by the war, and I was left all alone. Only a mere two years ago, I was weak, abilityless and naive. Every day I would come to school only to suffer and get belittled. And outside of school was not much better. Every day was a perpetual nightmare, yet I did not let it stop me. Each day I would train from sunrise to sunset, I learned all my family had to teach and mastered martial arts in all forms, yet even still, I could not keep up with even the weakest of their ranks, such was the human limit. Through my struggle and humiliation, I only look up to see faces of amusement, and at times even fear. I always wished for help, yet help never came, only hesitation and mockery, the only reason I stand before you today was out of mere luck of me finding an ability in my time of need. And ever since then, I've devoted my entire life to helping the weak. To help the me that never got help. I would be there. Through my journey, I've met many great people who showed me the beauty of mankind. Some of whom are now dead and I shall never forget. Through it all, many began to call me a hero or savior, yet I am not foolish enough to see myself as that. No. I am human just like all of you. And I am selfish towards my own ambition. And to that end, I will create this guild. A guild that rejects no one as long as they have the heart and will to succeed. So many people have lost the will, yet there still remain those like the old me who strive for success. Anyone like that is more than welcome to join. We live in a very discriminatory society. One where the strong are praised and the weak are shunned. I will aim to bridge the gap. I want to build the perfect guild. To honor my parents and my legacy, it shall be called the Guild of Blissful Demons. A utopia for both the weak and strong to live alongside each other, and each will have their own roles and be awarded as such. All will be given the tools to succeed. I have manufactured and studied my own methods in the pursuit of this, but even still, what I speak may sound hard or even impossible. But that is why I require strong, reliable aid to start it. All are welcome, and together we will rise up and break through heaven itself. Chapter 436 Through all that occurred, Moby stood at center stage, his shoulders broad and his arms out wide in firm conviction to his cause. As expected, the crowd stood up in applause, cheering after the passionate speech they had heard. However, equally as expected, there were several people sat still, some even with clear disgust upon their faces, after all, this crowd was filled with nobles and rich people alike. The prospect of helping the weak had never once crossed their minds, some even could not help but cringe at the prospect. Many of them may have even been exploiting the weak for their own selfish gain to successfully run their businesses. What was most surprising was that there were equally as many supporters as haters in the stands, and the overwhelming cheers masked any words of disdain, the reason was ambiguous, yet it was clear that the positivity and kindness in their hearts were still being siphoned by the angels, yet there they stood supporting a good cause. Even Moby did not expect such a turn of events. Had their hearts been swayed? Did they idolize him that much now? Or did they have an ulterior motive even he was not aware of, the crowd's cheering seemed to have no limit, only when the Supreme General raised his right hand up did the crowd suddenly calm itself and gaze once again in relative silence. That was quite a thorough answer you had there boy. If I didn't know any better, I think you were trying to advertise your new guild on worldwide television. You caught me. Nothing seems to get past you Supreme General sir. That might be part of the reason, but I truly believe in every word I spoke, he beamed, scratching the back of his head. Yes boy, that much was clear from the passion you possessed. And in that effort, I, Supreme General Cade Walker shall aid you to create this new guild with all my power just as you wished. You can be most assured of that. You certainly have very unique and ambitious goals and motivations, I'm very curious to see how you will accomplish all of this. The Supreme General commented. Thank you very much, Supreme General. And don't worry, you won't be disappointed. Moby grinned and lowered his head to show respect. Ah ho! I will look forward to that then. He could not help but laugh. In the meantime why don't we get started with the recruitment shall we? He stood up out of his seat and raised his hands, and the crowd clamored innovation point one by one, each of the judges grinned and smiled in anticipation. Each received a chance to advertise their own guilds and what benefits they would provide in general. I'm very certain all of you must know the benefits of joining the military, but as tradition, I shall explain it anyways. Raina Davis stood, addressing her former students. All of you will be given a rank of lieutenant at the very least, and you will be considered a high-profile member of the force. Only when you have successfully proven both loyalty and worth will you be promoted accordingly. We the military will care for your well-being and that of your family to the utmost of our abilities in detail, which I will later explain. Alongside that, depending on your rank and trust, we will provide you with secret intel and powerful items that would otherwise be unavailable. For example, her voice was strong, vibrant, yet seriously tense at the same time. Her speech appeared as though she was reading a paper, yet she possessed no script to be seen. Despite her long-winded, professional and thorough explanations it was not at all boring to listen to, it was rather engaging for those present and those watching at home. Thank you for your time, on behalf of the worldwide military, I hope you remain with us. She sat down to a flurry of cheers, only for the next person to stand and take her place. Hello everyone. It's me. Ashley Orbeck, leader of the Flame Seekers Guild. She laughed heartily and gloated under the shining light that reflected off her mismatched hair. In my guild I like a lot of freedom. You want to explore that distant planet because you heard a rumor about cool aliens? Go for it. You want to take a day off to visit family? All power to YA. Just make sure to use your time wisely and do your weekly minimum quota. Yes, the guild is kinda small I do admit with only a few hundred members, but... 
That's what makes it so tight-knit, filled with the best of the best. We here are all family. We are the flame seekers for a reason. We seek the unknown lighting it up with our flames. And the burning passion we bear is unbreakable. There was no delay, as soon as she closed her mouth, the crowd opened theirs, her pitch was short, yet it delivered such a strong message, all that it needed to accomplish. It was such a contrast from the approach of methodical professionalism practiced by the military, but from the smile on her face, she was clearly proud and satisfied with herself as she sat down and handed control to her fellow female judge who slowly stood up and approached, MHM MHM. Greetings. She subtly smiled, her hand sensually on her lips. I'm certain many of you know me very well. I am known by many names, Queen of Shadows, the Mother of Domination, and many others. But today, Mistress Yuria Dark, leader of the Sellsword Guild shall suffice, we are no mere ordinary guild. As our name would suggest, we are a band of Sellswords. Unlike others who explore, hunt, and mine, we are for hire by all those who possess the means to pay. We will accept anything from completely vanilla to morally grey. We, the guild will only take 20% of whatever you make, the rest is for you to decide. And when we do our own excursions, we will rain down terror and suck the life out of everything we see. Such is our guild, Miss Orbeck mentioned how her guild is considered rather small. Well, mine is even smaller. Only 30 members reside in my guild, and 30 is the maximum limit I have set and allowed. Even with such a small number, we stand here as one of the most powerful guilds in the world. I am a complex yet very simple woman, power is everything. If you catch my eye, you will be chosen. Many of you who participated are still far too meager. And as such, you will not even be given the smallest offer. But even still, full entry is not guaranteed until you prove yourself worthy to take the spot of an already existing member. And until you do, you will remain in our sister guild, these are, but a few of the benefits I will provide. The rest you shall have to find out upon your initiation. I promise you that all will be worth your time. She giggled and slightly licked her tongue underneath her covering hands before elegantly turning her head and strutting back from where she stood. The reaction she received was the oddest out of the entire evening. A very few cheered loud enough to fill all the stands, yet many remained silent, deep in thought. Certainly, she was most bold of any of her colleagues simply by her sensual attire and demeanor, but many still did not expect such a showing, the void she had left in the minds and hearts of the masses was clear, and such a void had to be filled by someone. And there was only one man present there good enough to reinvigorate the crowd. Greetings everyone. It is I. Wilhelm Ortiz, leader of the famed Hunters Guild. And not only famed, but the biggest guild in the entire world. With over 100,000 members, we certainly have a wide array of talent. I'm not sure why my fellow guild leaders made it seem like having a smaller guild is better, now let me sell you the other way around. My guild is an entire community, a massive beehive of sorts working in harmony. It is very organized, yet at the same time very open. Out of all of these members, you are free to be a part of any team. Go on any mission depending on what has been posted for that day and be paid accordingly. Whatever effort you put in, that is how much you will make. I will not mandate you even work with me at all, simply when you need it. Many of you will not be given the highest rank from me, but even I from all the way up here can see great potential. I look forward to you climbing the ranks and proving yourself worthy of praise. Indeed, the crowd was revitalized and regained their former vigor as they cheered towards the gleaming, charismatic man. And after spending several seconds gloating in the spotlight, he quickly turned his back leaving his cape flapping through the air as he left the stage for the only man who has yet to speak. It was a man with long silver hair. His charm was evident beyond his looks, it was like an air of calmness and serenity took over as he spoke with his soft, soothing voice. Salutations to all my fellow brothers in arms. My name is Gray Osborne, leader of the Hunters Guild, once a band of mercenaries, we now specialize in government aid. This guild has existed for many years, but only under my now recent leadership did it become what it now is today. We are rather close with the military, and as such, we have focused all our efforts entirely on the war. Where it be in combat, research or medicine, I can assure you we are always leading the charge. With but 5,000 members, we have made an impact unlike any other. In fact, it was our very own research team that made such VR technology even possible. If you aim to help get rid of the Shulker menace but hesitate on joining the strict military, I can guarantee you a home with me under my wing. What he spoke was short, not very much detail, such as expected for a man known for his vagueness and mystery. Most out of everyone present, Grey Osborne and his Hawk Guild have been the victim of various rumors. Some early disturbing while others mildly immoral or devious. Of course, no definitive proof was ever provided for such claims, yet many still lingered on them despite that, still, it was more than clear that the Hawks and their leader were very loved and cherished by the masses. The passion and support was clear from most of those who were present, which was identical to their public perception and diehard supporter. Even Moby could not help but keep an exceptionally closer eye. Still, even he could not admit that he possessed a certain charm that would draw people near in the eyes of a true leader. It was surprisingly odd to see how differently each guild approached such a thing, but there was no clear, objective edge to who was better. Only time would tell which of the guilds the students would choose. And only when that was finished did the recruitment officially begin. Of course, everything began from the bottom. The military along with all of the other guilds gave their offers. As previously advertised, Yuria Dark did not bother to speak nor acknowledge any of their presence, yet what was not was the fact that out of all offers, Moby Keynes was most generous of them all, he had offered them the rank of Duke, which was in his guild, directly below Archduke, Lord, and Sin, but nevertheless, even after such generosity, none even considered joining him. They did not voice their disdain, yet it was clear from their albeit subtle demeanor as though they looked down on him or were jealous of his position, still, even after several rejections in a row, Moby did not bat an eye nor crumble. He kept the same air of confidence, especially now that he saw who it was. Elizabeth Eleonora. Despite being a supporter and healer, you joined this tournament where power mattered most and displayed utmost mastery of your power. As such, I shall offer you the rank of lieutenant along with a swift promotion to general once you have proven yourself. Indeed, your skills will truly be used for a good cause. The Supreme General gave his offer. For the hunters, I offer you the rank of high sentinel and allow you the privilege of leading your very own elite team as you so please. Wilhelm reached his hands out and spoke, only to be quickly taken over by another voice. That's it. Ashley Orbeck chuckled. If you chose the flame seekers. 
Not only will I offer you the rank of flame goddess, but I will also appoint you as the head of all support operations. What about that? Yes, yes indeed, Miss Ashley is correct. Support is imperative, a weak team and a single strong support could beat armies of powerful monsters. This young lady should be offered much higher than her rank. No mere support ability user could reach such rank. As such, I shall also appoint you as a protege to our current head support member until you feel comfortable to take over her role. Hum, yes, you caught my eyes very much Elizabeth dear. So, if you are willing to join, you might have a chance to replace one of our current support. Yuria spoke for the first time, rubbing her long black nails on his cherry lips. Chapter 437 Elizabeth, for you, I shall give you the position of lord within my guild, and the ability to lead your very own battalion as you see fit. That is all. Moby spoke as the final one, unusually confident, unlike every other time, now that all the offers had been given, it was now finally time for Elizabeth to decide. Her face softened as she parted her silky pink hair and stood in silence as though contemplating her answer. That was until suddenly, her eyes narrowed to a precise place within the crowds, and she let out an audible sigh perceived by all as she opened her mouth and gave her response. I have a duty to my family. I had already promised my father that I would aid him in his business once I graduated. Anne. Until a few minutes prior, that was what I would have done. One of the guild leaders swayed me, and I decided to take fate into my own hands. And the answer could not be clearer now. She took a small pause to gaze upon the canopy of judges with a deep breath, seeing each of them smile and lean closer in anticipation. But that was when her eyes abruptly shifted down and landed upon the ground level where she stood. Moby Kane, it would be an honor to join you in your guild of blissful demons. She bowed respectfully and gave her final answer, there was silence as all formulated what they had heard, only for madness to ensue. Through it all, Elizabeth kept her head low at ignoring it all. Of course, what she spoke was a mere lie in order to make her master's guild sound more appealing, her mind had been long set and was never swayed, she would never dare reject. Yet, there still lied a hint of truth from that lie. More than ever, she was certain the future lied within his hands, and going against his will would be nothing but foolish. She had to learn that fact and learn it well, her father's wishes were no longer of concern to her. Shivers ran down her spine thinking of what was to come from Moby Kane and his brain, yet oddly enough, she could not help but smile with anticipation and excitement through it all. As the recruitment process continued, so did Moby's streak of rejections, for the students, rejecting all offers and staying to support their family or choosing one of the original judges seemed to be the only option, and the disdain, jealousy, or even embarrassment to join Moby continued, the only people who had joined him were those who were guaranteed, his fellow demons, and each one who joined incited an upset considering they were one of the most promising students in the entire tournament. Many began to rethink their rash thinking and mockery, they began to see Moby as a true threat, that was until it was time for the top three competitors, Regret Oswald, a man known for his overly boisterous nature was abnormally silent. Unlike the others, he did not even look beyond his own two feet. It was certainly most obscure for him, none knew what he thought, yet embarrassment was certainly not the answer. Regret Oswald correct? Your showing was not half bad. You got some power in you and a burning determination for strength. For a rank such as yours, I offer you a position of general with a close possibility of promotion to high general. The Supreme General smiled, only to be suddenly interrupted. Apologies Supreme General, but what do you see in such a man? His power is indeed somewhat impressive relative to everyone else, yet there lies the problem with his temper and manners. He seems merely a worse version of his elder sibling. He should have been up here, not him, as such I will pass, he's not my type. Yuria dark yawned and waved him off with a flick of her wrist, the first person she had ever rejected within the top eight. Yuria. You're being too hard on the kid. Sure, he's not perfect. But we all had our phases right. Give him a chance. I sense great potential. So, regret Oswald, I will give you the rank of apprentice war god. You certainly got the firepower. Now I want to see how you lead. Ashley Orbeck smiled brimming with joy as she extended her arms out to the unresponsive man below. You sure you're not just being a biased fire user Ash? Sure he's strong, but is he really worth the trouble? Wilhelm Ortiz raised an eyebrow. I will pass on him. I seek no barbarians, my guild has a reputation to uphold. I agree with Mistress Dark, his brother is just a far better version. I'll be sure to offer him an invitation as soon as possible. MHM, Grey Osborne nodded to himself. I feel greatly apologetic to admit I share that sentiment. Truly, that boy is powerful, and his future may be bright once he relinquishes his rage and pride. But in his current state, I shall not accept him, maybe in the future. The crowd knew that the judges had many thoughts on Regret Oswald, yet they did not expect so many to pass up on a powerful foe such as he. None expected him to stand a chance against Adam Walker, and he managed to beat everyone up until that point, he had an incredible showing. They're passing up on him like they're playing hot potato, one spectator could not help but laugh. I guess that's what happens when you're a reject born in the boonies. Wait is he really? The ears of a demon were very potent, and Regret could hear and perceive every sound within the ocean of voices. Yet still, he forced himself not to hear them. He already knew what they spoke of after all, but that was when a voice entered his ears, one that he fully foresaw and could not escape from. Regret Oswald, old friend. I know how you truly feel and what is your true potential. Don't pay attention to the blabbering of these old geezers. Moby shrugged. Oh. A feisty boy. I like it. Yuria smirked and licked her lips with the eyes of a predator. And, Grey Osborne who sat at her side could not help but gaze in shock before that shock turned into smiling keenness. Who are you calling an old geezer? I'll have you know I'm still young in my thirties. Wilhelm shot up out of his seat with his fists clenched. Your eyes must be waning if you don't see the power of what you have passed upon. As such, that makes you an old geezer. Mistress Orbeck and our Supreme General were smart enough to see it, yet you did not. I made a rational decision with all my years of expertise. Don't be arrogant, boy. What do you know that I don't? My fellow judges have their own tastes and I have mine. If you want to take him so badly, then you take him. Wilhelm shouted. Take him? Indeed I shall. And I shall give him the highest rank in my guild. That of sin. Moby shook his head smirking. 
Mark my words, in a few months, you will see how ignorant you truly are for underestimating me, hey? Who do you think you're taking? He there's still my offer and that of the Supreme General. Ashley interrupted with finesse. So, Regret Oswald. Who will it be? The stage was set, and all eyes were on the still ever silent Regret. For several seconds, silence overcame all who gazed. But that was when he moved. His hands once clenched opened wide, and with a deep breath, he raised his head revealing a formidable gaze of steel that landed upon Moby Kane. Thanks. I guess I'll have to just accept your offer. Upon saying those words, he closed his eyes, only for them to suddenly open mere moments later by a tight grasp choking him from the neck. Now that's what I've been waiting for. Welcome aboard Sin of Pride. Moby wrapped his arms around that of Regret. Sin of Pride? I always saw myself as the sin of envy or even greed. He smiled, jittery as it may be, it was one not noticeable by many, but ever so small it still remained there. Chapter 438 with the crowd calmed down, now, there remained only one competitor unclaimed, yet the excitement and mystery surrounding him was seemingly non-existent compared to all others, after all, he was the grandson of the Supreme General. It was to the point that the judges did not even bother to give any offerings, such things would simply be wasted effort, they simply gave him the stage to speak his mind. As you all may have assumed, yes, I will be joining the military and following in the footsteps of my grandfather as I promised him. That is my duty. That was all I was going to say at first, but with this new development of Moby Kane creating his own guild, I feel like I must comment. Fear not, I will most certainly not be joining, but I do wish you the best of luck. I look forward to future developments, but rest assured I won't allow you to surpass me in any way from here on. That is what I had promised myself. He turned around and smiled. Likewise, I wish you the best of luck as well, but I guarantee you won't best me. Black diamond hash black diamond hash black diamond hash and with that, the tournament officially came to a close, the school year had finally ended and all were left to live out the beginning of their adult lives. Yet, there were still events to come. The amusement park was just as bustling as ever with cheers and celebrations that echoed to all ends of the space. The stress of combat was now over, so it was finally time for some much needed relaxation. The sky within the virtual reality turned a dark blue reflecting the sky of the outside world, and the lights shining upon the darkened land were like bonfires of glee, still, from this festival, there were several people nowhere to be seen. And one such person was the winner himself Moby Kane who left himself within the comfort of his own room, a room of never-ending white, aura like light, sitting on his couch with a smile, he tapped his feet with delight and anticipation. There were many reasons for his absence, after such an announcement and the fact that he received first place, there were certain to be hordes of attention and paparazzi headed his way, yet that was not the main reason. No, he had a meeting to attend to, and he was simply waiting for that person to appear before him, and there she was, in a flash of purple that burst through the white, the light purple haired female appeared wearing the school uniform he had gotten all too accustomed to now. He could not help but grin as she materialized out of thin air, yet his expression turned into perplexity upon gazing upon her face. With slow, deliberate steps that echoed within the space, she walked up towards him and lazily sat next to him on the couch with a tired sigh. So, how was it? Did you get the Supreme General to speak? Moby asked. Yeah, I did. She took a deep breath and crossed her legs. I could tell, he was acting exceptionally nice to me. And now that I think about it, he did seem very different. How did you get him to speak? I bet he just instantly shat his pants and fessed up immediately. Moby burst out laughing. Hey. I was surprised, he was actually a much harder nut to crack than I expected. Even for you? Moby looked genuinely surprised. I guess I must have underestimated him. Still, all's well that ends well. How was it that you got him to speak then? Physical torture initially didn't seem to work, so I opted to place him in a nightmare. Classic. Moby could not help but chuckle, only for him to calm himself down a few seconds later with a deep breath. Now. What exactly did he reveal, I'll get the things you've been wondering about most out of the way first. The military has a way to detect demons, and that's how they managed to identify your parents. Identify my parents. His face widened. Yes, she nodded. Your parents' death was no mere accident. It was all organized by the Supreme General himself. The military seems to have deep connections with the angels, in fact, angels have visited here before. For their final years, the military and Supreme General tortured your parents for information, yet they did not speak at all. Now, I'm fairly certain they are captured by the angels, but the possibility of their death is very high. As a child, you were also tested to see if you were also a demon, yet you passed being human and were chosen to live, I see. That explains a lot. Well, I guess I'll have to plan more for the future, things might get more dangerous from here on out. Hum? Avilia opened her eyes and raised a brow. Aren't you mad or something? Are you not yearning for revenge on the man who tortured your parents? If it were to pass me, I most certainly would have but I've long mentally prepared and come to terms with the fact that my parents could be dead. I have already shed enough tears, they wouldn't want any more. Besides, you had already tortured him enough for me, that's enough mental closure, I, I see. Avilia looked down and to the side. Anyways, I'd like to know the details of the relation the angels have with humans and how your necklace managed to get to me unscathed. And then, there lies the fact that despite all this time, me and my fellow demons managed to escape detection for so long. I have my theories on some of that, but it may take longer to explain. I see, then we can save that for another time, Moby nodded. For now, I want to know exactly what came of the Supreme General. He smirked. Is he now our pawn? Have you scared him into submission? Um. Not exactly, then what? I scared him to death. Chapter 439. Immediately, as though struck in the back of the head, his expression took a turn. Sweat poured out of his face, and his mouth opened out of instinct yet no words exited for several seconds. D. Dead. How? Why? How was the general up there speaking to me then? Does everything you touch just die? Hey. That's not true. Even though it kinda was my fault. She suffered. Your fault? How so? I never expected you to say that. He questioned. Well. 
I'm just trying to be honest and completely transparent with you. She took a small pause and looked away before closing her eyes and continuing. Anyways, let me just explain what happened. I managed to get him to speak, if I was blindsided on why he was so adamant not to speak. At first, I thought it was his pride, so I tried to break him into submission. That did work, but, but what? Moby leaned in closer and asked. The nightmare I placed him in left him in a time loop, and the only way it would be broken would be for him to speak the truth. I thought it would be a good way of making him see you as some sort of almighty being once we controlled him, but the plan backfired. From what I assume, he must have endured several lifetimes of torture with the hope of escape, but in the end, death seemed to be his only option. He was that stubborn, or maybe even frightened, but now you ask, how did you let him die? As soon as he told me the truth, he began to fade away into the white light of immeasurable pain. As soon as I realized it, I tried to stop it, but even I was powerless, especially in my current state of being. That was most certainly the work of a celestial being. They must have placed a seal on his tongue to never share the truth, and if he did, he would suffer the worst pain imaginable and die. That should have been something I foresaw and tried to bypass, but by the time it happened it was far too late. Ah, uh, I see. Moby began to ponder deeply. But. Doesn't that mean that the angels know that he spoke the truth? A signal must have been sent to them. Shit, those fuckers might be on their way now too, I wouldn't worry about that. She took a deep breath and calmed him down. Once I realized I couldn't stop his death, I focused on intercepting whatever signal would go to the gods and angels. The message should be completely nullified. Oh, that's a relief. Moby smiled, sighing his fears away and settling his nerves. At least I think. She continued. You think? Well, had I been full power, intercepting such a message would have been child's play. But now I'm not that sure. At the least, it should be delayed by one year, and at most, it should have been completely intercepted, take that as you will. She shrugged. One year? One year isn't too bad. I just have to deal with the fact that I won't have the military under my grasp. I suppose it won't be that big of a deal. I had an inkling that everything going completely as planned would have been too good to be true. So be it, I guess I'm lucky that I still have so much going. Moby's voice softened as he shook his head and peered up to the ceiling. Sorry about that. He heard a voice from his side, and he immediately turned to see Avilia looking to her left towards an empty wall. Sorry for what? You did your best, I really don't blame you. If anything, I'm glad and impressed you kept things so under control. I'd have been much worse if I were you. Heh. I suppose so. She gave a distant chuckle. I guess you may have figured this out, but that Supreme General there was a fake. That was actually Rupert transformed into the Supreme General. He left a clone in his hospital bed, I think he did very well. Luckily enough, the Supreme General's body has yet to be found, if there even was a body and his physical one hadn't faded to dust. He probably has his own special VR room where no one is able to enter but him, so his body shouldn't be discovered until after the tournament. Ah. Uh, that explains why the Supreme General was so nice to me and regret. He burst out laughing. That's some nice thinking. Maybe having the military in shambles is a good thing. You may kill everything you touch, but it may be a blessing instead of a curse. You may want to check your demon vocabulary, those blessings sting. But, I appreciate the sentiment, thanks. I look forward to seeing how you deal with this new dilemma. She gradually twisted her head away from the wall and smiled brightly towards him, out of all things that happened in their discussion, Moby was most taken back at that moment. It took him a few seconds to process, yet he reciprocated that sentiment soon after with a warm feeling in his heart. Little did he know that was only the beginning of the surprises that were to come. An unknown sound abruptly entered, creaking within the room of white, and Moby's head immediately snapped trying to find its source, ever so slowly, the door to the room began to open, and out of it emerged a single figure bearing an odd expression, beyond her bangs, her eyes of brilliant sapphires. Shined with what seemed like shyness or brimming excitement as she stepped within the white space with footsteps echoing from her black summer heels. Her dazzling blue hair was left free to wave and tie behind her back. Her black sundress fit snug around her waist, and her grey flannel had their sleeves rolled, not masking much of her stunning figure. I'm back. She joyfully announced. Did you miss me? Chapter 440. Jay, Jaden. Moby's mutter turned into genuine shock as those words slipped out of his mouth. Yeah, Jaden. Did you forget about me already? Pretty rude why I know, Moby was left absolutely flabbergasted, never did he expect to see her here. It had been so long since he had last been with her, but oddly enough she seemed so familiar. From the way she strutted into the room to the expression on her face, it was most certainly none other than Jaden Griffith, his significant other, still, despite the overflowing rush of thoughts and emotion, there was still one aspect intriguingly missing. Ah, uh, you're here. How did you even get in here? This room only opens to my finger PR, as he spoke, Jaden smirked smugly in his direction, and in that moment he stopped, realizing that she was a doppelganger. Mum? Hey! Why are you looking at me like you saw some sort of ghost? She leaned over from afar and pouted. By the way, who is that girl to your side? Are you cheating on me already? As she spoke, Moby's eyes widened further, his heart sank, his hairs rose stiff from their paws, and his forehead began to sweat as he internally screamed to himself. And, out of instinct, his head left Jaden's gaze and snapped to his flank, to the other side of the couch where he rested. Huh? But, to his surprise, he found no one there, Avilia who had been previously sat to his side was nowhere to be found. But that was when he was abruptly attacked. In his distraction, a heavyweight fell hurling towards him like a heavy, and when he looked, he was met with a top of blue hair rubbing on his chest, hands quivering, squeezing him tightly on his waist to the point where he could hear her heartbeat past her breasts, and a smooth, flowery scent he would not dare to forget in a million years. I, I. I missed you so much. She wept. Her voice was shaky, emotional to the bone and her arms began to heavily quake further as she squeezed him tighter. The shirt upon his chest where her face rested began to feel moist, like a continuous stream was dripping upon it. Initially, Moby's face stayed shocked, his hands up in the sky untangled by her arms. However, slowly, his face began to soften. His shoulders relaxed, and his hands fell down petting her head, his fingers running down her silky hair with a smile. 
Yes. I miss you too, Moby's voice seemed silky like a charming melody as it entered into Jaden's ears. Her grip weakened from his chest, yet their stutter still remained as she lifted her head and looked up to him with reddened, tear-filled eyes and damp, rosy cheeks. For an instant, they locked gazes intently, and in the next, it was their lips that found themselves locked. Seemingly out of nowhere, Jaden's arms left his waist and flung around his neck, flinging him closer towards her and her scarlet lips with eyes closed. Moby's softened gaze regained its jolt and his face widened considerably, yet it did not take long for him to regain his previous calmness. He did not show resistance, in fact, he instead fully submitted himself to her grasp as he wrapped his hands around her waist, bringing her closer towards him. Jaden's eyebrows soared as her face widened, yet her eyes remained shut with a steady stream of tears flowing out, tears of both bliss and melancholic sadness. The darkness from her closed eyelids manifested into a brilliant light of soothing purple as she felt her tongue dance within Moby's mouth. Her heavily beating heart began to settle down to a normal rhythm, and she let her mind and body run free in the most happiness she had felt in seemingly forever, but that was when the dance ended. Their lips separated, and Jaden finally opened her eyes with a slight hint of disappointment. She knew not how long they were kissing, all she knew was that her body was yearning for more, however, she could not make herself say any of the sorts, especially when she laid eyes upon Moby's tender look and loving smile that made her smile shakily and wipe the tears, that still rained down past her flushed cheeks. D, did you really miss me? She murmured, looking up at him with expectant eyes. Did you really miss me? Moby raised his eyebrows. I didn't know you were that kind of sappy girl. Ah, ah, I'm not. It's just, Jaden's already reddened cheeks turned boiling, and panic overcame her only to be interrupted by Moby's laughter. Ha 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 ha. Don't worry, I get it. And yes, I of course did. Why would I lie to you now? Ah, ha ha ha. She wiped her tears again heavily and sniffled. Why, you have no idea how much I wanted to see you again. But, I'm not gonna sit here and lecture you about why you didn't contact me at all. I know you must have tried your best. I know you had your reasons and I know that you were doing something important, yet still. I guess my over-obsessive side is taking over, HMPH HMPH, Moby chuckled once more. You're not being over-obsessive. You're just showing me that you care. Ah, really? She muttered. You're doing it again. What is it with you? You think I've lost feelings already? Do you really think I got together with another girl while I was here? No. Of course not. I would never think so lowly of you. You'd be too scared of my wrath to ever dare to do something like that. One second there was silence, and in the next, a hushed snicker was heard as they both exploded into mutual laughter. True, I wouldn't want that dark side of yours, I much prefer this one. Damn right. She puffed her chest forward. You know, I really couldn't believe it was you when you came in, but now there's no doubt in my mind. You haven't changed a bit did you? Haven't changed a bit is a bit too hasty don't why I think? I can assure you that I can show you many new things later on. Oh, now you're getting me interested. Moby leaned back. Anyways, I got to ask, why exactly are you here? Hum? You do understand that my father is one of the most important people in the country, if not the world. As soon as I heard that you were participating in the tournament you know damn well I had to come spectate. Aha, uh -huh, I should have guessed looking back at it. Moby rubbed the back of his head. I just assumed that you rich kids had a lot of work to do after graduation no? Well, you might be right, she nervously smiled. At first, I had a special post-graduation ceremony to attend to with some other rich kids. My father told me I couldn't go see your matches and I should just wait until you're back on earth, so I was kinda devastated for a few weeks. But then, on the day of the tournament, I woke up to find a special VR machine, a ticket, and a message that read, you're welcome, go have fun, in my room from my father. You couldn't even believe the joy I felt. I still don't know if my father was just pranking me or if I just nagged him enough to do this, but doesn't matter now. I came here and got to see you beat some ass. That's all that matters. W, wait. Does that mean that Mason Griffith is here? Is Abby here too? Are you not alone? Are Nags and Ray here too? Moby blurted. Abby yes, Nags and Ray, no. They really wanted to go, but even I couldn't get them tickets. My dad had some important work to do, so he's not here either. So Abby is here. Where is she? Mum. -hmm. Good question, Jaden placed her hands around her. Lips. She was just behind me a second ago, but then she left to go wonder on her own. Wonder on her own. Isn't that a bit unsafe? Has she gotten better? Moby seemed genuinely concerned. From what I can tell, she's gotten much better than before, but nowhere near where she was over a year ago. In fact, this is her first time ever in such a big public gathering. I'm glad she's gotten better, but still, shouldn't you be worried? A, hey, I wouldn't be. Jaden shrugged. Abby can handle herself. But, what does have me worried is that she chose to go somewhere else instead of coming here to see you. You think she's shy? If even you were shy, I can only imagine how shy she must have been, me? Shy? Oh, of course not. I would never. She shook her head. Anyways, I wouldn't be too worried. She might have just gone to the bathroom in our mansion and is on her way soon. In the meantime. Jaden paused and a slight smirk appeared on her visage. I might have let you off the hook not being able to contact me during the year, but now I expect a fully detailed story about everything that's happened to you during the year. And by everything I mean everything. Don't you dare skimp out on me. A, hey, I fully expected you to say that. Of course, I'll do it, but. Only under one condition. You have to tell me everything that happened with you as well. Easy. She laughed proudly. You've got yourself a deal. Chapter 441. Moby had all but finished explaining all that had happened to him, and now Jaden was just concluding as well. Moby was kept to the edge of his seat listening to all he had missed out on as he listened with intent. I couldn't watch anything while up there, the military blocked everything, he sighed. Not even your own TV show? She questioned. Huh? Well, I'm sure you already know this, but there's a whole TV show about you. There's an actor doing all the roles for me and everyone else, even Alex. She reminisced. 
It says it's all based on a real story, which it sorta is, but some of the events are kinda exaggerated, but it sure makes you look good. Everyone loves it. The budget is insanely high too. I bet some guy must have been really interested in your life and thought he would make a good show out of it. What? There's a TV show about me. Wait, 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 wait. Hold on a sec. You're meaning to tell me that there is a TV show all about you and you had no idea. I guess so, Moby scratched his jaw until suddenly, his eyes went wide in realization. Wait, off the top of your head, can you remember the name of the creator or director of the show? I think his name was Frederick Rogan or something, Frederick Rogan. I know that alias, huh, that damn bastard mammon really pulled a fast one on me, I had no idea he had that kind of power. So. That's why he was so interested in me telling him about my past. Moby inwardly smiled, but that doesn't matter now. She continued. I can contact my father and sue the hell out of those guys. My family is in contact with some of the best lawyers in the world and, no no. That's quite all right. If they made me look good then it's okay. Besides, I think I know the creator, he's a subordinate of mine. Moby calmed Jaden down and suavely stated. So you had this planned all along. She rested her raised bottom back down on the couch and sighed. I guess you can say that. Moby laughed. I still haven't watched it though, but I'm sure we can watch it together. Oh. That's good. I only watched the first episode and saved the rest for us both to watch. It can be a good time for some alone hours just to ourselves. She giggled and smirked in his direction. Of course, but first let's worry about the new guild. I'm gonna need your help to set it all up and get people on board. MHM, I fully expected this. She eagerly grinned and puffed her chest forward. I'll do it, but in return, I expect a rank of sin within the guild. Seems fair, you got yourself a deal. Black diamond hash black diamond hash black diamond hash in the world outside of the endless expanse of Moby's room, the festivities continued as usual, the supreme general's death had yet to be discovered, and all seemed to be enjoying themselves underneath the twilight of the brilliant sky. Many of the competitors were hoarded with crowds of people and paparazzi trying to get a word out of them. Some seemed to rather enjoy all the attention and simply gloated in the spotlight, while others did not seem so optimistic. The former seemed to be by far the majority, yet there still existed people that belonged to the latter. Miss Eleonora. Can we have a statement how you managed to get so far in the tournament as a mere support? That has never been done in the history of this school before. A female voice screamed from within the wave of flashing lights. I simply trained and became stronger. With the correct tools and motivation, anyone can become successful. She casually yet elegantly responded. Mistress Eleonora. Out of all your choices, why was it you chose to join the newly formed guild of blissful demons? Is there something we are not aware of? You know as much as I do, she shook her head before opening her eyes wide with unexpected passion. But. If you don't see the sheer amount of potential in that guild, then you must be either ignorant or blind. Moby Kane proved himself more than capable of winning this tournament, and I strongly believe in his vision of the future and his success in this guild. Hikari Yami. If you don't mind us asking, why is it that you have two forms with different personalities? Are you two people living in the same body? What is your secret? Ah, uh, I don't know. Yami is just my sister. That's all that matters to me. She nervously responded, staring at the endless stream of flashing light seemingly unfazed. I see you and Miss Eleonora both joined the Blissful Demon Guild and were now walking together. Is it safe to assume that both of you are friends? Ah, uh, I guess so. She quietly nodded, overwhelmed looking at all the faces around her. Aha. I see. So you two do have something going on. How did this unexpected friendship occur? Elizabeth Eleonora. Would you care to let us know how you felt about the Supreme General's unexpected outcry today? Miss. Adam Walker lost today, did you foresee this? Do you have any further plans now that you are finally graduated? I'm sorry, but I don't feel like answering these questions now. I would like some time for peace. Let's go Hikari. She gritted her teeth from underneath her mouth and walked to the side, Hikari following after her. See, coming. Hikari shook herself off only to be cut off by a wall of people once again surrounding her. Please. Just one more question. The people are hungry to know. It won't take long. TCH, these people are like mindless zombies. What are those news companies telling these guys to keep them so persistent? Why can't they just leave us alone? Elizabeth scoffed under her breath as she formulated her final answer to the press, but that was when her expression of anger and disgust turned into genuine shock, or perhaps unease as she witnessed the figure of a tall, burling man towering over the paparazzi like a giant as he strode in her direction. His shoulders were broad like mountains to the point that the black and pink suit he wore could barely contain his muscle, fighting to rip and pop out. His natural pink beard was well maintained, and the separated mustache from above twisted into circles at its end. His pink eyes were small, and his eyebrows were thick, well exposed from his slick back rose hair tied into a small ponytail at the top of his head, with his cheeks raised forming a smile, he lifted his forearm that was comparable to a tree trunk, and placed it firmly upon the shoulders of one of the men screaming eagerly with camera in hand. Excuse me, but would it be possible for me to talk to my daughter? He spoke in a gentlemanly voice. Huh? Who's T.H.A.? The man turned around only to catch his tongue upon seeing his entire figure covered in shadows from the presence of a single man, his face abruptly sweating and twisting as his head immediately fell on level with his knees. S, sir. I, I mean Lord. Lord Eleonora, sir. Apologies, I had no idea it was you. Upon seeing their fellow reporter Bo, the beyond stunned crowds crumbled and followed his lead in apology. Oh, fear not young men. I mean you no harm, he laughed warmly. It does warm my heart to see how popular my adorable little Elizabeth has gotten. I'm certain you have much to ask her, but I request you to leave for now. I would like to spend some fatherly time with her. I promise to give you as much time as you require with her as soon we get things sorted. What do you all say? He smiled eagerly at them from above. You're far too kind sir. Thank you so much for this. They all lowered their heads even further. Great. He chuckled. Elizabeth, now that you're free, why don't we go celebrate your achievements? I truly am proud of you. 
With clear fatherly love, he smiled and gestured in her direction, but from Elizabeth's expression still clear as day on her face, she did not see anything comforting in that smile. Chapter 442 Oh, father. You're here? Elizabeth's face brightened in delight. You really saved me now, but I didn't expect to see you so soon. Ha ha ha. Well, you shouldn't have expected any less from yours truly. I didn't think you'd underestimate me when it comes to matters you're involved in. He laughed proudly. Who's that to your side? A new friend? Or, are you maybe babysitting her? Father. Don't say stuff like that. Hikari and I are the same age. And yes, I would say we are definitely more than acquaintances. Oh, that's interesting. He smiled further. Tell me about her later along with everything else that you did at school, okay? In the meantime, do you mind if I snatch you off her hand? I suppose. She sighed before looking down towards Hikari. Apologies, but this is where you and I shall depart for the foreseeable future. It was truly a pleasure to know you. Thank you. Hikari. To Hikari, Elizabeth's words sounded more like a final will rather than a goodbye for now, she completely understood, yet she could not help but feel a slight pain in her heart and dampness in her eyes as she slowly nodded. Thanks for understanding. And sorry for leaving you all alone with these guys. Bye. Hikari attempted to catch Elizabeth's hands, yet her reaction speed failed her. Before she knew it, Elizabeth's hand slipped away as she left her side, the crowd of reporters parting, to allow her an easy path to her father before closing once more blocking her view of the two pink-haired figures walking away into the night. For once in seemingly forever, she was all alone. For the past year, Elizabeth had always been close to her, and now with her absence, she could not help but feel abrupt emptiness. As the tenseness in the atmosphere calmed, the reporters regained their vigor, and with seemingly more ferocity than before, they pounced on the defenseless Hikari, her head swapped from camera flash to camera flash, voice to voice, question to question, yet no matter her efforts, she could not handle it all, nor did she know how to. All she wanted to do was run away and scream, yet even that did not seem like a viable option considering she did not want to bring shame upon Moby and his new guild. But that was when suddenly, her consciousness began to slip, and her problem was left in the hands of another. Hey! What are you all? Mindless zombies? A cold, somber voice exited out of her previously shy, jittery mouth like she was a different person. Her hair turned dark, and her slight aura of white shifted into pitch-black darkness that exploded every camera in sight, and blew back all the paparazzi as if they were standing at the heart of a tornado. Go find some other girl to pick on. I have no interest in your degenerate practices. Now. Leave me be. Why, yummy. Hikari mumbled watching from within. Ah, ah, ha. As the screams of pain pierced through the boisterous night, it left nothing but silence in its wake. All those in the area previously enjoying themselves turned their complete attention on the aftermath, their eyes shifting from the girl who caused it to the victims reeling on the ground, those were the only sounds heard, the sound of whimpers and hushed breaths. Their pupils were frail, losing color, and their entire bodies shook with as some crawled away. M, monster, all those who looked could not help but be taken aback by the pure desperation on display, and how this little girl caused grown adults to break down like infants, and in the midst of all this chaos, there was only one man who advanced from the gathered crowds. A man with unparalleled pride in his step, seemingly unfazed, if anything he seemed rather amused. It was a man that all recognized dot a man that many could not tell where he was in his young twenties or his late thirties. He stood towering well over six feet tall, muscular, and lean from head to toe. His medium-length black hair was parted away from his slightly darkened sky blue eyes. His beard seemed lightly maintained, enough to seem almost effortless. Donned upon him was a black suit lined in gold, a golden star shining brightly on his heart for all to see. Ha ha ha. I'd recognize that voice anywhere. Hey there. Hikari Yami. It's been a while. He cheerfully greeted with his hands waving in her direction. Rika? What are you doing here? Yami looked dazed for an instant only to return to her usual self in the next. I prefer, hi General Riker, but, I'll let it slide just this once. He amusingly noted. Whatever you say. She sighed. Anyways, why are you here exactly? Let me guess, you're gonna give me another lecture are you? Lecture? Heavens no. If anything I gotta be applauding you for what you did to them. I don't blame you, they're damn annoying. No, I'm just here to spectate how my former students were doing, and oh boy was I surprised. Especially you, my former disciple. The way you fought was exceptional, it caught me off guard. He gloated. Former disciple? She raised an eyebrow. I gain my strength on my own, I owe nothing to you, just know that, damn, you sure have gotten more honest in the past year. Care for a walk? I bet it sucks to be out alone at a time like this. Black diamond hash black diamond hash black diamond hash alone, Yami sat at a bench overlooking a vast expanse of space and a single source of light that looked identical to the moon. Although all she saw was nothing but a virtual image, she could not help but let her mind drift within the clouds until the clouds ran out of space for her to wonder. Sorry I'm late, she heard a voice from behind. Took you a while. She scoffed before looking rather perplexed. Want an ice cream? An ice cream? Is that why you took so long? You know I'm not a child, right? I suppose, he nervously chuckled. But, I assumed Hikari would have loved one, no. I. I suppose you're right. Yami bit her lip and shook her head in realization. But, she's still too shaken from those damn reporters. Yeah, I can imagine. He sat on the bench and began to suck upon the very ice cream he brought. You know, you actually haven't changed a bit from last year, huh? What is that supposed to mean? Nothing. He chuckled. Well, you're the one who hasn't changed at all. Same as always. Excuse me. Riker looked genuinely offended. I'm completely different. Can't you tell by how much brighter my face looks? I have earned the respect I deserve and I'm not forced to sit through enough paperwork to fill up the entire ocean. Hum. I guess you do look less like a zombie. And, you seem to have lost that cranky, panic look you always had. You might be a tad more laid back I do admit, but maybe it's because you have no real power over me now to order me around. 
but still, at the end of the day, you're still just a school principal. Not anymore, Riker exclaimed. What? Did they fire you already? It's about time. She laughed openly. It's not that either, HM? Then what is it? Well obviously, I've been promoted. With war on the horizon, the military needs their brightest minds and strongest muscle working in headquarters. And what in that tells me how you've been chosen? Ah. Of course, you've been in the dark about all my great achievements. I've made quite a name for myself. Want to hear some of my best ones? No, I'm good, you don't need to, so first, the grand beast on planet Wajilau had suddenly sprung up after the planet had been tamed for the past few decades. Many suspect the rise of these monsters has to do with the Shulkers trying to invade our sector discreetly without putting our treaty at risk, the monster's power was growing exponentially stronger, many men had died on previous excursions. Only when I, and my expertise were put in charge of leading the attack did I manage to defeat the beast at its strongest and with minimal casua, okay okay. I get it. It's really true, you haven't changed at all. All you care about is yourself. Ah. Of course not. Riker jumped out of his seat. I'm doing this all for the greater good of mankind. Sure. Yami gave him the eye. You can believe what you want to believe, but my achievements don't lie, and the people sure do love me. Enough of this nonsense. I have something of actual concern to ask, okay, sure, ask away. He relaxed back onto his seat. The leader of the Eleonora household. How is he? Frederick Eleonora? Are you worried about that girl who was with you earlier? Me? No. Hikari, yes. I do owe her a bit for keeping my sister company, but that's about it. Ah. I see. So shy little Miss Hikari finally made herself some friends yes. I suppose so. A slight smile appeared on Yami's face. Well, if you're worried about that girl, I really wouldn't be. Frederick Eleonora is one of the kindest, most respected men in the world. He's almost like a superhuman with how he keeps so much under control. He is a man of discipline, calculated in his every move and utterly devoted to his work, but his family always comes first. I guess it's hard for you to understand, but as a father, he did not see your friend for over a year. Any parent would not yearn for anything but some quality time where they simply talk and relax with no care in the world. Almost like what we are doing now, yes? I hope you're right. Yami sighed and looked up towards the mesmerizing light of the moon. Besides that, it's good to hear how Hikari has grown. She seems to have really grown. He leaned back and closed his eyes. She still has much to work on. All she did was follow Moby Kane around, who was her only friend at the time. And he sought to led her to new people along his journey. Still, she was forced to break out of her shell and comfort zone many times which is good. Ah yes, of course, Moby Kane, he never fails to impress. Even I didn't expect him to come out on top today. That's where you and I differ. Kane would never be so confident if he could not win. He seems to be both the strongest and the brightest mind of this generation. He holds much of the future, and that's why I follow it. I see. So that's why you joined his guild. I also feel a similar way, especially after that last fight. If I'm ever in the mood, I might drop by the guild and inspect, maybe even lend a hand, suit yourself, also, what do you mean by what you said earlier? Like we are doing now. I'm not your daughter old man. Yami roared only to Riker's amusement. Yeah yeah, anyways, let me tell you about how a few months ago, I saved a rescue team that got themselves stuck and in need of rescuing themselves. On a planet where, 